morning, everybody. This is Alan um, at the IPHC headquarters. I uh, just want to welcome you to day two of MSAB 17. Everybody was able to uh, take a little bit of a look at the MSC Explorer yesterday. Um, and um, there'll be a chance today, if anybody has any issues with the Explorer, um, let me know. We'll be taking a break at some point today and um, I can just help you over email or just talking on this uh, format on Adobe or something like that. Um, yeah, so if uh, the chairs are online, I can uh, turn it over to them uh, this morning. Morning, everybody. Thanks very much. And thanks for the uh, the intro there, Alan. I see Pete, you're online. Is your mic working okay? Are you able to come through? Uh, let's test it out. Yep, looks like it. Sounds great. Okay, great. Well, uh, welcome to day two, everybody. We've got um, pretty, uh, pretty busy day ahead of us in terms of getting into some of the detailed components of the analysis. Before we do that, though, as has been the uh, the case for the, the past couple of MSAB meetings, we usually start with a brief recap of the previous um, the previous day's discussions, and we'll use the meeting summary to uh, to help facilitate that conversation. The meeting summary was distributed uh, last night, and I can't remember the time, but, so maybe we could just pull it up on the shared screen instead. Uh, the report that we went over last night? Yeah, it, it was distributed to everybody, I believe, last night, correct? Do you have access to that? Ed, or do you I want me to share it? Share. Okay, sorry, one second. Right. Okay, so while that's getting pulled up, just a quick reminder for folks of uh, the process we've used in the past. The idea is just to give us a quick refresher, uh, not spend more than, say, 15, 20 minutes uh, on, on this review. Uh, if you do have any you know, really significant red line issues that you feel were missed because you, you weren't at the report writing section. We can flag them here, but really edits any substantive changes to the report. We would like to uh, deal with at Thursday's discussion. So that's the the plan. If we could scroll down to the the first actually substantive piece, not the, um, <laughs> the verbs. Perfect. Thank you. So we started the meeting yesterday with a, a brief refresher about um, what our what our mandate is and how the rules of procedure may be updated to reflect that uh, really minor changes to the, the terms of reference and what our mandate is. We also elected uh, chairs for the meetings. And we noted that we were going to have some discussion uh, on Thursday to get into the, the proposed edits of the rules of procedure in greater detail. One item that uh, Anne Marie pointed out to me that we had missed, perhaps in the report, but at least uh, at least in this meeting, is to acknowledge Carrie's service as a co-chair for a number of years. Uh, I, I do think that's worthy of noting in the report and maybe an edit we can follow up with on, on Thursday. Um, so after going through the arrangements in the session, we uh, can scroll down past that into the next section, thanks. Uh, we reviewed the uh, SRB report, previous MSAB reports, and annual meeting items in section 3.3, .3, I believe. And in here, in, in, the, in these discussions, it was mostly just recalling 
previous items of um, our previous action items from our discussions. I think the the most substantive piece from the SRB discussion or rose from the SRB discussion when we talked about implementation variability. That's yeah highlighted now is paragraph fifteen. Uh, Pete, anything else that you want to add for, for the summary yesterday? Really, that was just the, the focus of previous reports. And we can go into the framework otherwise. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I'll just I'll just uh, second and reiterate the uh, adding in uh, appreciation for Carrie's contributions. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, uh, just I'll put in a note then, maybe up here under election of co-chair somewhere. That'd be a good section. Yeah, I, I think that'd be really helpful. Um, as long as we've, I mean, we can get into this on Thursday, but just a placeholder so that we remember to come back to it either tonight and report writing or Thursday would be great. And again, the blue text in the terms of reference piece is something that we'll come back to in Thursday's discussion. That's why I've just skimmed over it. I want to make sure everyone's had a chance to actually digest those changes and not get into wordsmithing here. Uh, okay, so a very quick review of SRB, MSAB, and annual meeting uh, points of note. Then we went into a review of the, the framework. The couple of items that we've noted in the report here are um, that the, the operating model's been uh, Reparameterized or, or is gone through a different parameterization, and we are recalling the SRB's endorsement of uh, of those changes. Uh, and then we also had a, a paragraph here noting our discussion on implementation variability, where we need to uh, we need to actually go through today's work to understand the consequences of that variability and whether we want to get into further detail of how that variability is defined. So, you know, an afternoon's discussion in two paragraphs, but I think that's uh, that's fair given it was mostly refreshers. We don't need to, to reinvent the wheel in the report writing. Joe? Thank you. Um, and this, this might be more for Thursday's discussion, but I just wanted to highlight it right here too. But in the section above with the term limits, uh, one thing I wanted to be cautious about was that we put in some, I was thinking about this last night after we got off the meeting. Um, there's a lot of times where maybe a federal agency, state agency, um, or the tribes appoint specific people that they want to be on the management bodies. So I think we need to be cautious that for federal, state, and tribal employees that they're exempt from the term limits. Um, and we should just put some language in there to that effect because they're going to be appointed on management strategy advisory board. Anyway, so that was my thoughts. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, Joe. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's, it's something that we should bring up on Thursday's discussion. Uh, similar uh, line of uh, questioning came up actually during the report writing session. If, for someone raised it for myself, actually, because my... Uh, co-chair uh, actually extends beyond my, my appointment. So we need to figure out how we align those timings. Okay, yeah, great note to, uh, to circle back on, on, on Thursday. Uh, okay, so let's go back down to, um, I think it was, was it 4.1 now? Or 4.2? So for 4.2, we, uh, we, largely just reviewed the objectives and performance. The, the, the main takeaway paragraph for me is that we're re recalling that these are the objectives, the primary objectives that the commission has endorsed. Uh, we're, we're not looking to reopen things right now, but we did at least reference the discussion we had around the target reference point in paragraph 23 and um, uh, our conclusions in paragraph 24. So we note that we are, we note the commission's endorsed a set of uh, primary objectives. We note that there was some discussion around target reference point and that it's been interpreted differently or it could be interpreted differently and that we would need some clarification or benefit from some clarification at least. 
but ultimately we agreed to maintain the primary objectives as described in paragraph 22 um, with the acknowledgement that future programs of work may require some reevaluation. Uh, I, I think this is a, a reasonable and a concise summary. The one item that I would note here for Thursday's discussion is making sure we're comfortable with the verbs that are used for paragraphs 23 and 24 so that they are, or maybe Pete, this is more a note for you and I, that we, we elevate the paragraphs that we're looking for direction. Because if it's just noted right now, it wouldn't go to the uh, uh, executive summary. And we may forget to seek commissioner guidance on this if it's something that we actually feel needs clarification for the next iteration of our work. Roger that, sounds good to me. So that really gets us to the summary of yesterday. Uh, we, we went through rules of procedure, we took care of arrangements and had a refresher on action items. Now we're into the, the real substance of the conversation going through the evaluation of results. Again, folks should have a chance to um, to review this at the end of each night. The more the merrier for the report writing at the conclusion of today's session. And let's get into, uh, with that, let's get into, into today's meeting. Um, through the chair, if, if I may ask uh, a brief discussion about schedule today. Right, there's, <laughs> thank you for the reminder, Alan. Two. <laughs> Two points. One is uh, uh, arrangements for today in terms of schedule, and the other is just to acknowledge there's there's a number of folks who are new to the process and potentially new to Adobe Connect. Um, for for that latter item, I, I presume you've managed to sort your way through the application by the fact that you're attending this meeting. But if you do need any uh, technical support, uh, I I don't know if I want to put. Is Ed the person that would be able to help us through this? The secretary has been very helpful at getting folks uh, connected in that sense. Yeah, Ed, Ed, Ed is a valuable resource here for any connect, connection issues or uh, helping with anything in Adobe Connect. Perfect. Maybe you can even you know reprogram my DVD player. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> bad joke, Ed. Thank you very much for for the help with that. I, I think most folks are okay, but uh, yeah. As long as you have Google, I can do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. And then the second was uh, the arrangements for today in terms of timing. As as Alan had mentioned yesterday, um, there there is a number of folks who have a conflict at eleven thirty, and I think the proposal was that we take a break at 11.30, so we, we go straight from now to 11.30, take a break at 11.30 until 1300 uh, Pacific time, so that folks have a chance to get some food. And uh, if you're not in another conflicting meeting, dig into the Explorer results a little bit more. Does that seem reasonable for folks? Alan, most importantly, does that work for you? You've got the, the voice to go for, for a couple of hours? Yeah, um, definitely, that works great for me. I think uh, if, People are okay with a two and a half hour session. I'm, I'm all good with that. Um, and as long as people are okay with an hour and a half break, hopefully that gives people in Alaska time for a decent lunch. Um, and then, yeah, and then we can uh, carry on in the afternoon as normal. Okay, just giving a minute for folks to uh, raise their hand or unmute if they've got any concerns with that. But not seeing any, I think we can roll into the uh, into. Well, I guess it's not the next agenda item. We're just going to pick up from the last couple of slides of yesterday's presentation on the uh, on the program of work. Correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, but at the end of the day, I I would like to try to maybe end today by four thirty and begin report writing. I think this this uh, this evening would be a more substantive report writing session. Um, worthwhile to get a head start on that. What do you think, Peter? <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, we got off easy yesterday with the report writing, um, and today will likely be much more substantive based on past interpretation. If we can um, we can strive for 4.30, or, or at least start reporting by 4.30, that would be good, because uh, it's going to take some time. Yeah. Um, I, I also think we should try to, you know, um, folks make sure that when, when you're putting 
up suggestions when you if you've already done some of your analysis to be able to share those notes in the chat or send an email to to myself and to Alan with some of the proposed wording because that's where things really can get bogged down in the report writing is trying to edit by committee. Yeah. Um, and then uh, to the chair, the, the the final thing that I'm wondering, in the past, we've had a protocol of um, turning on video to ask a question. Um, and that, that was instead of raising the hand, I guess we could raise the hand as well. Um, and I, I really appreciated that one because uh, you know who's talking um, and you get that more personal feeling to it. But also, it um, I just like to, to see the people and remind myself what everybody looks like. Um, so I'm wondering if we want to invoke something like that where we have a video or uh, people talking and uh, commenting. I'm fine if not. Video yeah, I, personally, I was thinking about that, but uh, it crossed my mind yesterday because I don't actually see the video icon. Maybe this is where I need Ed's help myself. Um, yeah, I haven't worked it out with Ed yet. Sorry. <laughs> ah, there. Video sharing is now enabled. There we go. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, uh, much more, um, uh, much easier to, to get folks' attention. So for, for the new the folks that are new to the, the process, what we had done in the past was we asked people to turn on their cameras where they're able when they're asking a question uh, and uh, keep the camera off when, when, when you're not speaking. It is helpful to turn the cameras on. It's just easier to catch an eye than, than raising a hand. So uh, the video icon is right next to your microphone at the top of the Adobe Connect uh, when you're using the application. I think it's the same in the web browser. That would be, uh, be really helpful. Nice to see folks. Yeah, and if, if it's too much trouble or your video's not working, let's not worry about it. You don't have the bandwidth, but I, I, I do appreciate it, so thank you. So uh, should we do a five minute break for people to comb their hair or uh, <laughs> sorry to bring that upon you? Um, it, and so, so yeah, if, if that's all the chairs have, I'm um, yeah, I think now is a good time to just finish up the presentation that we uh, cut short yesterday. Sounds good. I'm glad we got the memo on matching shirts there too, Alan, almost. Or maybe we're inverse? Is that the... I think that's Ian and you are closer than you <laughs> and I. <laughs> yeah, we'll coordinate for the I am an annual meetings for sure. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, yesterday, uh, we, we cut short this presentation, which is associated with document 08. Um, all that's at the end of this presentation is a little bit of discussion about evaluation and um, how we here at the Secretariat were thinking of running the evaluation today, um, just to give you a heads up on what to expect. So as you, um, as you were introduced to yesterday, there is the MSE Explorer. Hopefully people were able to use that and found that useful. Um, but another part of the evaluation is we really want to keep size limits and the multi-year assessments as independent evaluations. In other words, they're not overlapping. We're not looking at a triennial process where the assessment occurs every three years with, si with a size limit of zero inches, for example. So that I think will help with the evaluation. We'll really keep those two separate. And if the MSAT would like to recommend evaluating size limits and multi-year assessments, we can um, definitely entertain that in the future. And then as a reminder, the commission directed uh, the MSE work to include five different distribution procedures. So that's methods of distributing the TCUI among the regulatory areas. Um, those five different procedures are integrated into um, the results. And um, if you want a remind, if reminder of what those distribution procedures are, you can look at the Explorer and um, in uh, the MP uh, page has a description of those, or I believe document, uh, 
uh, I can't remember if it's in one of the documents for the MSAP, but if, if you do want a reminder on those, um, let me know. It was in the presentation yesterday as well. So for the evaluation of size limits, oh, we have a, a hand here, Chuck, yes? Yeah, the apologies for, uh, and I don't know if it should be discussed now or later, but uh, I was noting in, in, in your MSAP, Doc 1707, page 12, and figure 12, as well as the table 8, page 15, uh, in MSAB 1709. And in these tables, it's indicated that the, the calculations have no additional, uh, do not include additional agreements for 2A and 2B. And uh, this, the management procedures that we're discussing in the MSC Explorer seem to mirror the figure 12 and 18 and table 18, are we basically then suggesting discussing management procedures with size limit performance metrics and assessment frequency performance metrics with apportionment baked into the scenario without other distribution procedures also be included? It looks as almost as if we're discussing distribution procedure uh, number D. And I didn't think we were getting into all that and we have no option. We can't find any other distribution procedure on the, uh, the Explorer at this point. It was just the one that seems to be baked in. And I'm not sure, sure that I'm comfortable with that unless you've made a change now that allows us to see all the distribution procedures. Thanks. I'm I, I, I may have interpreted it wrong, but it just looks like we're staring at an apportionment uh, a distribution procedure as our reference document or references in this document in these documents thanks no, um yeah th thanks chuck and sorry for the confusion figure 12 is just an example of um, what the decision making variability would look like under i think two of the five different distribution procedures the two without an agreement for um, 2a or 2b that's simply an example all of the results contain all five of the different procedures, A, B, C, D, and E. Um, and all of those uh, distribution procedures are run separately, but then when that performance metric is calculated, they're all combined into one set of simulations. So that's what I mean by integrated. They're just combined. And then the performance metric is calculated using A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, equal numbers of simulations for each of those distribution procedures. So <clears throat> all of them are integrated into the results combined, and um, but you're not looking at individual distribution procedures because that's not the, um, in the program of work for this round, is not to evaluate distribution procedures, but to incorporate it as a source of uncertainty. And that's why it's all integrated and not separated out in the Explorer. Um, I have created a couple of plots just personally to look at the effect of distribution procedures to satisfy SRB requests to um, evaluate if distribution procedures change the ranking. Um, and we can view those later today if the MSAP wishes. Maybe just a, a point of clarification then, because it was a sorry, check. I was slow on the uptake for the numbers. You were talking about uh, paper seven, figure 12. You, I think what I heard is your concern was that some of the analysis uh, was based on distribution procedures that um, did not include the interim agreement, and it was just uh, apportionment type. We've heard from Alan is no figure 12, paper seven was just an example of ways in which um, uh, distribution, well, I guess uh, decision-making variability uh, could be calculated. For our purposes, for the MSAB's work today and tomorrow, the MPs integrate across these five different distribution procedures. We're not just picking or choosing a, uh, a specific one. Yeah, the only thing, a question then would be on then table uh, table eight on page 15 of 18 of MSAB uh, uh, 1709, where it actually lays out and mirrors what the, our only 
able, if, if we plug in reg regulatory areas into the, the Explorer, it mirrors that pretty well, depending on SIMs or no SIM, et cetera. So in effect, it, it, we are able to discuss that one, which is, I think, option or uh, distribution procedure D. No, um, That's the only one that shows up. Table eight um, also integrates it. I, I don't know where you see that it's distribution D. Um, and you, you can definitely note that there is integrated distributions by looking at the median average TCY of 2A. And we'll, we'll get into these results in a moment. But there's obviously an agreement for 2A in that table eight of page 15 of document 09. Um, so that table, all results, all tables, all numbers have all five distribution procedures integrated into the calculation of the method. Okay. I'm glad, Chuck, that you've been uh, obviously studying, preparing ahead for the evaluation. I think it's something that we can, we will circle back to when we actually get into the results. But uh, maybe Alan, we can get you to to move through the rest of the presentation, uh, so that we can we can get into that uh, into that evaluation discussion. Sure. Thanks, Adam. So, in the evaluation of size limits, we have, of course, the primary biological sustainability and yield metrics um, that we were talking about yesterday, um, but. As I mentioned, there are sometimes other metrics that are useful to look at to help with the evaluation and to determine additional trade-offs. And one of those things could be the size distribution of the landings. For example, when we evaluate size limits, obviously the landings of when there's a 32-inch size limit contains zero 32-inch or under fish, no U32 fish. But when you take away that size limit, you're going to have more U32 fish in the landing. And that might be of interest to processors, commercial fishermen, or, or you know any stakeholder out there um, for various reasons. So we have the ability to look at those metrics. Also, additionally, is discard mortality. Um, and, and I'll say it, it was formerly called wastage. Um, we don't use that term anymore, but it's uh, directed commercial fishery discard mortality. And when a fish is discarded, whether it's under 32 inches or over 32 inches for various reasons, it has a chance of surviving or dying. And so we um, assume in our assessment process and um, based on uh, research recently, that the discard mortality rate is 16%. So 16% of those fish discarded suffer mortality. Um, and that's a source, another source of mortality that's accounted for in the stock assessment. Um, that is not landed fish. And so we can actually now look at the amount of discard mortality based on the size limits, which um, as you might guess, take away the size limit, discard mortality is reduced. And then finally, if the um, if there's this size dichotomy of U32 and O32 fish, and the under 32 inch fish get a different price than an O32 inch fish, which we have seen with the recent sale of U32 fish from the FIS, um, and, and that's been about 12% lower than the value of an O32 fish. Um, we might want to be concerned about the value of the fishery. And if there's a higher proportion of U32 fish in the landing, that might actually result in a decrease in the value of the fishery, um, depending on how many U32 fish are in those landings. So that's something that we might want to be aware of. And we um, calculated a statistic that was calculated in previous size limit analyses, specifically from paper 09 from the 97th annual meeting, um, to show you in the results later. So there's some additional metrics that may be helpful, but we'll definitely be uh, focusing on primary um, objectives. <clears throat> In the evaluation of multi-year assessments, we have those primary uh, metrics as well, but there again are some other metrics and trade-offs that might be useful. And these are different measures of looking at variability. Um, for example, when, there, when the assessment occurs, what is the variability in that year? 
only as opposed to the years where the TCUI might be held constant. And I'll, I'll get more into the description of these MPs if, if any of this is confusing. This will all start to come together in the end. Um, and then, of course, there's also economic metrics such as um, the effect of uh, variability on investment in fisheries. So by variability here, we're talking about the variability in that TCUI from year to year. And if that TCY is highly variable, if it goes up a, a large amount in one year, and there's a lot of investment in the fishery, whether that new gear, new boats, upgraded, and et cetera, that might be that investment might be lost if the TCY also drops down the next year. So some stability might be um, useful for that investment of um, into the fishery. And then also I bring up an um, example of this exact type of analysis looking at multi-year assessments and the effect of them, uh, but it was on summer flounder fisheries on the east coast of the U.S. And that's a paper by uh, Basha Hucknickzak here at IPHC before she came to IPHC. Um, it's a 2019 paper and I'm happy to supply that to anybody that would like it. Um, but they basically um, use some economic benefits analysis to uh, calculate the benefits or costs of multi-year assessments. But the key uh, quote from that paper that I like is once economic models have been parameterized, the capacity to examine a wide range of scenarios is greatly enhanced. In other words, once there's a little bit of background on understanding what is important to this analysis and a little bit of work done on it, and this applies to any metric, then that metric is now available to use and can be easily used in the analysis. So something to think about in the uh, results I present today, we don't have any economic analysis or economic metrics related to multi-year assessments, uh, but something to think about for the future. Um, and then just noting again, um, this is the SRB request related to those five different distribution procedures. And um, this is their request to, to, to not, to, to integrate them, but to also be aware if any one of those distribution procedures has a different effect on the ranking of the management procedures coming out of this. And so they didn't ask us to separate the procedures and look at them individually. That was a direction from the commission not to at the time but to make sure that none of these distribution procedures has any great effects. So we can do that. We can have a closer look at any of the specific MPs and distribution procedures. Although because there's five distribution procedures, there's only a hundred simulations per distribution procedure, which is not very many. Integrating them across five produces the 500 simulations. Um, but another way to examine this is to look at sort of the tails of these metrics or the quantiles. Look at the 5th and 95th percentile of the, of the, of the metric. So, for example, uh, 2A has an agreement of 1.65 million pounds for um, three of the five distribution procedures. So most of the median statistics are right around that 1.65. However... If you look at that lower 5% tail, you start to get an idea of what those two distribution procedures are doing when there is not. So that's another way to look at the effects of the individual distribution procedures is the range of uncertainty. So that's the end of this. And I just want to remind uh, the MSAB, which has already put some in the report about defining additional goals, objectives, and metrics. Um, and as a reminder, the MSAB doesn't necessarily need to define a new goal or objective to support the use of an alternative metric or additional metric in the analysis. So, for example, we, uh, the MSAB could say, yeah, I really like looking at discards, even though that's not an objective. I found it useful to understand how discards are affected by size. And, of course, any recommendations on how to present this material? what trade-offs to look at, what plots would be useful, what point size you like on the plots, whatever it is, uh, please let us know and uh, we'll make those improvements to make sure that you're able to easily understand these results. So before we start uh, looking at size limits first, um, are there any questions or comments? And then if, Ed, if you can bring up Doc, uh, presentation.
excellent. I think everybody's excited to start seeing the results, although I'm sure many of you have already seen many results. So, um, <clears throat> as I mentioned yesterday in document 09, um, I've put uh, all the results together into the single document, but um, we'll separate it out into two sections today, beginning with the size limit analysis. So as a reminder, the uh, recent MSE program of work for the last two years, uh, we were directed and focused on evaluation of size limits and also multi-year assessments. And then, of course, there's the evaluation part of a, a presentation of results, which we've definitely been uh, trying to improve. So beginning with size limits, uh, here is the commission uh, request from the 98th annual meeting asking to focus on size limits of 32 inches, 26 inches, and no size limit. And as a reminder, the MSC framework was updated substantially to accommodate any size limit. Um, so we don't have to be fixed on those. We could evaluate a 50 inch size limit if you wanted. Um, and to also, uh, it can produce meaningful outputs now of um, a lot of the commercial quantities, including discard mortality, as well as separating U32 and O32 lands. So I just put up this table to orient you to how things will be presented in this presentation. And I'm gonna walk through this table so that we're all on the same page. First off are the columns, and the individual columns are the individual management procedures. So what we have noted here is MP means management procedure, and then the A means an annual assessment frequency. And then the number after that means the size limit. So MPA0 is an annual uh, assessment every year, and a size limit of zero, which means no size limit. Um, and so we have the three different management procedures or three different size limits, all with an annual frequency here. And then down on the rows are the different options. We have the decision-making variability, estimation error, the assessment frequency, size limit, and the SPR value. And what I'm showing here is what we consider as the default or the core set of um, management procedures to evaluate. And that is really focusing on the differences in size limits and fixing all those other options at those in one value. So an SPR of 43%, which is our current reference SPR, an annual assessment frequency, which is our status quo, uh, estimation error, which is you, you really have to evaluate these with estimation error, and then the decision-making variability option one, which is uh, what we are considering status quo as well, given the um, behavior of the commission in the last two to three years. So you'll see this table oriented like that. Go ahead, Adam. See, Forrest has a question in the uh, in the chat, and I think he's asking uh, if we had no size limit, is that assuming full retention or at least mandatory retention? I think the answer is yes. If it's legal catch, you keep it. And and that's a good point, Forrest. If there's enough IFQ to cover it, so when you see results, there will still be some uh, directed commercial discard mortality, even without a size limit. And that is just to account for potential um, discarding when there's no <laughs> IFQ to cover it, whether that's O32 or U32 fish. So I do want to note that even though that, that this table that you saw previously is our core set or our default status quo set, there are a lot of other options, which you have probably noticed in the MSC Explorer and you can go down a lot of rabbit holes looking at all these different factors. But for size limits, there are different combinations of these different factors, noting that only an annual assessment frequency has an evaluation of size limits. Um, so the 26 and the zero are only associated with an annual assessment frequency. But just to note that we can look at these other options and in the MSC Explorer if um, this is wished. So let's jump into the results. Um, here you see the top part of that table, which I presented earlier, is that status quo default. Now on the bottom, 
part of the table are the associated metrics or the metrics associated with the primary objectives. And these are the primary objectives on the coast-wide scale. So we have biological sustainability, and that is the probability any relative spawning biomass is less than uh, 20%. And then we have fishery sustainability uh, metrics or objectives, and that's the target objective of the 36% of relative spawning biomass, a median average TCUI, the probability that any three years out of 10 has a TCUI change that's greater than 15% compared to the previous year, and then the average annual variability of the TCUI, which is basically the average over a 10 year period of the changes in the TCUI, that variability. So they're two slightly different metrics. And so in this table, and I'm walking through this in more detail now, and you'll see these tables more and more, so it'll go much faster. But what you can see are the three size limits, none at the left, and then a 32 inch size limit on the right, and you can see the difference in these metrics. So the long-term sustainability objective is met on the coast-wide scale. It's all very, very low. In fact, none of the simulations went below uh, 20%, and, uh, but there's only 500 simulations, so I noted it as such. We have the probability being um, less than the target of 36% of being around 14%, and that is much. Uh, that means the population on average is higher than 36%. And then we have the TCUI and variability. And what you can see is the TCUI, median average TCUI increases with uh, the reduction in the size limit. And that increase is about a 3.3% short-term increase without a size limit. And then you can see the variability doesn't change a whole lot. There might be a small change in the variability, but it's really a very minor change and probably, you know, even within the, the what we call Monte Carlo or simulation error, it's probably hard to discern if there's actually any significant difference between the, that variability. Um, so that's how we can interpret this table. We see really the key difference here in these primary metrics is in the, the coast-wide TCUI. And there's about a 3.3% increase in the short-term TCUI with no size limit. That reminds me, I do want to point out something. The, the time frame of these metrics is different for biological sustainability and fishery sustainability. I just realized my little curly braces are off a little bit. The two metrics with the relative spawning biomass are both long-term. So the 20% and the 36%, those are both long-term metrics. And then the TCY metrics are all short-term. Sorry that they're off line a little bit. Um, I must have moved the table accidentally at one point. So when you're looking at the MSA Explorer, you just might want to be cognizant if you're trying to match up these numbers that you're looking at long term or short term. And to be honest, I mess it up all the time. Um, so let me know if I did get a number um, correct or incorrect. Thanks, Adam. One other comment on uh, interpreting these tables is to recall that these are the median values. It's really important that, uh, especially when we're looking at the plots, to have the error bars included because these are not necessarily predictive values. Like the, we're, we're looking about relative ranking of one MP to another. It's not telling us the TCEY is going to be 60 million pounds. The bigger takeaway is the difference between a size limit and no size limit is roughly you know, a 3% a, you know, increase in the median TCEY. I really want to emphasize that point that it's about the relative rankings of MPs. It's not telling us this one is going to give us the number we want. I see Dan's up as well. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Nice to see you guys as well. Um, I just had two questions and just wanted, well, I guess the first is a clarification, and that's all of these um, MPs don't have the 15% max coast wide buffer on them, which is that correct? That's correct. There's no constraint on the amount that the TCY can change. So it can change by as much as it needs to. And so when we were doing our other investigations on scale and distribution, we found that without that constraint, I think the AAV was about this amount, 18%, do you remember, or 17, 18%? And then when we put the constraint on, it went down? That's correct, Dan. Okay. Um, so maybe at some point, if we proceed, you know, 
further in the investigation of size limits or um, multi-year assessments, it'd be interesting to look at runs that do have that constraint to get it below our target um, or some other constraint. But then uh, my second question is, and, and I was digging around a little bit in Explorer last night and didn't quite get there. Um, but when I look at the 3.3% the increase um, in TCEY, is that mostly the amount of fish that are under 32 inches that are now retained? In other words, looking at for example, the, the 60 million pounds under MPAO versus the 58 under A32, is that because now we're retaining 2 million pounds of U32 fish in the catch or is that the actual yield of the stock has gone up? It's, it's both, um, Dan. It's partially that the U32 has increased and partially that um, the O32 landings have also slightly increased. Um, and we'll look at some tables coming up where we look at the proportion of U32 fish in the landings, um, as well as O32 and U32 commercial landings to see those results, um, exactly how they pan out. Great. And, and I know in the MSE Explorer, you can check a metric called commercial landings O32 or commercial landings U32. And you can really see those specific numbers. You can line up the median average TCY the O32 portion of the commercial landings and the U32 and then the total commercial landings to, to get a feel for that. But uh, to again foreshadow a little bit, you'll notice in some of these tables that even recreational landings uh, or recreational limits increase with the reduction in the size limit. What that indicates is that feedback loop of changing the, um, the, the mortality on the fish at different sizes and there's actually an increase in overall yield by reducing the size limit, at least in this short-term period. And we'll look at longer-term periods uh, further in the results. So it, 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 there's a lot of little moving pieces to this. Um, the questions are great, uh, and that helps us focus on what is important to uh, be presenting. So keep asking questions, thanks. Uh, here comes Chris, good. Hi, Chris. Sure, if we can hear you yet, Chris. Yes, to unmute his uh, microphone. Can you on. unmute your microphone? Is that working now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just a just a question on. Um, no, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to come back on. Sorry, I was, it was just on those last comments. I'll figure it out and get back to you. Okay. Yeah, uh, we were talking about the uh, increase in overall yield uh, uh, with the reduction in the size limit. So, um, one question. Sorry, Alan, you you, you did uh, it. You, you refreshed my memory. All right, good. So, it, with this with the size limit. Um, when we're talking about the short term, when I was looking at the graphs, and especially when you use the graphs and you put the error bars in, it looks like when we're talking, you know, short term is four to thirteen years, but it really looks like it's it's it doesn't even the the increase doesn't extend out even into the thirteen years. It's only in the first like four, five, six, seven, or something like that. So when we talk about short term here, we're we're still referring to the four to thirteen, but it looked to me that the the increase was really in the the short part of the short term is that is that correct? Um, by increase, what are you referring to? The the, the three point three percent short term increase in TCY. That three three point three percent increase uh, in the TCY is over that four to thirteen year period. That's okay, calculated so over that. But remember that that increase. What I'm talking about there is not an increase in the projected TCY. It's the difference between a 32 inch size limit mm -hmm. and a zero inch size limit. Yeah. So yeah, I just want to make sure that we're not. Confused. Yeah, no, I've got that. So, but basically what that is, is then that's the cumulative for the, the, the 3.3%, it's the cumulative over that time period. Okay. It's an average over that time period. An average over that time period. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there'll be a plot coming up, Chris, that will look at those individual years and 
how the TCY changes with and without a size limit. And that, that's really actually a fascinating plot. So we'll be able to get more of an idea of how it changes over time. Hey, Pete. <clears throat> hey, Alan, I just noticed uh, a question in the, the comment box by Austin. As you move through assessing changes in U32 and O32 in catch, did you assess changes in sex ratio in these simulations resulting from retaining more small individuals? Yeah, um, it, it is all in the results. I just didn't calculate those metrics. So that would be an interesting um, thing to look at uh, because did we look at that at one point. I don't think we did, but it, it, it would be very interesting because of the dimorphic growth. I imagine the proportion of males would increase. But as we noted in a previous size limit analysis, um, the one, the last size limit analysis a few years ago, is that it's not all just free males coming in uh, when you reduce the size limit because there are also small females. You have to catch small females to catch small males as well. So that's why there's the, the, the trade offs here. And it isn't a huge increase in yield, although there is some increase in potential yield when you remove the size limit. Yeah. Oh, and, and Ian just reminded me that, that it's all built into the SPR. Since we're using SPR, the spawning potential ratio, we're accounting for that uh, reproductive potential in the future. And it's all sort of balanced. In the end. Thanks for that. So I'll just move on real quick. And again, thinking on the coastwide scale here, you might be thinking, OK, what if we fished at a higher fishing intensity? How would these results change? Um, and just to give you an idea, what we're plotting here is the short-term um, variability in terms of AAV on the Y or uh, vertical axis. And then against the short-term uh, average TCY on the horizontal or X axis for the different size limits, which are the, let's see, the different size limits are the colors and the different SPRs are the shapes. But it's pretty clear what's going on here. When you fish at a higher fishing intensity or an SPR of 40 percent, you see the, the, the points, the dots in the upper part of the plot. Um, and basically what that's saying is you get a higher TCY, but your um, variability from year to year also increases. And, and that's a standard result of any sort of fisheries analysis. You fish harder, you get more yield, but you also get more variability in yield. But what's interesting in here is that the response to removing a size limit is different at different fishing intensities. So the increase in potential TCY without a size limit is 4.6 in the short term when you fish at this higher fishing intensity. And then another thing that I just wanted to note is the probability of being less than 36% at an SPR of 40% is now 42%, which is much closer to that target um, spawning. So just to, to note that uh, fishing intensity has an effect on this, but the pattern still holds in that you do get an increase in the TCY without a size limit. So let's now begin to look at some area specific objectives, beginning with uh, biological sustainability. Here are the um, area or the region specific objectives for uh, percent of spawning biomass in each region. And remember these numbers that you see, the 533, 10 and 2% uh, were a bit ad hoc uh, based on recent years of data. And we found in the previous analysis that meeting this objective for 4B was actually not possible given the previous OM. And it looks to have a similar result in this operating model in that all of the uh, region-specific biological sustainability objectives are met, except for that one in 4B, where there's a greater than 5% chance of the, the proportion of spawning biomass in 4B being less than 2%. That doesn't mean there's no spawning biomass in that area. It just means that it's lower relative to the other regions. Um, so, Given the, the natural variability in the operating model and its effects and its recruitment and movement, it seems like um, the range of potential percent spawning biomass in 4B is typically 
uh, has a wide range that typically goes less than 2%. But what we do see here, I'll get right to you in a moment, Adam, is that the uh, proportion of spawning biomass in 4B uh, does increase as you remove the size limit. So there's less of a chance of going below that 2% as you remove the size limit. Hi, Adam. Uh, I was wondering if we should circle back to this or not, but it's good timing that it came up here. Uh, the, the, in particular, the biological sustainability objective for 4B. Uh, in past MSAB meetings, we had noted that it, how these proportions were defined and that they were they're pretty ad hoc and likely in need of reevaluation. My question for you is, do you have advice about how and when we should do that? Uh, I think the the last time we talked about it, it was, you know, uh, yeah, that's something a like curiosity will come back to. But when does this become an issue that we actually need to address that's going to hold up further evaluation? Like, do you have advice on on when you'd like to see that that be reevaluated? Yeah, um, I I think first and foremost, I think it's a threshold that you know is is an ad hoc threshold but we still have the metric and we can still see these patterns like we're seeing in this table is that removing the size limit has less of a chance of going below that threshold. And I think that's a useful result. Um, if we do get stuck on yes or no's or red or greens, however you want to put it, and whether or not we meet the sustainability objective, yes, I think we need to reevaluate these thresholds or even this objective or performance metrics more specifically <laughs> in the near future. I, I won't say exactly when, um, but I think that does need to be done in the near future. How that could be done with this new operating model, I think we have a really good opportunity to understand dynamics of Pacific Halibut a bit more. And maybe we can use uh, the new operating model to understand how uh, the population works in Florida. Outside of that, there's a lot of research going on here at IPHC with genetics, uh, understanding stock structure out in 4B, um, and that might help inform us not only on these types of objectives, but how the stock could be modeled in the future um, relative to 4B. So I think in the, in the near future, we'll have a, a lot of research uh, on stock structure coming out, and that might inform this as well. Other than that, um, you know, I think it's a useful metric for now just to understand the relationships but uh, relying on that threshold to say whether or not we should accept a management procedure might be a little bit premature at this point in time. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's helpful. The reason I ask is I'm not, um, I, I think it's important to look at the results. Uh, I'm thinking more about communication at the annual meeting or to the other stakeholders in the process to say, yeah, look, we found a procedure that meets all our conservation objectives but then we have to have an asterisk or a caveat and go into a discussion about, well, it doesn't meet this one, but it's actually not important because it's ad hoc, yada, yada, yada. Um, so I, I do think it's something that we should, well, let's just hone in on, on ranking MPs, be able to, to get to, um, just, just to ease communication. Sorry, Chris, I see you're up as well. Yeah, you just touched on the point I was gonna make, Adam, is that, um, you know, if we're following an MSD process or explaining it to people, technically, if you don't meet your, this is one of our biological sustainability criteria, it, it gets a, a, a red. And we, we had this problem before, you know, you stop, green means go, red means stop. So somebody looking at this from the outside would say, well, hold it. These management procedures didn't meet your, your conservation objectives. So I do think we need to flag it as something that, that needs to be addressed. We're not going to get to it in this round, but um, that it needs to be it needs to be looked at, and we need to uh, you know in our we've already talked about revisiting the objectives, but this is a is a really good example of it. Thanks, Chris and Adam. In the interim, one thing we could do is just uh, modify the performance metric, not changing the objective, but instead report um, this as as is reported and not defining it as a yes or no is one way to do it. An alternative is just to simply report the uh, median percentage in each of these regions. Um, and then we would see that the median percentage in uh, 4B would probably be like 2.6 or something like that, I forget. You can actually see that metric in the MSE Explorer. 
So it might just be a matter of not changing the objective, but how we report the metric associated with that objective. Okay, so um, yeah, so uh, I, I think that's an interesting result. Uh, less probability of going below low, low percentage in 4B as we remove the size limit, which is an indication that more spawning biomass is available in 4B without the, the size limit. So then uh, further looking at area um, specific objectives and related to the variability, what is summarized in this table is uh, for each IPHC regulatory area, the probability of there being more than three years where the TCY has changed greater than 15% uh, uh, compared to the previous year. So three or more years, a greater change than 15% in the TCY. And <clears throat> what you can see is there's very slight differences between the size limits in this. As we noted on the coastwide scale, the, the variability didn't seem to be much affected by the size limit. And that sort of holds at the regulatory area level as well. You can begin to look at these numbers and you can see very slight differences. But as Chris pointed out on day one, sometimes you get focused on the numbers a bit too much um, and plotting might be a little bit better. So I think my conclusion on th these results are that variability doesn't change a whole lot between um, the size limits. And we can also look at the AAV and see a, a very similar pattern, maybe very slight reductions in the AAV, but they're all pretty similar um, across all of these uh, uh, size limits. <clears throat> Where the real interesting results, uh, at least for us, occur is in the TCEYs, uh, both at the coastwide scale, we saw it was a 3.3% percent increase at the coastwide scale, but also at the um, uh, the, uh, the regulatory area scale. I'm just realizing that uh, I think it's Adobe is shifting my tables off a little bit and the curly braces. So I, I'll blame Adobe for any shifts that things don't line up. But um, what you can see here is that at e for each IPHC regulatory area, the median TCOI increases or remains constant. It's basically remaining constant in 2A because of the agreement for three of the five distribution procedures. But again, looking at the tails might give you more insight into how the TCY and 2A changes across the size limits. So looking at those quantiles. Um, we have different percentage increases, um, which I've put it both as the absolute value or the actual value of the TCY and the percent increase to, to show the differences. Because we have things like in 3A, it's a 4.7 increase, but that's an increase of over a million pounds of um, the TCY for 3A when removing the size limit. Um, whereas you have like a, a large percentage increase in 4B, but that's only uh, about 200 or 150,000 pounds in, in that region. But it, it might, you know, so it's whether that's important for a region or not, um, that's for the MSAB to help decide. But you notice that there is an increase in the TCY in all regulatory areas without a size limit. Chris? Yeah, <clears throat> just on this one, um, I looked at it and I looked at it in the graph and I put on the error bars. I used the 25, 75. And when you do that, it kind of really shows there's no, there's not really an appreciable difference when you bring that into it. Um, am I interpreting that correctly? <laughs> you're, you're saying there's no, uh, oh, with the error bars, there's yeah. just variability. It doesn't look like an increase. And yeah, that you, you can interpret it that way, but I think you have to be cautious is <clears throat> those error bars are representing the, the variability in the TCY um, that is possible. So I think summarizing it by this median, and then we can also look at, um, you know, specific quantiles and see how they relate to each other. We have to think more about comparing each individual simulation to each other. And that's where these metrics are getting at. It's more of a fair comparison. 
um, saying that, okay, in this year with a size limit, the TCY was 60 million pounds. Without a size limit, it was 62 million pounds. <clears throat> but in a different simulation in that year, it was 120 million pounds versus 124 million pounds. So I think we have to think about it as in general, without a size limit is showing us uh, potential for increased yield, but there's a lot of variability about that. And we can calculate different metrics to get at what you're talking about. Is the increase in yield <clears throat> consistent across all of these different simulations? And I have a plot showing that coming up, the plot okay. that will show the time series of it. Okay. Really good question though, Chris, is how do you actually interpret these ranges uh, medians and quantiles. Forks, how you doing? Not hearing you yet. There you go. Oh, I think. You know, okay. And I, I'm assuming that this takes into account the, the sh um, effect on distribution if we drop the size limit with, for instance, Western areas uh, or the majority of the stock may be smaller um, and, and it would it would capture that pull of distribution uh, different from an O32 um, when we're looking at these tables. Yes, and, and that is the key. Uh, the, the, the real reason the commission directed to look at size limits with the MSE is to get that feedback now, to incorporate that feedback loop. loop. The way we've looked at it before was looking at um, the size limits given current conditions. This is what might have occurred. Now we're looking at, given a size limit over time, what is the feedback? What are changes in distribution? How does that have effect on the stock and thus an effect on the, um, the fishery in each of these different regulatory areas? So remember what we're looking at here, short-term statistics for each of these fisheries. We'll look at some long-term ones as well, which will have different result. And that's because the feedback over the long-term period uh, um, is different. It's occurred at a, at a, it's actually has uh, allowed the stock to redistribute or whatever over a longer period of time. Thanks for that, appreciate it. <clears throat> hey, Dan. Hey, I just wanted to clarify um, an assumption on this is that all the, all the five distribution um, scenarios you use still use O32 stock distribution as the baseline of those. And I know we've looked at um, size limits in the past, you could also say that if you're going to change the size limit down to 26 inches, then you would use O26 as the basis for the distribution. But that's not the case here. I think that plays a, a, has a big effect on why um, there aren't really big winners and losers in the percent changes, because it's still based on the, the basic O32 stock distribution we've been using. Um, and you don't see such a, a difference in some of the western areas where there are more small fish. If you had moved, for example, to an O26 as the basis for distribution, you might see a lot more changes amongst the regulatory areas. Yeah, a really good point, Dan. And you are correct. All of these distribution procedures, O32, um, in their stock distribution, um, they do not change with the size limit. So no size limit is still using O32 stock distribution. And the effect of that, you know, we, we could experiment with that in the future, looking at different methods to distribute using O26 or zero or matching it to a size limit, whatever it is, to understand the effects of that. And then I just want to remind you as well, in there are the relative harvest rates. Uh, I think some of these distribution procedures have slightly different, uh, are they all the same? I honestly can't remember at this point, but um, there's also the relative harvest rate uh, concept in, in these as well. Um, and we'll I think there are some differences in the relative harvest rate. I think that's one of the differences in a few of them is that you have a, um, the relative harvest rate goes up to one in some of the area fours and three B. Yeah, I, I thought you were right, but I wasn't sure. But you, you, we can always double check on that. But I think, yeah, one of them is it goes to 1 and 4A and 4C, D, and E. It remains at 0.75 and 4B. But, um, you know, that, that that's part of the, the complexity of these things is things, the, all of these little elements sometimes interact with each other. 
issues. Um, and that was one of the points we were trying to make when the commission makes a decision, we can always reevaluate these things based on the decision that the commission makes. We can evaluate and look at the outcomes of the decision they've made using the MSE, but also then further examine the, these other elements. Um, having this MSE framework uh, built like this and uh, now it, it's, you know, we put in a lot of the, the base foundation work and now we can just use the tool as we need to use it. And that's going to be the benefit as we go into the future. <clears throat> okay, so related to uh, the TCY and the regulatory areas, we see an increase uh, with all of these procedures uh, when we remove the size limit. Now, we also summarize the percentage of the TCY in, in each uh, regulatory area. And again, these are all related to the primary objective. So there was a primary objective of the percentage TCY in each regulatory area. And you can see that actually the percentage of the TCY remains pretty consistent across these areas as the size limit is reduced. Very small changes, if anything. Um, and you know nothing really significant that, that I would say across across these. Now um, this is just focused on the size limits, of course. Another objective is the minimum TCY in each regulatory area, and what we've done here is taken the the minimum from each simulation and then summarized it as a median value here. So. Some simulations might be lower. Actually, half of the simulations are lower than this, and sort of the minimum TCY observed in the short term, and half are higher than this. But this gives you an idea of that lower bound of the TCY in each regulatory area. What you can see is that it increases without the size limit for, for these areas. Um, although, again, by a small amount, but this is, again, looking at that lower tail. And then looking at the minimum percentage of the TCY in each regulatory area, again, another primary objective. Um, that is, again, the same or very similar across these regulatory areas and not much, di not much different. But <clears throat> what you notice is that because it's a minimum value, it is slightly less than the median percent difference. So again, comparing it to the median, now we're looking at the lower tail. But not much difference according to the size limits when you rank these management procedures. Okay, so that's the primary um, objectives. That's all the metrics associated with the primary objectives, both at the coastwide and the area levels. Um, and what we wanted to present was a few of these additional metrics. Um, and again, honing in on what's happening with commercial landings, because that's really where the size limit is applied is on the commercial fishery. So what is the effect on the commercial landing specifically it might be useful to look at. And now um, now we can start to answer the question Dan was asking earlier. Well, what is the composition of these commercial landings? So let's look first at all sizes in the commercial landings. This is all uh, all sizes U32, O32 for all the, the, the different size limits. And what you can see on the coastwide level at the top there, it's about a 7.7 .7 increase in the commercial landings. So th this isn't necessarily the limit, this is actual landings that would occur in the fishery. And then you can see across the different regulatory areas below that, there's also an increase in the commercial landings um, that would occur without uh, without a size limit. And those, those percentages are comparing the 32 inch to the zero inch size limits, ranging from a you know, small increase in 2A, mostly because it has a, a pretty strong agreement in place for three of the five distribution procedures, um, to 12.7% increase in 4C and those commercial If we look now at the percentage of the U32 landings in each of these regulatory areas, as well as coastwide on the top there, you can see that um, <clears throat> without the size limit, the 7.3% of the landings by weight is U32 fish. 
So this again, there was a 7.7 increase percent increase in the total coast, uh, coastwide commercial landings. 7.3 percent of that is U32 um, landings. I don't think that's really comparable. It's a slightly different metric, but it shows you that um, a, a, you know there's a good percentage of U32 fish in the in the in the landings. Um, and it's really just showing you that within each regulatory area below that, each regulatory area is gonna have a different percentage um, of U32 fish in its landings. And that might be something of consideration if um, one of those areas is important. Yeah, Dan. Then I guess just, you know, thinking ahead to the minutes and stuff, is it fair to summarize that it it does result in potentially a 7% increase in fishery landings um, with you know, the additional U32 fish making up a large component of this increase? Yeah, I, I, I caution on that because the 7.7 the we saw on the previous slide in the coastwide landings is the increase in the total yield. Now we're summarizing of that total yield, what percentage is um, U32 fish um, and so it's not necessarily that the majority is U32 fish. Um, we would have to actually look at the numbers in MSC Explorer and calculate exactly how much of that yield is, is um, from U32 fish. So um, I think that that's the number I'm trying to get at. And so yeah, yeah. You know, I think that's an important one for our minutes. And so if there's any way well, we can characterize that at this meeting in you know the correct word you know wording. I think that would be really helpful at some point. I, I will calculate calculate that during the break. I just want to make sure I do it correct and I'm not um, talking about here. Um, so that's what proportion of the increase is U uh, thirty two fish? Yeah, okay. exactly. Thank you. Yep. I agree, Dan. I think that'd be a helpful uh, the re result to report. I think the other piece that we need to note in the, the minutes too is the outstanding question about uh, how that might change if we were using something other than O32 distribution as the underlying uh, mechanism. I, I, there's not result for that uh, piece yet, correct? That's right. Yeah, it's only uh, O32 in the stock distribution. That's, that's the only option used. Okay, excellent. We're, we're moving along here. We're doing good. Um, and, and I want to get, if we get through this presentation, then we can really begin to explore some of the, the questions um, further. Okay, so we have the percentage of U32 landings. Some areas have as much as 10% in the landings or would be composed of U32 fish on, um, on average. <clears throat> and here now is a look at the commercial discards. So let's focus on the rightmost column with the 32 inch size limit. And on the coastwide level, um, the in the short term, the median amount of discards is a just under a million uh, million pounds. And Ian, can you uh, remind me, is it about a million pounds that you've been seeing the, the commercial discards currently? I guess that's been, it's been a little lower in the last couple of years. It's been around 700,000 pounds. So, so, so that's about, yeah. about on the same, same level. So that, that's sort of a good check on the MSE operating model as well. But just under a million pounds coastwide with the size limit, what you'll notice coastwide is that reducing the size limit to 26 inches um, reduces the amount of discards by a significant amount. And that's because of due to hook size and, and everything else in the commercial fishery, um, they mostly catch fish over 26 inches. And then there's a, a, a small amount of further reduction as you go to no size limit, noting that there still are discards in the commercial fishery without a size limit. And that is due to things like lost gear um, and discards due to um, regulatory area limits, as Forrest noted out, if you have IFQ limit to cover the catch. Um, <clears throat> so that's about a 67 to 89% reduction by area 
um, in these disc cars, if you look at each individual area, you see that it's a quite a large reduction with most of that reduction occurring, um, going moving to a 26 inch size. <clears throat> Real quick, Alan, is that mortality or is that? Yes, this is, discards? This, so is this is 16 percent of the discards. Yes, that's correct. Um, which without a side, it, it, you know, it, it's 16 percent of the total discards, but the total discards is actually lower as well. But this is discard mortality. I should probably note that. It's slightly different than 16 percent because it does include some lost gear. And we assume the lost gear uh, component's 100%. The, and this assumes 100% compliance with regulation, retention regulations, et cetera? Or did you put anything in there for non-compliance since we don't have 100% monitoring? Yes, I, yeah, I believe this is uh, assuming 100% compliance. I don't implementation error comes in where the the realized mortality and the mortality limit are not exact and um i forget exactly why that happens in the model but it's it's really really close the limit and the mortality is very very close for the commercial fishery so it assumes pretty much 100 percent compliance <clears throat> Okay, so there's some other things we can do to further understand the effects of size limits. And, and these are things that we feel are important, as well as the SRB. And so the SRB recommended further analysis of economic implications of harvesting smaller fish uh, and, and things like that. So, so um, we don't actually present any of the scenarios um, that are... Uh, of small targeting smaller fish in this presentation. But as I noted yesterday, those results were uploaded just a couple of days ago in the MSC Explorer. We can look at those in the MSC Explorer. But now we want to focus on if selectivity in the fishery remains as it has in the past, so there's no new targeting of small or large fish. What are some further um, metrics we can calculate to understand the effects of size limit? And what was done in the previous size limit analysis, this paper linked here, and I think you can click right on that link if you want to see it. Um, we investigated the value of the fishery dependent on the ratio of the price between U32 and O32 fish. So it didn't try to say this would be the price. It didn't try uh, uh, economic feedback analysis or anything like that. All it did is says, if you get the price of a U32 fish is one half the price of an O32 fish. What's the value of the fishery under these three scenarios of size limits? I like to throw in equations just to make sure everybody's awake every once in a while. Um, and because I find when I look at the equations, it helps me understand what the metric is doing. So we call this metric the equal value price ratio or EVPR. Um, and just noting it was called the critical price ratio in that previous paper. Um, we found, we, we just felt that equal value describes it a little bit better. And all that it is, is the ratio between the price of U32 commercial landings and the price of O32 command uh, landings that would result in an equal value of the fishery with or without a size limit. So it's looking as you begin to land more U32 fish that could be uh, a price that is less, what does the price of those U32 fish need to be to have an equal value in the fishery? Now, to get to Dan's question of like, is all the yield gain in U32 fish, this is sort of a different way to look at it in terms of value is like, as you increase the amount of uh, under 32 inch fish, is the value going to be affected if the price is different? So that bottom equation helps me understand what the different ranges of values mean. And I'll show you just by um, first presenting this plot of these sort of squashed, I don't know, bases or something like that. These are called violin plots, um, although these don't really look like violins. But what we have here is the short-term equal value price ratio. Um, and that's the vertical or y-axis. 
And then on the horizontal axis, we have these two different figures, basically. And those two different figures are showing um, moving from a 32-inch size limit to a zero-inch size limit, or moving from a 32-inch size limit to a 26-inch size limit, and calculating this EVPR. So to orient you, um, on the right there is the curly brace showing that range between zero and one. And what that means is that the U32 price would be a fraction of the O32 price for the fishery to be equal value. So for example, if uh, the one on an EVPR of one, that solid uh, horizontal line, would mean that U32 price is the same as the O32 price. Um, and there are some simulations that actually said that would be the ratio between these two that would have to occur to have an equal value in the fishery. Um, but the most of the simulations occurred between zero and one. And the median value of all these simulations says for the fishery to have an equal value, that means you remove the size limit and the value of the fishery doesn't change even though the yield goes up the price ratio would have to be about half for a U32 fish. So if the U32 fish was about half the price of an O32 fish, then the value would come out equal when removing the size limit. Now, if a U32 fish was the same price as an O32 fish, then there would be a gain in value. So that's the way you can really think about this. Um, and then uh, I see Peggy has a hand raised. I'll get to you in one moment, Peggy just to further explain the rest of this plot, when you're below a value of zero, that actually means your O32 uh, yield went up and you actually have more O32 fish without the size limit. And then um, uh, I can't remember exactly how to describe it when it's above one, but I think that means you would need a higher price for U32 fish for an equal value of the fishery which probably means there's a huge, there's a large amount of U32 fish making up the additional yield, and thus you would need a, a additional value for those for those U32 fish. Uh, Peggy, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I there I am. Nice to see everyone. Is Hi. this <laughs> is this based on um, X vessel price? It, the, the beauty of this is it doesn't have to, to be based on any price. It is just when you look at those ratios, the actual value of the price sort of cancels out. So this will hold for if it's a price of a dollar a pound or a price of $100 a pound. It's just the ratio of that. If it's a dollar a pound for O32, U32 would have to be 50 cents a pound. If it's $100 a pound for O32, U32 would have to be 50 dollars but so that, that, okay that's helpful but um i guess my question is at what stage in the in the value chain is this looked at the first stage it's at uh, this likely would not be applicable an applicable um simulation for say consumer prices yeah i would say this is mostly applicable to the uh the the landing price or when the fish are landed off of the commercial vessel. And it's just, it's just getting at the value of the landings of the commercial fishery. That's great. Thanks, Alan. So really simplistic is just trying to, to bring in a new metric that says if the price of U32 fish is different than O32 fish, we might want to be aware of what would actually cause a reduction in value to the commercial I see Kurt has his hand raised. Um, I'm trying to turn on my camera, but it's not quite working there. But it, do, it doesn't matter if you can hear me. Um, I, have a question, and I wanted to thank Peggy. She she got one of my was wondering about the the uh, the prices. You know what, what was used as the basis of the price, whether this was X vessel or not, but. I was also curious, just as by way of background, um, this analysis for the price of U32 fish was based upon sales made by fish captured in the set line survey. Is that correct? Well, this um, 
we do have those data from the set line survey of the FIS um, that indicate potential prices of these 32 fish. So this analysis doesn't use any of that. It's just a very simplistic analysis. If this was the price and that was the price, what would, you know, what, what's the ratio we need to be for an equal value? But the beauty of that is now we do have four years, three or four years of observation of what we're just getting here. And the FIS has been being, um, I think about the price of U32 fish has been 88% of the price of an O32 fish. I have that summarized in that slide coming up. Right, right. And that's what I was getting at. Apart from this price ratio analysis, um, I'm assuming that in general for O32 fish, the set line survey, the prices offered for the sale of set line survey halibut tracks very well with the prices offered to commercial fishermen for their old O32 fish. Is that is that correct? As I understand it, I'm pretty sure it is, but if somebody else has a better feel on it, um, I'm happy to hear from them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just I'm just curious about that, knowing that you know there are relationships between commercial fishermen and their processors. I don't know that relationship exists with the set line survey sales of fish and whether that would make a difference or not. But yeah. yeah okay, yeah. But, but that's a really good point, Kurt, is that I am not saying I'm going to predict what's going to happen in the future, um, especially in economics. One, I'm not, an, I'm not an expert on economics at all. And two, we don't know what market might look like for U32 fish or O32 fish if we did remove a size limit. Um, that might change in the future. Markets might develop. People might all of a sudden like these little tiny halibut or something like that. Who knows? Um, so we're just trying to present this as as this is something we might want to consider and look at. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, great points. Excellent. I, I see <laughs> Tom has a question in the chat. What does the small b and the options represent? And, and I think uh, that might be referring to the multi-year stuff. I'll explain that when we get to the analysis of the multi-year assessments. So like MP and then capital B, small b, there's also capital B, small a. The, the small letter represents the way that we're treating the non-assessment years. And we'll describe that more when we get there. All right, I hope everybody's doing really good. We have one more hour before we're going to break here. Um, and I won't be offended if anybody... Uh, runs away from their computer for a minute to either scream or yell or do whatever they need. Um, but but he, here we go, we'll continue on and hopefully it's all good. Okay, so excellent. We talked a lot about these caveats already. Um, and one thing is, you know, it, it's not considering the actual price, but it's also not considering a change in price due to a change in supply. So this, again, is a very simplistic look at a ratio between the two. It's not considering any sort of feedback of price and supply um, and, and all those other things that can come into a um, economic analysis. Now I wanna note on the bottom of the slide is a request from SRB 19 uh, to the Secretariat. And that was uh, for further information, such as inverse demand curves to be presented to the SRB, um, and blah, 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 a bunch of economic stuff. But what they were looking at was exactly this, understanding this uh, effect of supply on price and to be able to understand more of these details on how an increase in yield might actually affect price. Um, and so... That might be an important thing to consider in the future instead of just this really simple ratio. Hi, Adam. Hi. So I would just kind of segues well into my question was, so where to from here for this piece? I mean, the SRB recommendation was um, from last year. So some of the work has been done to... Uh, to to further the analysis. And then there was the discussion at SRB in September, this past September to say some further analysis of economic implications should be done. So some, some of these you know, potential metrics have been produced. Do, do you have a vision of where this would fit within our current scope of work 
and like how we should plan for our future scope work for economic analysis. I'd ask because I'm, I'm struggling a little bit to see, okay, so how do we communicate this effectively to, to commissioners and to other stakeholders? Sure, thanks, Adam. A really good question. And the, the first thing I know, one, is we just recently have finished up uh, economics impact analysis that the commission had requested. And uh, Basha here at IPHC did a fantastic job on that and completed that work and, and the commission was appreciative of it, but they didn't support any further work on that type of economic analysis. Um, noting that, what I want to note here is this type of economic analysis is very different than the work that was done previously. It's not looking at impacts, regional, all, all those other little things that, that Basha did very well. This is more looking at you know supply demand, um, and all those other little economics things that, you know, I'm not an expert on. And I, I do ask Basha, if you want to chime in, feel free. But I think the main point is in this MSE, doing these types of analyses and what the SRB has discussion, the discussing is a very different type of analysis than what has been done at the commission in the past and what was completed earlier. Um, these are things that, that I see, these really simple type of analyses that we're presenting today can be very useful in making these decisions. Um, and perhaps with a little bit more work from an economist on supply demand and other things to really, to really get the proper um, input into these, such as the yield increases, but will that re cause a reduction in price and then make these uh, price ratios even more uh, a, a little bit different, is that something that does need to be investigated in here? Um, so other than that, Basha, feel free to jump in if you would like. Um, but um, I see it as a, as a different way and it's something that the commission can consider as they move forward in their direction. Thanks, Alan. So uh, maybe the takeaway is you know, here's, some, here's some analysis or here's some metrics that can be produced from the MSE process. That the next step would be needing, you know, uh, economic need an economist to help with the interpretation and assess how it might be useful to, to the process. Um, Kurt, I also see your hand is up, but I'm not sure if that's from your previous question or not. I'll take it down. Thanks. Okay, uh, I think back to you then, Alan. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks for that. And I think that, you know, if the MSAP finds something along those lines is important, um, that would be uh, good to put into the report. But I just want to mention some other caveats. And, and just so that we don't think that this is some fancy economic analysis that I'm doing, because as I said, I'm not the expert here. Um, and, and Basha has been a huge help, but she's also been a huge help in, uh, in identifying the caveats to this EDTR analysis. So it assumes the price ratio is independent of the total landings and that the price for O32 and U32 would change in parallel. So they would both go up at the same rates and down, there wouldn't be differences between the two. Um, it does not consider efficiency. And if there might be um, reduced costs, say if you're keeping all your fish, you might be using less bait or even doing fewer trips. Um, so th that's something important to consider as well. Um, and then some. You know, additional work on this, as we were just talking about, would provide um, the actual value of the fishery in addition to this price ratio. So as we noted, we're not talking about actual value here with this EVPR. We're just talking about how to maintain an equal value if there uh, is the removal of a size limit. Okay, so some further understanding would be to actually look at some of the other sectors. So we are able to summarize uh, recreational limits for uh, the coastwide, as well as a few uh, regulatory areas where we separated out the recreational fisheries at a previous MSAP. And what you can see here is that even without um, a size limit, there is an increase in um, the recreational limits across the, the regulatory areas. I note that then there's a star in 3A there. We found uh, just a couple weeks ago that there's a really minor error in the, um, the way that the catch sharing plan is simulated in the MSE 
Um, and we, it, it's a, it, it's an error instead of uh, the 14% in 3A when I think it's 14% when it's at its highest levels of TCY. Um, it was putting in a fixed value, which was potentially higher than 14%. So 3I, 3A might be a little biased high on the upper end there, but I don't think it affects the ranking of its management procedure. Okay, so that was some additional look at those short-term metrics. Um, but one thing that we wanted to make sure we covered was looking at long-term effects and size limits. And the reason here is that the commission has, uh, when the commission directed the secretariat to investigate size limits, it was really um, some of the questions remaining were with regard to the long-term change as highlighted in the red are a couple of requests from the commission that both that mentioned long-term changes and long-term effects of a change in the size limit. So we just want to make sure we're covering these requests and take a look at long-term effects. And I think it's important anyways because uh, there are some, some important differences to note. So what is being shown here is now you see on the left is the long-term median percent, percent spawning biomass in each region. Uh, for each of these three different size limits. And really the key here is that the change isn't very great. Although you can see maybe a slightly larger amount of biomass in the uh, Western areas without a size limit. And that we saw that um, in the primary objective for region 4B that it was less probability of it going below 2% of the um, total uh, spawning biomass in coast Y. And you can see why it's just piling up a little bit more. But overall, it's very small changes, uh, maybe a little bit of redistribution, but nothing huge and uh, nothing major based on these size limits with the assumptions of the distribution procedures. Sorry, Alan, going back to that, that's distribution of O32. Right, because their spawning biomass is that <clears throat> same as O32. No, spawning biomass is different than O32. Mm -hmm. so the distribution, uh, the stock distribution in the distribution procedure, the management procedure uses O32. But this is a metric based on actual spawning biomass that is calculated from the maturity curve, which I think is right. a little bit more to the right than O32. Yeah, it a little bit smaller. Be, yeah, yeah, it would contain. Some O32 fish would not be included in the spawning mount. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Chuck. Yeah, I, I guess would you it part of this decrease, say for a region two, would that be uh, a lack of migration uh, capable with the smaller fish, which is where most of the migration is actually being caught in the western and northern regions? that be a small percentage of that as well thanks yeah yeah it's you know it's really really difficult to pin down the reason for this and to be honest this is something that i would really have to look into uh look at some very specific results and and, and honestly i can't i can't say what the reason is at this point in time i just haven't had the time to really look into these results I've been focused on other things with that said it's important to note these results um, but, you know, there's, a, there's hypotheses about this. That we could hypothesize why this is occurring and then investigate those. Um, so I'm sorry I'm not able to answer your question. Maybe Ian has a good hypothesis why this occurs, but um, I, I'm not willing at this point in time to exactly say what I think is, is the real reason behind this because there's so many little, little interacting parts and so much feedback in, in the long term that it would would take doing some experimentation to actually dial into that. And the differences are so small, it'd be hard to, to, to get out the, um, the real reasons. We'd have to really ramp it up and find out what is causing some bigger differences and then try to understand that. So, so, so sorry about that. The, the key result here is that um, minor differences, there's a lot of variability in this if we looked at the quantiles. But um, 
there does there could potentially be a very small redistribution of spawning biomass, but nothing significant to be worried about, in, in my opinion. Okay, so looking further at uh, long-term effects on the TCY, what's plotted here is the short-term TCY on the left and then the long-term TCY on the right. And these are now the violin plots, looking a little bit more like violins in this case, for the three different um, size limits, and those are the different shades in the, in the plots. And what you can see, if you just generally look at short term and long term, there's really a difference in how the TCY, the ranges of TCYs um, for the short term and the long term. And that's that's for two reasons. One, the long term has more of the feedback occurring. But the second reason that the range is larger in the long term is it's had more of a chance to integrate over the possible different states of the population. And what I mean there is, we're simulating things like weighted age and um, PDO regime that's affecting uh, migration and uh, average recruitment. In the short term, those uh, states of nature, the weighted age, the size of age of a fish, as well as the PDO regime, are affected by the starting point. And the starting point is um, a high regime and a low weighted age. And so there's still that effect occurring in the short term as we go to the long term, it's integrating over those possible states a lot more. So that just shows the wider range of the TCY. But the important part of this plot is comparing the differences between the size limits in each of them. And what we saw in the short term was about a 3.3% increase in the TCY with removing the size limit. What we see in the long term is about a 1.9% or 1.3 million pound increase in the median TCY, those white dots in the plot. So a little less percent increase in the TCY in the long term, given all the feedbacks and all the different um, sources of uncertainty and variability in the population. Sorry, Alan, can you say that last point once more? Um, the that there's a smaller percent increase in the median TCY in the long term when there, when with removal of a size limit, given all the variability in the population um, right. and, and the feedback of uh, a longer term feedback of the um, management procedure. And so it's getting more to an equilibrium state as well. Right, okay, thanks. Um, Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, um, when you're making that calculation of you know what percentage of the yield increase comes from keeping the smaller fish, could you also do that for the long term as well? In other yeah. words, is, and it'd be interesting just to kind of contrast how if they're the same or if they change at all. That would be helpful. Okay, we'll do. I'll, I'll make a quick note of that. Okay. Um, all right, so here is actually an interesting plot for, for a number of reasons. It even addresses some things we were talking about um, yesterday. But I wanted to, to bring in, again, the concept of um, different fishing intensities and the effect that has on these size limits in the long term. Well, I can't see that screen up here, so I'll look here. Um, but what we have plotted here on the, the Y vertical axis is the, the median TCY in the long term. And then on the horizontal X axis is the median relative spawning biomass at this, this time. So as a reminder, the target relative spawning biomass is 36%. And you can see that the leftmost portion of this plot would be the 36% on um, and so with a fishing intensity uh, SPR of 40%, that's the leftmost dots, and the, that's closest to the target. So 40% SPR is uh, still just slightly above target. And then as we reduce fishing intensity, this plot moves to the right, the points move to the right, and a 46% SPR is on the rightmost side. Okay, so getting back to size limits and how fishing intensity uh, affects size limits, what we can see in this plot is that 
the size limit at a higher fission intensity, the left side of the size of the plot, seems to have a wider range, at least in TCY, compared to the rightmost side of the plot. So there is some effect on the total pounds of um, increase in yield based on fishing intensity, although I have not calculated the percentage increases, and those might be closer um, together. Another interesting thing to note is that at an SPR of 46 percent, as you see on the rightmost side, the difference between a uh, no size limit zero and 26 inch size limit is, is not much different actually. The dark blue and the light blue are laying almost on top of each other. So these are the types of trade-off plots that I really like to look at. There's so much information in just a single plot. But it, when we're focused on size limits, we see fishing intensity does have effect on the amount of yield that would change given the size limit. Something to just sort of keep in mind. Helen, can we explore that a little bit? Like I'm struggling to understand what might be the, let's put together the hypothesis of what might be driving that. So uh, make sure I understand. What we see is that a, uh, a more intense fishing, so a lower fishing intensity, SPR 40, um, more intense fishing produces a greater range of TCEYs uh, for different size limits. So more fishing harder, means more TCEY, but a greater spread among size limits. That's right. And, what, and the, reason what, yeah. there, it, the reason there is you're harvesting more of those uh, small fish. Um, you're, you're hitting because them the fishing harder. intensity is higher. Yeah. And, and okay. yeah, because the fishing intensity is higher, you're taking um, a larger proportion of those small fish, but we're not at the bottom point there. It says we haven't surpassed the peak of the yield versus um, relative spawning biomass curve. So we're still going to the, the maximum sustainable yield as we move to the left on this plot. And so we're still um, in long-term equilibrium. We're still not even at maximum sustainable yield at a 40% SPR. And thus we can really continue to maximize this. And um, it seems that we, uh, what's happening here is it just is uh, taking more of those U32 fish. More of those U32. It's still, oh, right. Okay. So even. Um, well, it's having, higher... it, it, it's, it, it's complicated again, but we could look at the results to really get a good idea of this. But what I believe is happening is, is that you are shifting selectivity on, um, and, and it has to do with yield per recruit as well. But you haven't maximized, you haven't hit that, um, what Beverton Holt referred to as T max or T optimum, mm -hmm. was that you're still going down that selectivity curve to find your optimal selectivity as well. So we're still going towards maximum sustainable yield, but we're still um, changing yield per recruit and finding our optimal um, selectivity as well and down the size. So as SPR goes from 46 to 40, we're going down the yield curve. Our proportion of over 32 fish is still increasing, but we've also added some, some you know, U26 and O26 fish to the to the yield. Yeah, that, that that's likely what's happening. And we can look at the commercial. We could summarize this exact plot by um, U32 and O32 commercial landings to get a. a that's somewhat of a feel of that. All right. Okay. Sorry. Thanks for entertaining me. There's a lot of information in these plots to, to oh, interpret. It, it is. And I mean, Ian and I would I'd come in the office every morning and Ian and I would have an hour discussion about just this plot, you know, for example, there, there's so much information here. It's so much fun to, to analyze this. That's why I'm very excited to be presenting it to you today because every word I say, I learned something new. <laughs> So uh, oh, yeah, good. thank you. If the questions coming. We still have about uh, a half an hour here. I'm almost done with what's presented for size limits, and then we can go into questions and further exploration. Okay, so again, here's another trade-off plot with a ton of information in it, and it's just a little bit different than the previous one. What we have on the vertical axis this time is variability in the TCY. And what we have on the horizontal x-axis is now the median TCY. 
So uh, again, just looking, stepping back, combining the colors, and looking at it. As you change your fishing intensity, you increase your yield. But with that increase in yield also comes an increase in variability. We saw this earlier, and this is now long-term, so it's just good to verify. Um, and what, what this plot is also telling me is that there's that increase in yield. We see the differences between the size limits, as we saw in the previous plot. But now with the variability in there, we see that it's, it's pretty interesting. At, in the middle there at the 43%, we see removing the size limit might cause a very slight decrease in variability. But at a higher fishing intensity, that might be opposite. The higher fishing intensity might now cause an increase in variability when removing the size limit. So there's some switch occurring between the 43 and the 40% um, SPR values. Alan, would you be able to use a, a marker, a laser pointer, or the mouse yeah. to indicate where you're speaking to? I think it's a really important point to know the, the switch with fishing intensity versus different size limits. Is that? You can draw with that, and then the oh, finger okay. you can point. Yeah, okay. So, okay. So, if you look right here, well, right there, pick the Oh yeah, okay, got it. All right, I'll figure it out. Sorry, um, I needed my intro to um, Adobe Connect. So right in here is that 43% SPR. And what that shows, you see going red to blue. I don't know if you can actually see the cursor as well. No. I don't see the cursor now, but we can see your circle. But yes, we go from red to blue. Right. We're going from uh, size limit to no size limit. So we go left, oh, there's a cursor, yeah. yeah. So we go yeah. left to right, and as we remove the size limit, we see an increase in yield and a decrease in catch variability. That's right, so this th this axis over here is variability, this axis is yield. So yes, you're exactly right, Adam. Increase in yield, a decrease in variability. But when we're now up here at the um, higher, intensity. Wow, this is really this. I never really liked how, oh, well, forget it. I'll just point. Um, um, so when you're now up here at the higher fishing intensity, so you're fishing harder, SPR 40%, bringing the stock to lower levels as we saw in the previous plot. But what's happening is you still get that increase in yield, but now the variability doesn't decrease, it actually could potentially increase the variability. So there's some switch in how the variability responds to the size limit when going from 43 to 40%. Right. That, Thank that's you. That's an interesting result to me. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, it's uh, I mean, this is exactly the reason why we go through these simulations is to see the relative performance and how it changes with different components of the MP. So again, the, the takeaway for folks here is at this mid-range fishing intensity of FSPR 43%, uh, removing the size limit increases yield and decreases variability, but at a higher, a more intense SPR, so SPR 40, uh, removing the size limit increases variability and increases yield. And I think what this also shows is that um, Another way to paraphrase what you're saying, Adam, is the um, fishing intensity is not independent of the results of the size limit. And so we can't just say right. remove the size limit and increase it to 40% because we liked what we saw with the size limit. We have to make sure that we understand the interactions of these different uh, elements of the management procedure. Yeah, yeah, good point. Okay, so you can create this plot in MSC Explorer. It's taken right from MSC Explorer. Um, and um, stare at it for an hour and a half between 11.30 and one. That's what I like to do. <laughs> okay, so thanks, Ed, appreciate that. Um, so now again, in the long-term TCY, let's look, before we looked at the median TCY for each regulatory area in the short term, and let's look at it in the long term. And what we see is that there still are increases in the long term, but those increases in yield are less than what we saw in, in terms of percent increase than what we saw in the short term. 
And um, what we actually see is that for Region 3A, for example, the maximum yield is actually at a 26 inch size limit. So there's some feedback here and some equilibrating of the size structure in the stock in the long term that is different than the short term um, dynamics of the stock right now. Um, <clears throat> so what this really is saying to us, well, let's continue on and look at a couple more plots. The percent percentage of U32 landings is still could potentially be you know, above 8% in some areas, but these percentages are now lower than the short term. And that's the equilibration. And that short term is taking all those uh, small fish that have never been fished on basically, and they're starting to come into the fishery. But in the long term, that all has a chance to equilibrate. And now we're seeing some more equilibrium values. So these percentages are smaller than the short term, but there's still, um, you know, a high percentage of U32 fish in the land, commercial land. Okay, so what this is really leading to is um, there's differences in between the short term and long term. And it might be useful to look at how those differences transpire over the time in these projections. <laughs> and then um, we can go further than this, um, looking at different regimes, for example. So what this plot now is doing is for each individual year. So it's not looking at short-term, long-term, periods of 10 years, et cetera. It's just looking at each individual year and calculating in that specific year, what is the percent increase in commercial landings without a size limit? So to orient you, 0% means there's no increase in the TCY, or sorry, commercial landings. This isn't a commercial land. This one is the TCY. Sorry, my, my label was incorrect on the left-hand side. This is actually the TCY. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> so this is coast-wide TCY, and the percent increase in the coast-wide TCY when you remove the size limit. So if it's at zero, what that means is there's no increase in the coast-wide TCY. If it's below zero, that means you remove the size limit and the TCY came down in the long term or, or in, in that specific year. So the first part of this plot is looking at these first, sorry, I need to point again, is looking at these first years over here in, in this area. We see that's around, you know, eight to 10% in these first few years. Remember in the previous size limit analysis we did, that was looking at the current state, which would have been about three years ago, and what would be the benefit of removing, or what would be the, the change in removing the size limit. And we see that these simulations actually match the results of those. I think it was like 8%? 7%. Yeah, it was about 8% increase in the coast-wide TCY. So that was a really good check. And, uh, you know, the, for me is that these simulations are producing similar results that we saw in the previous size limit. What is interesting is as we go a long time, go ahead, Adam, I'll let you before I move on. Uh, okay, I, I was just going to see if Chris, if this was the point you were trying to clarify earlier that the most meaningful change in uh, removal of size limit to the TCEYs happens in the first couple of years. <clears throat> yeah, um, this is where I just want to make sure I understood it that you know you see these error bars. So when we're talking about the short term, we're talking about years four to thirteen. Yes. So, so well, that we're not looking at these. These first three are the they're not included in when we talk about short term. So the short term numbers you you would show the percent change. It's the it's the change in the median TCY over this four to thirteen. Yes, that's correct. So it's an averaging of these dots from your the fourth dot to the thirteenth dot in there. So when it's coming down, right where that blue cursor is. Okay. So when we look at the error bars, there's just there's a lot of overlap from year to year, and I just I, that's what I'm looking at and saying is there really a, a appreciable difference between um, when I looked at them using the error bars, comparing them from year to year. From sorry, from 
removing the size limit to removing the size limit it didn't now this one is this is over time without a without a size limit but looking comparing between the management procedures and i used the error bars it just seems there was that overlap as well yeah so the benefit of this plot chris and this was the point i was making thanks for bringing us back to this because i think this is really important so what you were looking at chris was completely valid but you, you were you didn't have the information that i have to be able to produce this plot so what you were looking at, Chris, was just looking at comparing the TCYs between the management procedures. And that isn't really getting at, well, what is the percent increase per simulation for that simulation and then for the second simulation and for the third simulation? What this metric here calculates is for each individual simulation, the percent increase in the yield, and then the range are those error bars. So this is taking those two management procedures, 32 and zero size limits, and combining them into one metric. What is the increase in the yield? So now we can see the actual increase, and there was very few, if any, simulations in these first few years that resulted in a decrease in the, the yield, uh, the, the de that resulted in a decline in the TCY when the size limit was removed. And so I think this is the plot that, Chris, that you will want to look at when, when trying to understand what you were looking at with, um, with the comparing the two management procedures and the ranges. Because this actually does that calculation on the percent change in you. Yeah, like I said, I'm going to have to look at this and think about it a bit. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at it. Thank you. Yeah, and I've had the benefit of looking at this plot for about a month now, and um, it, it's a really fascinating plot for a number of reasons. Um, Peggy, you have a question. Can't hear you yet, Peggy. Sorry, there we are. Um, what I'm seeing are the error bars that go down absolutely to the bottom frame of this graph. And I'm wondering, maybe it's my eyesight. Nope, they, they just touch the bottom frame. Do they go beyond that? There are a few out here that do, and they're really light lines. So what's being shown is the, the dot in each of these years is the median. The dark line is the 25th and 75th percentile. So that's sort of the central 50% of the distribution. And then the really light lines are the 5th and 95th percentile. So below the bottom of the lightest line would, would be 5% uh, of the simulation. So that would be 25 of the 500 simulations had a result less than the bottom most part of that line. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. I, I just see those error lines going way above. Yeah. And wondered if they went way below too. No, and I, that is one of the really interesting results. When you look at this over all years, there is very little chance, or less often in all of these simulations, did no size limit have a negative effect on you. And so, and that's shown by you know, less than 25% of the simulations in the long term were uh, resulted in a negative yield. But some did. Some simulations, some combinations of factors actually resulted in negative yield, whether that's low recruitment, low weighted age, high weighted age, whatever it is, would be interesting to investigate and get a better feel on. Yeah, I, I agree on that very much, Alan. And you know, most of us have been looking at reports in the Bering Sea about massive drops and not understanding why. So I was looking at that year 2065 here and just wondering what, what the bottom, oh, I see, that's shown. Okay, good. Crisis averted, thank you. <laughs> and so what what is really happening here is um, what we're seeing is we see a big positive effect in recent years because we have a very specific case of weighted age and environmental regime that we're starting with. And then as time goes on, it's becoming more integrated over all possible states of nature, all those possible states of weighted age and the environmental regime. 
And so what you can see is that there's a decline in the, in the gain in yield. In this period, it's actually pretty close to zero, which is probably a period, I think, when the environmental regime starts being more negative, more, uh, more negative than positive, because there's a cyclic nature to it. But then as we get out here, it's uh, more integrated equally over positive and negative environmental regimes and all sorts of various uh, weights at age. But what this is telling us is that these states of nature, these population effects, are affecting the potential gain in yield from um, a, a removal of a size limit. And you know, one thing that we we are thinking we might do in the future if, if we have time is to look at very specific weights at age and environmental regimes and see if we can really tease out what what this effect is. When is it beneficial to remove a size limit? When is it less beneficial, et cetera? And try to understand this a little bit more. But the key result of this plot is one, short term is different than long term. Um, as you get into equilibrium, it becomes more stable, but there's about that 1.9% increase in yield. But very often in few simulations, was there a loss in yield when removing the size limit? Thanks, Ellen. That's great. So we can look at this on terms of the TCY um, and the coastwide TCY. We can also look at it. Now, this is actual the uh, commercial landing. So you see this plot is a little different. And this is looking at just the coastwide commercial landings. And you see that the plot has a similar shape, similar results, just different magnitudes. And this is really what's driving it all. So you can look at this metric. This is a new metric in itself, percent increase in yield. Um, and is calculated over, again, is calculated using two different management procedures. So it combines it and looks at it specifically for each simulation. Now, what we also did is calculate that EVPR, that other statistic we talked about, which is a combination of two management procedures. And we calculated the EVPR uh, based on conditions. And so as a reminder, again, because this is a new statistic, and I'm still getting my head around this one. If, uh, if, the, if the price of a U32 fish is above this ratio, so uh, let's say, if the EVPR is 0.5, if the price of a U32 fish is greater than half of the price of an O32 fish, that means there's a gain in the value of the fishery. So what this is showing in that in the most recent years, that U32 fish could almost be, uh, be a very low price and there'd still be an increase in value to the fishery. And the reason for that is there's just such a huge gain in the yield, right? Fisheries getting a large gain in yield, so there must be a large gain in O32 fish with removal of that size limit. Or there's not much change in the o number of O32 fish they would catch with removal of the size limit in those most recent years. But as we progress through time, you see that this uh, it goes up close to like 80%, but then equilibrates at about that 0.5% that we saw earlier. And so, and it's mostly in between the zero and the one. Um, and again, so this is showing us that equal value price ratio is dependent on conditions in the stock, probably weighted age and environmental regime. It's dependent on incoming recruitment, all these other factors, but it's mostly uh, in between zero and one and it has a median value of 0.5. And then I just want to note that the current uh, ratio from fist sales is about 88%, and you can see um, ratios from the past years in this lengthy table. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I'm almost wondering if it just depends on how many small fish are in the ocean at a given time. You know that, and that goes with your recruitment. That when there's a lot of small fish around, for and if it's thinking the 2012 year class is going to be strong, then the next few years there's a lot of small fish, and so the yield is in is high because you're you're catching more of those fish you would you know, normally be shaking. Um, and the yield is high enough that you don't have to get much for them to have a net increase. And then in years like it was maybe two or three years ago when there really weren't very many small fish in the ocean, then you're not going to be keeping many U32 fish. And so the 
the effect on yield is a lot less. So I'm, yeah. And so, but I was just curious that I know you've broken, you've got size in the model now. Is there a way to look at something like what is the, um, the ratio of O32 to U32 in an area um, over time like this to see what the model is saying about the amount of small fish in the ocean? Yeah, we can certainly calculate those statistics. Um, um, yeah, that, that would be something totally possible to do. But I really appreciate your insight there because because I, I agree with you. As I said, I, I believe the environmental review is going more often um, at a negative phase in this time period. Sorry, I'm getting my pointer back. And in this time period, oh, where is it? In this time period here, that the environmental regime is more in a negative phase where it has a lower average recruitment um, compared to this phase where it had a higher average recruitment and is affected by that 2012 year class. So you're, uh, I think you're right. It, it's really dependent on the number of recruits, which is then linked to the environmental regime, which is um, important. So, so. Yeah, that's a but, you know, the, I, I think these looking at these types of metrics just spawned new, uh, pun intended, new metrics that we could look at, um, especially ones related to recruitment. We get close to time to a break when I start making jokes like that. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on into the summary here. And this is the end of the presentation for size limits. And then we can have a discussion until the break at 1130. Um, so what we saw was, why did I put 4.6 here and I had 3.3 earlier? I'll have to check on that. I um, apologize for that. I'm confusing myself. But um, we saw a gain in the short-term TCY and then a 1.9% gain in the long-term TCY. Um, all areas showed an increase except 2A due to the agreement, really. Um, and that more than 10% of the commercial landings in some areas in the near term could be composed of U26 fish. Um, there were long-term differences, but we saw um, gains in the recreational fishery in the short term, but noting that you might wanna look in the MSA Explorer at the long-term gains for the recreational fisheries as well. I've noted here that it's reduced those gains, they're still gains, but they are reduced in the long-term. Um, one important thing, I think, is there's a large reduction in the commercial discard mortality with removal of a size limit, as you would expect. Um, and there's possibly a reduction in the annual variability. Um, noting results change on uh, depending on the fishing intensity. And um, we saw very little long-term change to the distribution of spawning biomass or the TCUI. And we have this new metric, EVPR, which I felt was informative, showing us um, that, you know, <clears throat> the value of the fishery could be increased uh, depending on the ratio of the price of U32 to O32. And then finally, um, stock conditions seem to be affecting a lot of these results. Um, and efficiency and cost have not been considered here, but they may be useful to consider. And I think that's something where uh, certainly stakeholders can have um, uh, more insight into how efficiencies and costs might be um, useful to consider. So one last final thing before we move to discussion is um, that I have not uh, presented here the um, selectivity scenarios of targeting smaller fish or targeting larger fish. Those two scenarios are available for only a zero size limit. So you can compare MPA zero to these two selectivity scenarios and see how it changes. And I just want to note that depending how if selectivity changes, that gain in yield is also affected um, in that scenario. So a lot of considerations. Um, and I'll leave this summary slide up and uh, have it. we can go into discussion now. And I'm happy to bring up the Explorer if people want to look at very specific things. 
Thank you, Alan. I'll start with saying this summary slide is really helpful, uh, especially for the, the volume of results that are available. Uh, I see a few hands in the uh, in the chat, but before we go to that, Mark, um, sorry, Mark, Tom, marking, had a, uh, a question about interpreting some results from, I think it was paper nine. Uh, and uh, Tom, feel free to, to raise your hand or speak to this as well. But I, I think what you're asking or what you're noting is that as fishing intensity increases or it's fishing becomes more intense and SPR goes from 46 to 43, AAV gets, uh, gets larger. Even in the least intense fishing situation, SPR 46, we're still over our objective of AAV 15%. So uh, I think that's your observation that as we fish harder, variability increases. I think that's true. But your question is, is it even worth talking about this if even in the least intense situation, we're still failing to meet our AAV objective? Is, is that the, what you're trying to get to? I think it might be important to note too that the 15% is has been in the objective but it's not specifically in the objective anymore the the msab after the first yeah. round analysis we found that it was really difficult to meet that and we thought it would be better to analyze these results uh just looking at the values between the management procedures rather than a specific threshold of 15 percent i think it's I agree and that's that. yeah um, but it and, and then i i do want to caution one thing I've been looking at is, is 500 simulations and stuff. And what I've found is that 500 simulation still has some simulation error in it. What I'm going to do after this meeting is increase the number of simulations to 1,000, which would have a better characterization of the meet, but that could change, you know, the 18.6% to 16.6% even. There could be that much error in calculating the median. The, um, <clears throat> it doesn't concern me about analyzing these management procedures because each management procedure is run with the exact same set of simulations. So they are mm -hmm. comparable to each other. It's just that specific 72.35 million pounds of TCY might not be exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's fair. And and noting that we had um, looked at the objective a slightly different way is also a good reminder of that. And we had also hardwired in some of these objectives into the um, in, as the constraint mechanism, given how hard it was to achieve that piece. Uh, so I'm not looking to cast judgment, good or bad, uh, on on that interpretation. I wanted to make sure though that Tom's question is uh, is clear. Like, is is that what you're asking, Tom? Is is it? The variability is high and it's high always and that's a concern for you or or not oh, so maybe tom will give you a minute to get your hand up uh if there is additional points you want to speak to in the interim i see uh, dan forrest joe and chris have all raised their hands so we'll, we'll start with you there dan yeah thanks i was just going to ask before we break if you could characterize um what you're looking for from the MSAB in the discussion stage. And I think Alan's summary slide is excellent. I mean, he kind of summarizes what the modeling results are. I and mean, I think we could comment a little bit on the AAV and maybe the need for a smoother. And maybe there's some comments you can make on, you know, different metrics that might be nice to see or something on the economic analysis. But I mean, what is the, what are the commissioners looking to this group for? Do they want like a hard yes or hard no? Are they looking for next steps in this analysis? Can, can someone just kind of help guide us? So I can offer some thoughts, but I don't profess to have the answer. Uh, I think our objective is to provide some color commentary to the analysis to help commissioners interpret the results. The commissioners have uh, an immense amount of work, number of decisions to make on their plate, and this is just another item on the pile. So we ought to put together in a report uh, what we can to convey this concisely. I agree that Alan's summary slide here is uh, is a really good start. Um, we in the report may want to provide uh, a bit more commentary to expand on it, but ultimately we're going to have to be, you know, I think a slide or two in terms of communicating outcomes to the, the commissioners. 
at least that's my, my personal perspective about you know, how much airtime and attention we're, we're able to get given the competing demands for their time. I don't know, if Pete, if you've got any other thoughts on that, but I'd be more than happy to hear from others in the group too about what you feel is most important to convey. I, I don't, but just to agree that, uh, yeah, summarizing this in a concise way for the commissioners is certainly a, an important goal we should have. If I might offer a little bit of insight, potentially. Yeah, go for it. I, I think that um, given the mandate of the MSAB to um, guide the MSE process, I think one um, important thing the MSAB can do to guide the process is to identify what uh, metrics are useful and important and what sort of analyses might assist the commission in making a decision. Um, and so I've tried to summarize on this slide many of the different outcomes and uh, the MSAP can you know, help identify if efficiencies and costs are something useful to consider, for example. But also the, the other metrics presented here you know, uh, Chris asked a question early on that was then, I think, portrayed in that time series plot of the percent increase in yield. Those are the types of metrics, I think, that are insightful to aid the evaluation. Um, and perhaps the MSAP has a comment on that. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, two things. Uh, First is I know we're, we're very close to time. And so there's a number of folks that are going to have to step off in a moment. Um, so we're likely to need to continue this conversation uh, after, after the lunch break. Um, the second item is during that lunch break, it would be helpful if folks could start to think about how best to communicate the results, both through the report and subsequent presentations at the interim and annual meetings. Uh, in, in a way that's going to resonate most with your constituents, uh, with uh, with commissioners. So as you're going through the MSE Explorer tool, if you find plots or particular analyses that you think really resonate with you, to be prepared to bring those forward into the afternoon's discussion. Um, so I, I think we've only got a couple minutes left. Maybe we'll try Forest, um, and then we may need to come back to Joe and Chris afterwards. Thanks, Adam. Um, if I can go. Uh, so I'm still trying to uh, understand these long term uh, yield gains, etc. And uh, Dan's question about <clears throat> recency in uh, recruitment and how that might or might not affect, um, you know, what we're seeing in front of us. I, I'm just wondering how the model interprets recency if it weights it. And also, uh, you showed us the last few meetings, interim and annual, that there's been an increase in length of age and wondering how the, the model's um, incorporating that uh, into, into what we're looking at. Sure, thanks, Forrest. The, um, the operating model is conditioned up to 2021, observations to 2021, and also um, different parameters from the stock assessment, such as the estimate of recruitment in recent years, and all years, actually, as well as the variability uncertainty in those estimates, um, such as recruitment. Um, it's also using weighted age up until that, during that conditioning process, the observed weighted age. And then in the future, it is projecting weighted age uh, based on a random process that uses correlation. So, and then it's also projecting recruitment as a random process based on the environmental regime. And so what's happening in that short term period is the short term is greatly affected by where the model starts. In, in, in other words, the, the things that you were describing, what we've seen recently, a low weighted age, but sign of increasing weighted age and a big uh, potential recruitment in 2012 with some uncertainty around it. So the, the operating model begins <clears throat> with those observations still in the, um, the population structure and so we have a large number of the 2012 year class in the first, you know, 10, 12 years of the um, simulations. And we also have an increasing weighted age because it's, it's uh, correlated with the observ recent observations. So it's at low value. So all it can really do is increase or stay about the same. 
So it's very dependent. The short term is very dependent on current conditions. The long term, on the other hand, is not dependent on current conditions. It sort of goes through the process and comes to an equilibrium, integrating over all these uncertainties and uh, different processes to come at sort of an equilibrium uh, state but showing the range of possible states in, in that equilibrium as well. But to caveat that, it's not meant as a uh, short-term projection tool. It's, it's built more as a tool to evaluate you know, the, the changes um, long-term, the, the comparison long-term and the equilibrium of this and to characterize that uncertainty. So it's really trying to characterize uncertainty in the future, whereas the stock assessment is built as a tool to project over the next, say, three years. This is built as a tool to project over a longer-term time period. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate it. Okay, okay. It's 1130 now. Yeah, yeah, I think um, maybe we should uh, take a pause now, let folks go away to use the Explorer, have some patience if it uh, if it's a little clunky as we start going into it, as it may be a bit overloaded, I think, with everybody starting to, starting to use it. Um, and then make sure you get a, a chance to get something to eat, refresh yourself and get back here in an hour and a half. Yeah, that sounds great. And I think we'll have a little bit of time to finish up this discussion and then move on to the multi-year. Excellent. Yeah, thanks uh, Joe and Chris for your patience. All right, All we'll right. see everybody at one o'clock. We'll see everybody soon. Thanks a lot, folks.
Welcome back, everybody. If you had a chance to get something to eat, we'll give folks a minute or two to get settled and get back to it. Hi, everyone. The Secretariat's back. Ian had to step out for a short meeting, so no hard questions. Just checking to see if Joe and Chris are back. If memory serves, we, um, we had concluded an hour and a half ago with their hands still up to follow up on um, the uh, previous results interpretation. Joe, were you here? I'm here. You guys can hear me? Yep, there you are, yeah. All right, are we ready? I think so, Pete, are you all set? Are we okay to go? Great, okay, yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, okay, so I just had a, a few comments um, based on the presentation that we just had before we broke for lunch. And I would like to thank IPHC staff because this is precisely the type of analysis as a manager of the fishery that I'm looking for in order to help me inform decisions. So I'd like to thank you guys. It was really well put together, um, especially as it pertains to the size limits um, as well as the associated economic analysis um, and what it would take to make those uh, worthwhile. Um, I think for me, um, taking an objective look and stepping back, I think it, it's really helped to sell me that in some instances, um, modifying the commercial minimum size limit does make a lot of sense in order to provide um, for directed fisheries. I think it's really important to note that a lot of the benefits that we're seeing, as was detailed in this presentation, is we're shifting some of this regulatory, or regulatory discarded fish um, from an associated mortality from being regulatory discarded um, into the commercial fisheries. And that's where that economic gain comes from. So I think in the situation where a fishery is already managed under like a individual vessel quota, um, it's a relatively easy transition um, for management of the fisheries. Um, in the cases that I see where this uh, might not fit, and this wasn't exactly captured because this is more of a management consideration rather than um, analysis, would be, for instance, like in area 2A, where we still have derby style fisheries left, we use um, management of these fisheries are often like with um, lengths of time for the fishery. Um, and those lengths of time were also based off of that 32 inch size limit. Um, so I think I'd just like to caution um, IPHC commissioners and MSAB that the moving forward with a one size fits all approach with the size limit might not fit for some catch areas. And I think for area 2A specifically, like it would be, I think, low risk to keep that area the same as it's been, um, being that potentially it would have a set harvest limit floor, um, while the other areas might be able to, if desired by the commissioners, move in a separate direction. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little hesitant at least for my catch area to move away from a 32 inch size limit, just because it's gonna, I see it as incredibly increasing the management of certainty, specifically within my fisheries. Um, as you guys are all aware, like the tribal fisheries in general, um, we do a really good job trying to manage our fisheries down in area 2A. This year we're within 1% of the tribal fishery allocation. Um, I don't want to um, change that size limit and then have no, I guess, basis for how I'm going to set my fishery durations um, for my commercial fishermen. 
Um, I think the potential to fall under or over the allocation is really risky in our catch area. Um, with the caveat, you know, fisheries that are already um, in IVQs, um, IVQs, that kind of stuff, um, aren't going to have those considerations we have down here. But anyway, so those are my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Joe, for bringing that up. That was uh, its not a consideration that had, had come to mind for me when talking about size limits. So it's, I really appreciate you noting it. Make sure I heard it correctly. The the concern is, you know, well, first, the acknowledgement is that the, the analysis is very detailed and very helpful, uh, you know, as a fishery manager to, to help undertake some, um, some assessment. But a potential consequence of removing the size limit in the derby fishery is it's going to potentially undercut your ability to set uh, uh, the, the fishery windows. We just, you don't have a baseline to, to work off of to understand how long the fishery should be open for, correct? Yeah, that's a, that's a good characterization of it. Thank you. Mm. And then so a proposal is, is it, is it feasible to have a size limit in some regulatory areas and not others? Correct? Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And I think we've heard in the past um, that the commissioners do have the flexibility to pick or choose areas. Um, but I'll leave that to IPHC staff to confirm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I, I won't wade into um, you know, potential enforcement implications and, and uh, you know, catch tracking from a from an enforcement perspective. But maybe a question for the secretariat is, is Alan, how does how might this affect the analysis if there was an implementation of size limits uh, in a, uh, what's the word, like a heterogeneous implementation of size limits across regulatory areas? Yeah, I, I mean, as Joe noted, this is a single analysis, all areas uh, changing a size limit synchronously um, and um, not looking at individual regulatory areas. It would be possible to look at individual regulatory areas, um, size limits for each one. Um, and I do note that the SRB did make a note of a number of SRB meetings ago that um, perhaps size limit could be changed in one area as an experiment, mainly to determine what uh, markets might exist for U32 fish. But given that and answering your question, um, it's hard to say exactly what the feedback would be if just certain areas had changed the size limit and others did not. Um, I, I think it's hard to generalize to that detail from these results. But um, and it depends on which area. Yeah, so it, it would depend on which areas had the size limit changed. Um, you know, there's more, there's areas with bigger effects than other areas, I imagine. So, sorry, I can't get any more detail than that. Um, I don't want to speculate. Yeah, no, no problem. It's a, a new, uh, a new, new wrinkle. What about thoughts from, from others around the table on this? Have, have others thought about uh, uh, varied implementation of size limits? Maybe we can let folks mull that over and then go to uh, Chris Spore, who I think also had his hand up at the end of the uh, uh, end of the morning session. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. I seem to be having some trouble there. Um, Anyway, uh, what I wanted to ask about was just on the slum summaries, two, two questions. The first one was the summary slide, slide 33. First bullet talks about a 4.6% gain, approximately 2.8 million pounds in the short term. 
Now, looking at slide six and slide seven, if I'm reading this right, the 4.6 gain percent gain is when it's a SPR 40. Yeah, I, I think the S, the the 4.6 is incorrect there. Maybe, oh, okay. I couldn't figure out where I got that number, so maybe I did look at it incorrectly. But at 3.3 is the correct value. Oh yeah, okay, 3.3, 1.9. Okay, I just want to make sure I didn't. I I, I understood. Yeah, okay, that's that's from slide seven. That's the slide six is the 3.3, slide seven is the 4.6. Okay, other other point I just wanted to make, and I wanted to to clarify this. Dan Falvey made the point earlier that. For this uh, run of management procedures, we removed the uh, the coastwide constraint. You know, for the fifteen uh, percent. Right. Um, I, I just think I, I can't remember when we discussed it or the decision to do it, but I just think in the meeting notes we need to, you know, MSAB recalled and explain it just so it's really clear to everybody um, what was done and why, because it, it is a change from our last uh, when we did some uh, reported on some MP evaluations. Yeah, I would agree, Chris. I, that is something the commission, um, when they asked for the specifics, they did not request a uh, constraint in these uh, any of these management procedures. Okay, so they just wanted to see it. Yeah, I just think as long as we recall that, because it it does. Uh, if somebody's trying to think about it compared to our last round, need to make sure that I had I had kind of kind of forgotten about that and hadn't thought about it. So I, I think it was good that Dan brought it up. Okay, thank you. I see Dan's hand and then Chuck. Yeah, no, I agree with what Chris said. I'd like to highlight that these don't include the 15% constraint and that, you know, in um, past iterations of the model, exploring scale and distribution, we found that including the 15% was necessary to get um, variability down below into acceptable levels, I would guess. I mean, we used to have that as the benchmark and then I think we kind of decided to take it away because lower is better rather than you know, a knife edge. 14.9 is okay and 15.1 is not. Um, but still, the, it should be noted that, you know, um, in the past we needed the 15% or some kind of a coast-wide constraint to bring down variability to more acceptable levels. Um, but then I was poking around with, uh, um, with the Explorer over lunch. I wanted Alan to bring up a scenario for me. And I think it ties into what Chris was just talking about, about how much of an increase there is. I'm getting there, sorry. Yeah, no thanks for doing it. See if I can increase the screen size a little bit. All right. So just uh, looking at what you got to, uh, I would just go with no decision variability just to keep it clean. And get rid of option one, yeah. And then simulation error is fine, MPA, the two size limits are perfect. And then if you scroll down to the uh, short term time period, Um, you can just do regions, just load up all the regions so we don't get bogged down in too many areas. And then if you would go down to the metrics to the fishery sustainability ones. Uh, uh, you got the three check there I was looking at. It's mostly the median average commercial landings and the U32 and the O32 are the ones that I was noticing. So if you put it into table format. What I found is, um, that I found interesting, is when you look at the median average commercial landings line, which is, I'll ask Alan to highlight, it's near the top, you see that um, if you take away the size limit, it looks like it goes from 39.8 up to 42.2. So that's a little under a two and a half million pound increase in the commercial landings, um, which is kind of, you know, I'm not sure what percentage that would be, but I think that's an interesting percent to try and pull out. Um, and then what I really found interesting is if you look down 
towards the bottom where it says the median average commercial landings over 032. You see that even though overall landings go up, you're actually decreasing the amount of big fish that will hit the market by just under 2 million pounds. Um, and so I, th I think that that's the, the new statistic that jumped out at me is you're probably going to decrease the amount of O32 on the market by 4% and you're going to increase the amount of fish on the market by some percentage. Um, but, but removing a size limit doesn't re removes will result in less O32 fish on the market than maintaining a size limit. So it displaces some of those O32 fish. That's exactly right, Dan. Um, we were looking at that over the break as well, and we noticed that. Um, and if you would like, I can show you a plot that I created that shows it in even a little bit more detail. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that'd be great to see. Okay, let me uh, share that screen. Okay, um, so, so, so first, Dan, thanks for bringing that up. I think that's a really good point um, that you made. And when you look at the um, what, what you just looked at in the MSC Explorer is really the salient point of all of this, is that as you, you get a gain in yield, but you replace some of the O32 with U32 fish. And I wanted to bring up the previous analysis because the same result was found in that analysis. And what, it, just to show you really quick, this is figure four from that um, document, AM 09709. And you can see on the very far left, can't see my cursor. Um, anyways, we can a little bit. Okay, over here on the left, is the, um, the the current sort of status quo minimum size limit of 32 inches. And then when you look in the middle at the no size limit, the green and the blue, you can see that there is, um, it's the one with the U32 and O32 on it. That is the, um, the split between U32 and O32 from that previous size limit analysis. And so you can see the connection of the green and the blue line is below that blue top of the blue bar on the left. So even though there's an increase in yield of about 7%, that O32s are being replaced by U32. So similar result there, the plot that we created over the break is another one of these time series plots. Let me just maximize the screen show this a little better there we go and i think i can marker so on this axis over here is the percentage of the increase in the commercial landings that's due to u32 um, fish so this is in commercial landings again and so the horizontal line is 100 percent and if, if the if, um, simulation resulted in 100%, that means the entire increase in yield was due to U32 fish, thus O32 would remain the same with and without a size limit. <clears throat> and what I've done here is calculated it by simulation um, for each individual simulation and then plotted that variability. But what you can see overall is most of the medians from all those is slightly above that um, line of 100%. And so when it's above the line of 100%, that means that O32 goes down, U32 goes up, and there's generally an overall increase in the yield. So um, just a different way to look at what Dan had pointed out, except um, Dan had asked for short-term and long-term. And you can see in the short-term, it's quite a big uh, replacement of that U32 
compared to in the long term, it's a little less um, percentage that the U-32 is replacing the O-32 um, landings in the commercial industry. Thanks for that, Alan. That's really helpful. It'd be great if our minutes could somehow just capture that concept and that, you know, we're seeing again that while the overall yield does increase, there are times when the it will result in a uh, significant decrease in the O32 available to the market. Or let the wordsmiths have at it. But I think that's an interesting finding. And that the re and I guess my question, and I don't have the answer in front of me right now, but is that replacement consistent across areas, or would some areas essentially? Um, have more replacement than other areas? And then what does a equivalent value calculation look like on an area specific basis? Yeah, we can look at that and explore the way that you looked at it, um, but I didn't calculate it here specifically by area, but that, that's a good good point, something that we can consider. I was gonna ask the same point about looking at it at an area level, because Alan, I, I presume this is this result is being driven by uh, the stock size composition or length of age, um, not by a shift in the selectivity curve. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is dependent on the stock conditions, the, the variability at least in this. Very interesting. Okay, great. Uh, let's go to Chuck. And then, Alan, I think you said you had another follow up from a migration question um yesterday yes that's correct right okay well let's go to chuck and then we can go back to that migration piece please yes thanks um mine is likely a lot simpler question or i guess something i would wouldn't mind an answer for and it's on the fourth bullet in the summary of size limits uh and regarding recreational gain and mortality mortality limit also reduced long term in in our case, in 2B, Canada, we're directly tied in with a, rec a recreational commercial quota arrangement as a percentage. And I, obviously, we would follow the commercial as the commercial had a decrease in, in, in landings. We would as well um, over long term. I understand that. But have you, in your calculations, taken that into context on a regulatory basis because it is going to be dependent on the, the different um, management regimes that go on throughout the uh, the coast and uh, I'm just curious if that is if this is just a blanket look at it without in taking into context anything on management regimes or would some of would we be less affected in say Canada because of our management regime on this this uh, this reduction or is and follow with the commercial or is this have you even worked into that on an area basis it's just so that i can communicate this with our our constituency yeah thanks chuck for that question can you go to slide 33 great um it's the summary size limits yeah perfect um first of all um i realized this bullet, the recreational gain and mortality limit also reduced in long term, is very poorly worded. And what I think is actually happening there, there's still a, a gain in the um, recreational limit with removal of the size limit, but it's not as large of a gain as we saw in the short term. So with that being said, um, uh, we can easily look at the, um, the area specific recreational limits, and I'm just going to back up to a slide. We had this slide where we looked at it in the short term, the gain in the in the limits, and what you see is in 2B, it is a small amount of gain, um, but 3.2 percent when you when you calculate the actual percentage of it. Um, and I didn't present it in the long term; that would just be available in the MSE Explorer. We could easily look at that um, and what that looks like. But if the gain is reduced in the long term, then it would be probably a smaller percentage gain um, for the area 2B recreational fishery. Um, with that being said, you also talked about management regime. We've tried to simulate that connection between commercial and recreational fisheries for each individual regulatory area as closely as possible. 
depending on their in Alaska, they're called cash sharing plans, um, and I'm, I can't remember what they're called in Canada at this point. But um, we've tried to mimic that process uh, as closely as possible, which which made me realize that potentially that's why the recreational fishery is getting a gain in the yield, because the commercial fishery is also getting a gain in yield. And many of these um, catch sharing plans, so I'll call them, um, do link recreational limits to the commercial limits. So maybe there's that feedback there, and that's all based on the, the, the um, current management um, paradigm. Thanks very Thank much. Alan, did you want to go through the uh, migration slide now? Sure, I can do that. Let me share my screen again. Sorry about all the jumping back and forth here. Really, thanks to Ed for being so patient with me. Jumping back. <clears throat> okay, so um, just real quickly, yesterday there was a question um, about the change in the migration rates between the uh, past OM and this new OM or operating model. And so all that I've done here, it's, it's a little bit small looking up on the screen there, but just showing some of the plots from uh, MSAB 16 and the old operating model on the left compared to the new OM, which we presented yesterday at this MSAB meeting. And looking at, there's so, it's probably important to highlight there are a number of differences. Um, in the previous OM, we did calculate migration rates by environmental regime or high and low PDO. But what is new in the new OM is we also linked um, the distribution of recruits or age zero fish, how they're distributed among regions to the PDO as well, um, high and low PDO. So that's a new thing in the OM. So there's a little bit of difference there. And I think that uh, helped improve the fits to, to a lot of these things. But comparing the migration rates Remember the old OM was just a single model, which would be most similar to what's called the MED AAF, which are the red dots on the right. So the left is most comparable to the red dots on the right. And when you look at those on a, on a high level, 32,000 foot view, they don't look too different. They, they look like they're showing similar patterns. Um, but the real difference now is we have multiple individual models in the OM on the, the left. And what that shows, to me anyways, is that it, it incorporates a lot more structural uncertainty, which is capturing some of the scenarios we've talked about at previous MSAT meetings. Um, another substantial difference between the old OM and the new OM is if you look on the upper left, the two to three plot under old OM, um, you'll see there's the blue and the red lines. Um, those blue and the red lines are no longer in the new OM, but it is fixed onto the black line. Um, so there's no movement. Uh, there's very little movement from two back to three. And it seems like adding in a few other features and uh, fixes helped uh, maintain similar migration rates. But uh, Chris noted yesterday that there are some operating models here, like the blue, uh, on the new OM that are quite high movement rates from three to two up to almost 0.6. Uh, and that was certainly a case I noticed when conditioning these models. Any uh, questions on that? I had a question, Alan, actually on the uh, confirming that 4B to three from the old OM, that's been integrated into the four to three as well, correct? No, um, 4B to 3 is still there. I just haven't plotted all the different options. So there is possibility of movement from okay. every one region to any other region. Um, and I just haven't shown all those possible options. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So 4B to 3 remains exactly the same, which is a very, very low rate.
go ahead, Peggy. Maybe you have Peggy go for last question, and then I think you know, time we should probably move on to the uh, the next set of analyses, Ellen. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, on, uh, just a quick question about the uh, Y values. Um, I'm looking at four to three, just randomly, four to three low PDO in the middle of the page. And it says movement probability is 0 0.0 to 0 0.6. Is that, um, is are those numbers representing percentages over one year or over the lifetime of the fish or how? That is the proportion of fish that would move from four to three. Gotcha. Year for that single age group. Thank you. That, of course, that makes sense now that you say it. <laughs> Thanks. I think I'm caught up on my homework that's been assigned to me. Excellent work. <clears throat> so would you like to move on then to the multi-year assessments or is there any more discussion on size numbers? I had suggested a moment ago we move on, but I realized I didn't really have a chance for folks to report back on any of their homework from lunch. Uh, and I see this has triggered a few hands from uh, Dan and Forrest. I was just going to ask you, the co-chairs, to before we move on, would you mind summarizing what you think is going to go into the minutes on size limits, um, just so that uh, we've had a couple of points raised, but I'm not quite sure exactly what's going to be reported out of our discussion. So um, maybe if you would just flag that before we move on and I'll let other people put their observations in. Sounds good. Yeah, let's, let's go to Forrest's question and then we can uh, go through a bit of a summary. Am I live? Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I kind of asked in the um, chat box, but um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to compare, uh, I'm trying to look at what happens to recreational fisheries uh, with the change in size limits. I, it seems like there'd be a selective a selectivity change and a lot of the, the fish, at least in uh, 3A and 2C or are, are, could actually do by statistics fall below um, a U32. And so I'm just wondering if, if the, there's more emphasis from other fleets on it, what that would do, but I can't, I, I can't select MPA zero or MPA 32 on the Explorer tool, but it just, I'm not getting those options. And so I'm not able to look and see what that does. And I, I don't know if you could even speak to that. You probably haven't looked that granular at recreational uh, effects. So, um, Forrest, sorry, I think I missed exactly the start of that. You, you wanted to see uh, effects of changes in selectivity, was that? Well, I, so I just I was just curious as, at what what the model would. I don't know if, if it's it'll produce this answer, but I wanted to see what the recreational effects on recreation would be if you went from thirty two to zero to you know all sizes are thirty two to uh, U twenty six or O twenty six. You know, drop the size limit down, but I, I'm not even able to pull up MPA zero or MPA thirty two in the Explorer tool. It's that not coming down to options in the MPs, but um, maybe I don't have the right thing selected. Hmm. Yeah, because you can select the different MPs and then are you looking at recreational, you're looking for metrics on recreational? And right. And were you looking for metrics split recreational by U26 and O, or sorry, U32 and O32 or just total overall limit? I'd like to see like recreational FCY basically. And and I uh, actually meant to ask you to clarify how, what your definition is of recreational here now. Is it just uh, guided or is it all recreational? And what did we do with subsistence? Like how, how are all those things interrelated in, in our definitions now? 
Yeah, sure. Good question. One, um, we have not separated out guided and unguided in any um, reporting of the metrics. Within areas 2C and 3A, we try to account for those as best as we can, but um, that's difficult to project or even estimate or simulate unguided fishery um, recreational catch or mortality. So um, we've done, we worked on that a number of years ago and figured out some methods that are, have some random process to them and simulate uh, un, unguided fisheries. But when we combine it all into recreational, it's all, um, it's all combined and we don't report it separately. Um, and, um, and then with subsistence, uh, the MSAB, many meetings ago, we talked about should subsistence be separate or included in recreational. And we decided for 2B, 2C, and 3A, subsistence is separate uh, from recreational. It's modeled separate. And, uh, and uh, what's called recreational limit is actual recreational, all recreational uh, mortality including um, guided or unguided or, or however it may be split up in, in each regulatory area. And that's why in many of the tables, I've only presented 2B, 3, 2B, 2C, and 3A because that's the only pure recreational. Others either have small amounts of recreational subsistence or um, are combined recreational subsistence. Okay, I appreciate that. And I, and I don't want to drag this for everybody else, but I've got selected um, MPA in the MPs and then size limit 0, 26, and 32 in, in the size limit. But in the table, I'm only getting one row of information in the size limit is 0. So I, I guess I'm. you don't select the MPs. You don't have MPA 0, MPA uh, 26, MPA 32, right? You just have M MPA for an annual assessment. And then the size limits is how you, you sh I should be getting yeah. three rows, columns of information, right? If I had 0, 26, and 32 selected. Yeah. What SPRs do you have selected? Uh, 40, just 43. Okay. And then what decision variability? Uh, I just put none. For, or no, I did option one select small, actually. But Okay. And, and that's why the option one select small of there's only one run available, and that's for only with a size limit of zero. Okay. Um, yeah, we don't have that run available for 26 and 32. And the reason is we just wanted to see what the effect of changes in selectivity to smaller fish would be if a size limit was implemented and they changed their targeting behavior, um, their, their fishing behavior. Um, and that, that was all that was asked for from the SRB. And we thought about, well, would it be useful to do a run with a 32 inch size limit and a change in selectivity that that's sort of a scenario that might not be as realistic as changing the size limit and then there's a resulting change in selected and the selectivity. i got you thanks for clarifying that um yeah it, it, it's a good point if you ever come across you're not getting all the things that you think you should be getting like all the size limits they aren't always available for all combinations. So for example, there's only some runs, I think in option two, no estimation error, there's only runs for a 40% SPR, um, not 43. So if you're not getting something, try just looking at the other options. Uh, and uh, I wanted to put in these tables of what combinations are available. I just didn't get to fixing those tables up, so I had to do it. Gotcha, all right, appreciate it. Okay, so how about I provide uh, at least my perspective on a summary for the for the report uh, to kick off the the conversation, then turn back to everyone else to see if there are other pieces that are that are missing, then we can go into the multi-year assessment evaluation piece. So as I said before, I think the summary slide that we see on the screen right now, slide 33, is a great starting point to. Um, uh, to include in a report for what different size limits actually mean. Uh, notwithstanding needing to tweak a couple of the numbers as per the point Chris raised a moment ago, I think this provides a really good uh, summary of, of performance. 
I also think it would be helpful to maybe preface this paragraph with an overarching statement or two about the fact that the size limits still meet our uh, biological objectives. Personally, I think it's important and always helpful to say this is how the MPs perform relative to all of our objectives. First meeting conservation, biological objectives, and then the fishery objectives. Uh, I think that's the first takeaway for performance. The second item is we did raise a, a number of points throughout the conversation this morning, and particularly after lunch here, around um, uh, needing to know that the size limit is considering, or acknowledging the size limit is considering O32 stock distribution, and that there, you know, further analysis may be required to understand how these results change if, if we were not using O32 stock distribution as the basis. Uh, we had some discussion related to that around what proportion of the um, TCEY is O32 versus U32, uh, particularly the point that you raised a moment ago, Dan, uh, noting that although coastwide TCEY increased from 39 to 42-ish million pounds, O32 mortality actually decreased. Um, I think the next point from there then would be probably to add the points that Joe raised about um, it maybe not being a one size fits all for all regulatory areas that the size limits, any potential modifications to size limits need to take into account uh, the, the unique management regimes that different regulatory areas have in place. Um, I think those are the big points specifically for size limits. Other conversation pieces that we should include in the report would be noting that these MPs do not include the constraint, and that obviously has uh, a big influence on catch variability, on the catch, uh, catch variability performance metrics. And that we, uh, oh, and sorry, the one other item was that we also had a conversation around potentially or needing to reconsider the biological sustainability objectives around regional stock distribution. Sorry, that's a bit different than size limits, but that was another piece in our notes that uh, I forgot to raise. So this is specifically acknowledging that we, you know, we have not ever been able to reach the uh, for Bravo uh, stock distribution uh, biological objective. And we should probably circle back to uh, figuring out either a, a new reporting metric or refining what the, the performance metric is for that objective. So that's my take on key points for the report for this section. Maybe I'll, I'll look to you first, Dan, to see if there's anything else that you felt was uh, was overlooked in that summary. Anything I thought that was a great said? summary. <laughs> um, okay. It's the, the only two things, and I have a whole page of scribbled stuff, and the only two that you didn't hit were um, potentially looking at the equivalent valuation on an area-specific basis as the... Uh, the trade of increased yield versus decreased O32 may not be similar in each area. Um, and then, you know, whether we want to go ahead and, and go so far as to recommend additional runs incorporating a uh, coastwide smoother or whether we just note that it's missing, I'll leave that up to you guys. And then the last one is that I think there was an observation that the, the benefits of Reduced size limits likely um, are linked to the number of small fish in the ocean and recruitment events. That in the years with high high abundance of small fish, the benefits may be larger than in years where the um, there are fewer young recruits in the ocean or something like that. Yeah, that's a good Alan way to think that it. stands. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it down. I like that, uh, noting at least from the current assessment that the benefits of no size limit or reduced size limits are largely linked to the, the stock composition. Uh, in, in terms of your, your other point of do we identify additional runs or additional analysis, that was something that's been mulling in the back of my mind as well. I wasn't personally planning on raising my thoughts until afterwards, but one of the papers did note there are additional, uh, there's additional work 
going on all the time and that there may be new results that are delivered between now and the annual meeting. The reason I was holding off on it was, uh, I know we've talked about this a number of times in the past, about how do we find this balance between making sure uh, as much work as possible is produced from the secretariat, but also still ensuring that you know we, we can provide some some comment on it, and we're not trying to scramble something together at the annual meeting in terms of you know an MSAB perspective. I profess I don't have the answer for that yet, um, and so I think it, it'd be a good conversation item for maybe later today about uh, how or if we add new runs and when MSAB would have an opportunity to review those to share advice with the broader process. Oh, sorry, I realized my camera was off here too. Um, anybody else for, for summary points? Maybe last call and then we should we should move to the, the next about uh, uh, the next set of results. Adam, I had one thing I had in my notes here. I see Anne Marie also has something in the chat. So I'll let her go. That's been in the chat for a little bit. Oops, sorry. Um, it's actually not about the chat, uh, but more about a discussion that I think we had when we were talking about slide 30, which was about the percent difference in TPUI without a slide on it. And um, Alan had mentioned that there was some additional work that they may want to do, particularly around environmental regime, and that that may be part of the reason why it's sort of driving things down to that low that we're seeing in that sort of 2040. And I just wanted to raise that as something that we may want to make a note of or maybe make a recommendation because uh, given all of the things that we've been seeing with changes in climate and, and different historical environmental regimes that we've seen with the relationships that have been breaking down, that I think that sort of work might be important and of benefit to look into. I agree with you, Anne-Marie, and I think that builds upon what Dan was saying about the small fish linking uh, its size limit benefits linked to small fish. I think it can be expanded into the environmental regime and weighted age, which the numbers of small fish is a part. Um, Alan, you said you had another point to add as well. Yeah, yeah. It, th there was considerable discussion about um, well, there was some discussion about the usefulness of additional metrics other than the primary um, objectives, as well as this EVPR uh, metric. I don't know if the MSAB would like to comment on the usefulness of additional metrics. I know it's been mentioned, you know, the uh, proportion of commercial landings that's O32 versus U32 and things like that. But were there any other metrics um, that would be useful to comment on? guiding the commission on making a decision. And I think Joe Peterson mentioned um, discard mortality as well. well there's one that I've always been looking for is I know we have a relative percent of spawning biomass. So if we're looking at size limits, it'd be interesting to look at a relative percent of O32 and a relative percent of U32 in each regulatory area as kind of a metric to track. From the entire population? Yeah. I don't know that I'd be able to calculate that during this meeting, but I could certainly in the um, per report to the IM and AM. I think, I think it's just like one of those additional metrics and that get pulled out of future programs or work or you know that could be useful for a variety of tasks. I know you added the discard metrics. I think those are useful. There was some discussion of whether we should add additional economic metrics such as the value of the fishery and that type of thing. And I think those would take a bit of work to smooth out um, so that, you know, they would be more informative than controversial. <laughs> so I think I've put a pin in the economic metrics just yet, although I do think the equivalent valuation is an interesting way of um, moving off of the, the need to really understand what the exact X vessel price is. Because especially on this one, we've heard several times that, you know, the survey selling small fish is informative, but there's a big difference when you're selling 100,000 pounds versus trying to move 
2 million pounds of small fish on the market and the 12% yeah. discount the surveys experience may not be anything like the discount you would see in the commercial world when you're moving millions of pounds of small fish. Um, and so I, you know, your equivalent valuation was an interesting way of kind of moving off of that about what the real number is and you know, what would it need to be to make a break even. So I did find that interesting. Um, but again, by area, because I do think there are some probably differential impacts based on the size composition in each area. Other than that, great job summarizing it. <clears throat> Hey, I'm not seeing any other uh, hands, so I think we should go to um, go to the next item. But maybe note that uh, there's there's more discussion to come potentially on performance metrics following uh, following this section. Hey, excellent! I think the timing is working really well today. Um, we'll take a break in this next run. I won't um, keep people for two and a half hours, but um, We'll have a short break um, when it's convenient, if that's okay. Yeah, Alan, I'll leave it to you to uh, give you know the deck when is the the best time to take a break. And noting we uh, we're hoping to wrap the presentation by sixteen thirty Pacific time and then um, get into report writing. Sounds good. Should be able to do that. Um, I don't know that th there'll still be discussion around this stuff. So, okay, so we're going to move on to multi-year stock assessment. And um, we're gonna keep this completely independent of size limits. So all analyses now for the rest of the afternoon will all pertain to a 32 inch size limit. So all these multi-year assessments will have, uh, or multi-year management procedures will have a 32 inch size limit. So uh, the other MP task in the program of work to is evaluate multi-year assessments where that simply means not conducting an assessment every year, but still setting a TCY every year. And the commission um, provided direction of uh, evaluating biennial stock assessments and possibly triennial if time allows. And um, noting that the FIS remains an annual survey. And they supplied two options uh, of how the TCY may be adjusted in years without an assessment. So for those non-assessment years, one was it remains the same as defined in the previous year. So each regulatory area has the exact same TCY as the previous year. Um, and uh, the second option was to have some changes based on a simple empirical rule to be developed by the secretariat that incorporates FIS data. So we spent a little bit of time on that. <clears throat> And working with the SRB, the SRB actually had a request um, to evaluate triennial um, assessments as, or triennial assessment as well. So having an assessment and then two years without an assessment um, and then an assessment again. So a three-year period between assessments. Um, and, um, and so again, here's that table of sort of the defaults. It's just looking at a single size, 32-inch size limit and then only across the assessment frequency with an SPR of 43%. So this is what we're calling sort of our core base, and this is what comes up by default in the MSE um, Explorer. So I think it was noted earlier what the little b means in the top sort of MP description. So we have MPA32, MPBB32, and MPTB32, where the A, the big B, and the big T all refer to annual, biennial, or triennial, but the little b um, refers to the option that we've sold, that we've come up with for um, the empirical rule. What happens in a year without an assessment? So option B is actually to update the coastwide TCY proportionally to the FIS index, the coastwide FIS index. So if the FIS index goes up 10%, the TCY would go up 10%. Simple as that. Really simple. And then the distribution of the TCY would be updated um, via the distribution procedure. 
And um, that's the normal distribution procedure. One of those five that would um, be, uh, that we're simulating over. So it would just be um, using the survey and all those other uh, components of it to then distribute the TCY. So basically the key there is the only difference here is instead of using a stock assessment, it's just using the proportional change in the coast white fist index. But we can't be outdone. So we have a lot more options for you to investigate in the um, Explorer, including these options of decision-making variability, estimation error, and SPR values. Notice there's still only just 32 inches size limit. But we've provided three different options of what happens in that non-assessment year. Option A, which I think of as all, all remain the same. And that is the request of the commission to have the TCY remain the same from um, in those non-assessment years as the previous year. B, I just explained, that is changing the coastwide TCY changes with the FIS index and then is redistributed according to the FIS index. And then C is the coastwide TCY remains the same as the previous year, but the distribution is updated using the FIS index. So a slightly different look at this. So just to point out exactly what a um, multi-year stock assessment looks like, and, and this is a comparison of MPBB, which is, remember, the little b means both in the coastwide and distributions being updated in the non-assessment year. Little c means constant coastwide. Uh, the coastwide remains constant. And so I might have my... No, it is correct. So what you can see in the black line that you have these two-year periods of constant TCY where it remains unchanged, but the blue line, it does change every year. It's just one year the assessment influences the change in next year. The um, index, the FIS index influences the change. So um, I can pause for a second if anyone has a question on sort of the background of multi-year assessments. Other than that, we'll just move right into the results um, and similar tables that we presented earlier. Hey, Alan, for the um, uh, MPs where the survey uh, change drives the harvest advice, what's the baseline that we start from? It, it's the current distribution TCEYs that would be the currently distributed TCEYs that would be changed by the FIS amount? Um, it's actually when the FIS is changing the TCY, it's only changing the coastwide TCY. So and then once that coastwide TCY is changed, then it updates the distribution. So really the baseline is just the previous year, if I'm understanding your question correctly. Yeah, yeah. So is it 2022, 2020, well, which 20, coastwide TCEY? Well, for 2023, it's 2022. And then for okay. 2025, it would be 2024, for example. Right. Um, it, it's always just looking at only the previous year as it rolls forward. Yeah. Okay, no, that, that's helpful just to know where we're starting from. Okay. I see oh, Dan. I can. Sorry. Yeah, so. When we were doing the other simulations, yeah, so again, I assume this doesn't include the 15% coastwide max on any of these. So the, the variability metrics will reflect that. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that blanket, that statement about MPs do not include constraints can be general to all MPs examined at, at this meeting. Right, and then I think I've, I've kind of had a, a side talk with you about um, like maybe you could explain a little bit more about how if if we're not updating the F43 calculation each year, the SPR calculation, and said it's just a regular scalar, you know, what type of a smoother would be best tailored for that approach? I mean, I know the 15% max was to kind of buffer against recruitment uncertainty, but if we're not recalculating the SPR every year, then maybe a three-year average of the S would be a better smoothing approach 
if we move to a multi-year stock assessment. So at, at some point in your presentation, could you kind of like talk about if we did want to incorporate a smoother into the multi-year stock assessment considerations, what would be a good approach? Yeah, I, I think we have incorporated these sort of constraints to, to limit the variability in the TCY from year to year. And that could, any of those that we've investigated in the past could be incorporated into this uh, round of, um, or, or these types of management procedures, any of the multi-year. So, for example, we could simply introduce a constraint on the change in the TCY. And even if the fifth survey changed by 20%, the TCY would only change by 15% with that constraint on it. Right now, if the FIST changes 20%, the TCY changes 20%. Um, additionally, we found in the previous analysis that providing a, um, uh, we think we did a five-year average on the FIS, uh to calculate stock distribution. And that performed, that reduced variability within some of the regulatory areas of uh, appreciably did a pretty good job at that. We could investigate those types of smoothers as well, e either on the coast-wide level on how to adjust the coast-wide TCY using some sort of running average or something like that, or doing it at the distribution level and doing some smoothing there as well. So I think it's, it's wide open to uh, creativity and what types of smoothers we can add to this, but noting that no smoothers are added or nothing's done in these management procedures to try to smooth out the variability from year to year. Okay, so let's dive into some more tables here. Um, so here again, we have the um, three different uh, assessment frequencies. And I note that the annual is MPA 32, which we've already seen that management procedure in previous tables when looking at the size limits. So that one's unchanged. And the two new one now is biennial and triennial. We're comparing those three now. And we have our primary coast-wide uh, objectives on here. And you can see the biological sustainability is met. Um, we're above the target, meaning the uh, probability of falling below 36% is low. And then you can see that um, the TCY is not changed by a whole lot between any of these management procedures. Um, and in this case, the key is that the change in the variability. Um, and so, but I think that's important because one expectation was potentially the, the TCY could change with this multi-year approach. Um, and th these are all short-term fishery statistics and then the long-term uh, relative spawning biomass. So not much change in the TCY, but a, a quite a bit of reduction, especially with the triennial in variability. And the other thing that we're going to talk about is notice there's a slight difference between the two variability statistics this time. We have the AAV showing a slight increase going to biennial but a decrease in the probability of any three years changing by amount of more than 15%. So that one decreases. And my explanation there would be potentially um, when the assessment year comes along, that the assessment year is uh, causing a, a potentially a very large change that is increasing the AAV since that's an average, yet in uh, in other years, it's not changing as much because the FIS is a little bit more stable, perhaps. So it's important to note that there's this difference between the two variability metrics. But in general, you're going to have potentially a little bit more stable um, period with the multi-year approach and a significant reduction in the AAV as you go to a triennial. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Huh. Um, that's interesting because I kind of had a slightly different take looking at that. And I looked at the probability of 15% change in every any three years with the triennial one. It's a, almost a 70% probability that when you do that stock assessment in the third year, the change is going to be greater than 15%. Is that the correct way of interpreting that? 
It's hard to separate it out, whether it's due to the stock assessment or the FIS index. Um, we don't know which years are which in that calculation, but, um, but you're right, is that with, um, is that potentially we have, you know, a 70% chance that any three years would be greater than 15%, but we can't separate it out, whether it's due to the stock assessment or the FIS index. However, given that it is declining, the more of the FIS index we put in there, it seems to be more likely associated with the stock assessment. So my observation was that as you go to these longer um, periods between them, there is stability in between the stock assessment, but then potentially larger jumps in that third year. So the, you know, I guess it is increased stability, but also increased volatility in the change year as well. That that is um, for sure. That is a potential, and um, we've been discussing that internally a lot. It's like, what does what does variability mean? And, you know, I've always talked about maybe we have a metric that says, what is the change in the stock assessment year? That would make sense for what I'm calling MPA, little a, um, realizing my lettering is probably not ideal. But um, but that that one where the, the TCY remains unchanged in the, in the non-assessment year, it, would, it might make sense to look at how much the change is in the assessment year. But... Really, when you think about it, um, what does what does variability mean to a stakeholder or a processor or, or anybody involved with the fishery? And here in this management procedure with using the FIS on the coastwide TCY, it does change every year. But what we're doing is we appear to be adding some stability, as you said, in those non-assessment years and potentially changing it by a greater amount in the assessment year. But is that average stability useful? Is the stability over a three-year period useful? Um, these are the things we have to think about um, in terms of that. I had another thought and it escaped my brain. Come back to me. Did okay. folks have any thoughts on that that point? Like we've talked a lot about variability, but. Um, it's been a while since we've been together. Like, what are folks' perspectives on um, whether it's it's good to have some incremental change, maybe still, you know, 10, 15 percent year over year, versus stability for a couple of years and then a very significant change in year three, like very significant being you know, 20 percent. Forrest. Yeah, uh, thanks, Adam. Um, so, uh, well, it can go both ways. If the if the stock's on an increase and it holds you at a, a dangerous level, uh, and, and I'm thinking in terms of recreational, of course, um, I do commercial fish as well, and uh, I'm not as concerned about jumps there as I am on the recreational side. And I, I just think uh, getting locked in, you know, stability has a positive connotation, but um, stability could also mean, you know, depressing you lower than you you could be going up. And so I, that, there, there's possible concern there from a recreational perspective. Forrest, is the concern in the rec sector, recreational fishery um, a function of cat sharing plans, like getting locked in at a low level because of a cat sharing plan, or is it because recreational opportunity is is that much more sensitive to low abundance? I, I think it's I think it's a CSP on, on the U.S. side. Um, mm. Well, I mean, that is what it is. It's just the fact that uh, with stock levels where they're at and the way things that are arranged right now, you know, we're, we already feel like we're pressed down to the bottom of things. And um, if there's a triennial assessment, and you know, if we if we stabilize at a low level. You know, it could do more damage than having a potential rebound on an annual assessment. Uh, or the, an annual assessment might allow, I guess, is my point. Um, you, you hold some, you will hold an industry somewhere for three years. You, you could have some long-term damage done. Whereas, if it was a year, they might be able to survive it. All right. Okay. So, in terms of like the structural adjustments for for the fishery, how quickly can they go from year to year, or how easily can they hold over from year to year if things are bad? Interesting. Okay. 
Thanks. Welcome. I see Peggy has a right hand raised. Yeah. Thanks, Ellen. Trying to get my oh, there we are. Sorry. Um, yeah, I agree with what Forrest said. As far as processors are concerned, I think we would we would um, support a fourteen or fifteen percent average annual variant to what we're seeing in this table, frankly. Um, and, and just to pull away from these particular numbers, every business hates change. If that change happens in small increments year to year, it's easier to adjust to that than it is to have every three years or every two years uh, more than a 15% change in PCEY. Um, so I don't think I'm saying anything new, just that this would be, uh, this, this would possibly present additional challenges to the processing sector. I think that is really helpful, Peggy, to, to hear it that way, that uh, you know, uh, annual, more incremental changes are preferable over holding things stable, constant for a while, and then a big jump. Like, <laughs> rather yeah. be a boiled frog. Well, is another parable, better better to boil the frog slowly, right? Yeah. OK, uh, let's go on to Chuck. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I, I would totally agree with that, that small incremental changes are better than waiting and having a big increase or a large decrease. Um, it just stands to reason for for simplicity in management, and you can adjust to the small changes, not so much the large changes. That's for recreational fishing. Thanks. All right. Okay. Uh, Pear. Yeah, let's go to Pear and then Tom, please. Can't quite hear you yet. Okay, try again. Got me yeah, now? Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. No, I agree with Peggy. Uh, small incremental changes are better as long as we have, a, you know, that 15% uh, smoother. Uh, what do you haven't taken into consideration since it's an IFQ fishery and people are buying quotas? If you're going to have a big change in the third year, uh, that could be, could be really devastating to uh, especially new participants in the fishery. Excellent point, Pear, particularly because we haven't even really considered what this means in terms of transitioning between fisheries or how much flexibility one has to go from a fishery to another if there's a big change. Really good point. Uh, Tom. Yeah, I, I can't get my camera working. So anyway, I think with this, maybe the misunderstanding here, I, we go way back into the very first year when Dr. Martel was here and he determined he, there was at 27 out of the last 42 years, we've exceeded more than 15% on a year to year. So, you know, if, if we also showed, I think, and what was that, a J or K or whatever in our, our management objectives, all our scenarios we did, that when you have a three to five year av rolling average, it's a smoother. So you actually could have a bigger jump from year to year than if you just did, if you averaged over three or four years, which tend to smooth things out. So it may be just the opposite of what people here are, are think is going to happen. So, I mean, we already know before we started this process that we exceeded 15% for, you know, well over 50% of the time, 60% of the time. So, I, and I don't know if it's any better now than it was then as far as commercial recreation. Back then, the commercial was the big concern about 15%. And now it's kind of switched around where the recreational is all concerned and the commercial is not too concerned. So it's, it's almost gone 180 degrees from where this started back in. 2013 or whatever. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's a good reminder of. Uh, I'm always pressed. You can pull these uh, pull these numbers from your from your memory. Uh, it's a good reminder of the conversations with Dr. Martel all those years ago. Um, I mean, I, I do think it is helpful, though, one, to, to hear from folks that we haven't heard from necessarily during the meetings. I really appreciate uh, folks putting their uh, their hands up if they haven't spoken, and, and two, to affirm this. Uh, uh, this observation that you know, generally people would prefer uh, annual incremental, more incremental changes than 
a situation where we're held constant for some period of time and experience a big jump. I think that's a, a type of feedback that would be very helpful for the MSAB to document and communicate to the commissioners. Because I, I don't think commissioners have heard that kind of advice formally from this process. So. All right, Alan, before I completely sidetrack you off your presentation, let's go on to the next slide. Oh, there, sorry, Pete's got his hand up. There you go. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I'll just I'll kind of throw some stuff in here. <clears throat> Having very limited experience with the IPHC process, let me uh, first temper my comments here uh, based on that. But I do have some experience with biennial uh, stock assessments. I think Dan makes a good point that some of these changes can be compounded with the modeling changes that go into the assessment in the off years. Um, assessment folks can, uh, you know, go down some rabbit holes at times, although I trust that Ian's not necessarily like that. Um, but one thing I'm kind of looking at here is that uh, thinking back to uh, the, the size limit analysis, so we've taken off this 15% threshold in the base model, so it's allowed to move around a lot. What I guess what I'm really more looking at is the comparison between the base model and the biennial or triennial, in particular, the probability that the, the TCEY would be, the change in it would be bigger than 15%. That's actually less in the biennial model than the annual model, which I'm kind of curious about. Um, uh, I had another thought too, but I just forgot it. But yeah, that, that was kind of more of what I was looking at. Oh, that was what it, and also like, I think it's hard to, you know, we can, we can talk about the, you know, the theoretical things that could happen with big changes in, in an assessment year and little changes, and all, but it's hard to really get a grasp of those results in this context, just looking at this table without looking at maybe some figures that actually show what the relative changes would be in an assessment year and then in the off year. And I mean, I've heard Ian say too, that the model really tracks with the FIS anyway. So a percent change in the annual model should be pretty closely reflected, I think, in that case of MPB small b, uh, perhaps even in the triennial. But yeah, that was that's my comment. Yeah, thanks, Pete. I, I think that was a really good uh, way to end that discussion because I was sim thinking along similar lines. I just want to make sure people are interpreting this table correctly, especially that probability that any three years change in the TCY is greater than 15%. Dan noted that there's a 70% chance in the triennial that there could be a change greater than 15%. But I want to note that there's also a 95% chance in the annual stock assessment. So there's almost every year is changing by more than 15% in the annual stock assessment. So the key interpretation there is, as Pete was saying, was to compare across these management procedures, compare A to B and A to T and B to T, um, noting that there are less, there are fewer years with a greater than 15% change when you move to a biennial and then even fewer when you move to a triennial. So maybe it's just a glass is half full, glass is half empty type of way to view these results. But I just want to make sure that we're all interpreting these correctly. Um, that, or that when we talk about small incremental change, I don't think MPA is um, showing a small incremental change. It's just showing a lot of variability from year to year. And part of the reason that that might be is is the assessment. Sure, the assessment and the BIS index do track each other very closely. The SRB noted that in one of their comments. But another part of this is when you have a non-assessment year, you're not rebalancing the SPR in that context. So the FIS index is just, it changes by this, and so it goes up 10% or it goes down 10%. The additional step in the assessment is you're taking into account all of the other sources of information and data rebalancing your SPR. Maybe the assessment introduces a little bit more variability to maintain that SPR. And the FIS index, and this is just a speculation, the FIS index is just changing, and and when you have that non-assessment year, you're not operating at the SPR of 43% anymore in those non-assessment years, um, but you're just changing the, changing the TCY, and then you're sort of allowing the assessment to ground truth you again and bring you back to, to where you want to be. 
So a uh, couple of things to think about, but I certainly uh, agree with Adam and appreciate the comments that, that we've been hearing. I think those are the sorts of things that we need to take into account when analyzing and evaluating these results. So if it's okay, I'll move on. We're just gonna step through some tables here and then have a few things at the end again. Um, okay, so what happens when you have higher fishing intensity? Well, now this is a case that is, again, different than what we saw with size limits. So just to orient you, what we have here um, on this side of the plot on the right are the higher fishing intensities, on the left are lower fishing intensities. And um, what you can see are with the biennial and annual in the blues and then the triennials in the red, that we don't have a lot of change in the AAV going from annual to biennial, but we have that huge reduction in the AAV going to the triennial. We have increase in TCY as you go to higher fishing intensity as expected, but you also have that increase in the AAV as you go to a higher fishing intensity as well. Um, but the increase in the TCY with the triennial is not as great as it might be with the annual or the biennial up, showing up there as you increase the fishing intensity. So again, this is one of those trade-off plots that has about at least three different sort of things that you can gain from it, but um, it is, uh, it, it, it's just something to note that the triennial is where the real differences begin to come in. found that pretty interesting. So again, here are our um, regional biological sustainability objectives. And what we see is that moving to biennial and triennial has a slightly lower probability of that 4B um, going below the 2%, but, um, uh, and, and I can't actually explain exactly why, except that maybe under biennial and triennial, I think there is a reduction in overall fishing intensity. Look at that and explore by looking at the median SPR. Cursor out of the way there. And then here are those probability of uh, the TCY in, any, in three years or more, changing by more than 15%. So now you get it on this regulatory area level, which is a little bit less than at the coastwide level. Um, so within a regulatory area level, you have probabilities that are slightly less, um, especially 2A, which has the agreement. But you can see that now you have pretty significant um, improvements with the triennial multi-year as compared to the annual or the biennial in most of these areas. It's interesting in 4B with the biennial, you actually have an increase in that probability of change occurring. And looking at the AAV, sort of this other way of looking at variability, um, you can see that the, um, there's that slight increase with the biennial, but then a significant decrease with the triennial. That could be um, that the assessment does normally change by more than the empirical rule in this case. In terms of the TCY, again, the coastwide TCY was pretty constant across these, and it's pretty much a mixed bag or similar. It's very small amount, so I'd say that it's, there's no way to tell if there's any discernible difference between any of these management procedures in terms of the TCY. Very slight differences. The percentage of TCY in each area is almost exactly the same across um, each regulatory area, so no significant differences in the percentage of TCY. We wouldn't really expect any of these to um, modify that. The minimum TCYs, um, yeah, not big differences again. TCY is not much affected by any of these, although 4B is showing one of the um, 
maybe potentially larger effects of any of the regulatory areas, which is why the percentage of spawning biomass is um, changing as well. Boris has a question. Yeah, I'm seeing a pattern that the biennial is usually lower than the annual and the triennial. So is, is there a reason for that? I mean, there's a couple of exceptions, but by and large, it seems like an annual and triennial track each other better uh, in the, yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting why that might be. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting result um, that you point out there is that there's no clear pattern moving from an annual to a biennial to a triennial is, is having a clear pattern of reduction or an increase in, in these metrics, but it sometimes has an increase and then a reduction. Um, but, it, and to be honest, I have not figured out exactly why. So you look at 3A and the median minimum TCY, it goes down with biennial and then way up in the triennial. It could be the feedback of this biennial system. Perhaps with the biennial, the assessment's trying to catch up. With the triennial, you have a little bit more smoothing over time. Then the assessment um, has only every third year to catch up. But um, really, really interesting result that I haven't just haven't been able to really um, provide a good answer for. Looking at it now, the minimum percentage of TCUI, and remember this is that bottom tail, so we're looking at those tails. Not huge differences. Some of these areas are showing some differences, but um, there's no clear patterns here. Um, and again, it's a slightly less minimum than the um, median. Yeah, Pete. Hey, Alan, sorry. I, I had seen Peggy's hand up earlier and she had just asked the question in the chat and I wanted to make sure that we didn't miss oh, yeah. that. That's a pretty good question given what we've experienced over the last two or three years. Yeah, that's a good question about data gaps in the FIS. Um, the fortunate thing is we have not missed, um, we have surveyed every year um, in the FIS, and we have not missed a year where we had no data to actually update the model. We also have the space time model, which is an excellent tool for helping us rationalize the FIS. In other words, reduce the footprint of the FIS in different years and focus on different areas in alternating years. So the data gaps in the FIS are actually, most of them are by design in recent years in that we're choosing to survey specific years. And Dr. Webster has done an excellent job actually investigating um, the, the designs of the FIS and optimizing those designs uh, by, um, maintaining a specified level of uncertainty in the outputs of the FIS. And so, uh, Ian and I were just discussing this the other day, even with now that we're rationalizing the FIS, we're not doing coast-wide surveys, we're surveying some areas every two, three, uh, second or third year, um, we still have a survey that is an excellent fishery survey, has a very small um, uh, uncertainty associated with it, a high precision, and is also um, very informative on a coastwide scale because of the modeling procedures we have. So I don't, I don't see the data, current data gaps um, affecting uh, these results at all or in the future, given um, the great work that Dr. Webster's been doing. But th that's an excellent point. Um, something that you know has come up in. Other analyses is if a survey is missed in a year, like some surveys were missed in COVID years, what does that do for some of these fisheries that do rely on an annual survey? Um, we haven't had run into that yet, and we've had a great, um, a great uh, group of commercial fishermen that are willing to help with our survey, even in challenging years. So we've been very fortunate. Okay, so here is a table now showing the um, three different options of the biennial, the A, B, and C of those. Um, and those three options are, as a reminder, um, their A is they're all the same, B is they change coastwide and distribution, and C is only the distribution changes. And um, I do apologize when I put this presentation together, I realized that I had made an error in 
uh, BA. And so I excluded it from this plot, but that's since been fixed and updated in the MSE Explorer. So you can recreate this table in the MSE Explorer and have a look at what it looks like for MPBA. Um, I can't remember it offhand. I've got too much in my brain right now. Um, so um, what are the differences here? There's some, some slight differences between the biennial uh, procedures and keeping that coast-wide TCY constant and biennial DC. Um, that has some small effects, I guess. Yeah, right, just reminding myself. It reduces the AAV considerably because it's keeping that constant now. So that is showing you that the FIS index does have some effect on that AAV. We've gone from 18.5 in annual on the AAV to 14.7 in BC. Um, that's not British Columbia, that's MPBC. Um, whereas when it's changing with the FIS, it's gone up to 19%. Um, so I think really what's happening, there's not much difference between A and BB, but there's a big difference between A and BC. Just trying to remember. Yeah, um, one thing to note of reported short-term statistics or short-term metrics here, the long-term metrics for TCUI um, actually show a different pattern. And so that is, might be something to be aware of and to look out for. And just make sure, anything else? Oh yeah, so we're gonna get into some variability um, one thing that I noted here, I'm, I'm showing now the 95th uh, percentile for the AAV. And what you can see is that that upper end of the AAV is actually being reduced in, in the biannual BB. So there's a difference in sort of the range of AAV values across these different ones. And we'll look at that a little bit more clearly coming up. So I know that there's a ton of stuff on this table. We have some new metrics like median annual change, which is what is used. Well, I've shown the probability of any one change in the TCY, any two, three, four, or five years changed by more than 15%. And that provides a lot of insight into how much things are changing. So for example, if I created a statistic, uh, any six years changed by more than 15%, that should be zero or nearly zero for the triennial because there aren't even six years that can change. Um, so it's just a way to look at different statistics to get a better understanding of what is really going on with the variability. Before you move on, Alan, can I ask you a question? Yeah, for sure. Um, I was just reminding myself what the difference between BB and BC is and how the FIS is used in so in BB, the FIS is used to update both coastwide and distribution. And in BC, it holds coastwide constant, but then updates only distribution. Exactly. So thinking back to what you were saying about maybe a lot of the variability in those numbers is when we try and update the coastwide TCEY each year. Um, and maybe that has something to do with the I don't know, but it seems like that's where a lot of the variability, because in A, you're updating both the SPR and the coastwide. In B, you're not updating the coast, the SPR, but you are using the FIS to update the coastwide model. And in C, you're holding coastwide constant and SPR constant, but only changing the distributions around. So it seems to imply that a fair chunk of that variability is in the changing coastwide TCEY number. Is that a reasonable observation or what's your conclusion? Yeah, I'd first say that in the non-assessment years, the SPR is never held constant. It just, uh, the TCY is what it is. Um, and then it, there's an SPR associated with that that is likely different than a 43 or whatever percent. Yeah. You are. I, should have, I, should have, I should have said that the SPR is not recalculated, not held right, constant. Exactly. It's not rebalanced or whatever the word you, you use. Yeah, right? yeah, it's not. Um, yeah, it's not used in the calculation at all. Um, but you're right, it, it, there is, um, I think we found the same result in previous in previous analyses is that, it could, it, and, and this is why we put a constraint on the coast-wide TCY, is that was where most of the variability was coming from. 
And then variability, there was some variability occurring in the distribution of the TCY, but that variability was mostly occurring in Western areas. And then introducing an average on the distribution, the O32 distribution, calm down that source of variability. But you're right, I mean, calming down the variability on the coast-wide TCY tends to transfer to all the individual regulatory areas. I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at or not. It was. I mean, I think something like that would be helpful in our minutes if you can, we can capture that thought. And just to notice that, you know, in, right. in comparing DB and BC, the, the differences in how in not updating the coastwide. And so I guess I would say that there are there are two components to variability. One is the changes in the coastwide and one is changes in between reg area and distribution. Um, and in the past, we've seen that a coastwide constraint is very helpful in limiting the coastwide TCE wide changes without harming yield or sustainability. It's interesting. Uh, Ian just pointed out, though, that the triennial is updating the coastwide, and there the AAB has dropped considerably. It might start, th these things might start coming out as I pre present a couple more slides where we look more, um, dive into the variability a little bit deeper. So if I may um, continue rolling on here. Let's see, I think we're nearing the end of this presentation, so we might hold off on a break a little bit if you're okay with that. I'm just going to check where we're at right now. Yeah, maybe I'll present this slide. We can take uh, a short break and then come back with some summary slides. How does that sound, Chairs? That sounds good to me. Thanks. Okay. So what we're plotting here is actually the distribution of a bunch of different metrics related to variability. So the first on the, the left is um, the absolute value of annual change. And what this says is for every, and I think these are all short term, if I remember correctly. Yeah, short term on the left, it says that. So what that most left plot is showing is the uh, variability in the absolute annual change for every single year in that 10 year period for every individual year. And you see there's a lot of range of variability. I actually had to, actually had to plot it on a log scale. There was so much variability. But it um, over here and what it's showing is that sometimes there's a lot, sometimes there's a little, but across these management procedures, looking from here to here to here, you can see in general, there is a decline in, that, in the annual change in this. And so what that's showing is even though the, um, the AAV for the say MPBB is higher, that in general, there is less change overall, um, overall, but there's still quite a bit of range of change. And then we move to the triennial and there's even a little bit, um, it moves even down more to be a little bit less change. This plot's hard to read because it has such a wide scale of ranges. So maybe then averaging over the 10 years as we've done here, as we've just taken the average over the 10 years, and then this is the absolute proportion change. So proportion change means um, the, the current year divided by the previous year. Yeah, no, it's the current year minus the previous year divided by the previous year. So a value of, yeah, wait, uh, I just confused myself. I'm gonna have to think about that. Absolute proportion change. I think I've been presenting a little too long today and I need to, I'm gonna need a break soon to, to just think about that. But I think the key aspect here in this plot, and I'll be able to define it after the break, is that the average absolute change, again, declines. You can see the distributions get squashed and the triennial has a big effect on that absolute annual change. This is really indicating the change from one year to the next. 
the AAV then is looking at the average uh, change over that entire 10 period, that entire 10 year period, it's taking an average of it. And this is the one where you can see this white dot there, slightly larger than that white dot there. But when you look at this distribution, you see that the distribution of the AAV is, again, more on the smaller side. And so that median may just be very similar in these two plots, but you do have more cases where it is less than um, MPA with the B. And then of course the triennial is just really um, showing a, a lower difference in the variability. So one, it could be related to the number of simulations. We need to increase the number of simulations to really get the real differences in these medians. But overall, these distributions tend to get more squashed, that's a technical term, as you move into the multi-year approaches, um, even with FIS updating it from year to year. So that FIS index does appear to be caught, um, resulting in some reduction in the amount of annual change from year to year. So I'll pause there. Uh, do you want to take any questions for the break? Over the break, I'll definitely try to remind myself what annual change is, because um, just escaped my brain. Let's just try to keep it to any quick points of clarification. We can get into more substantive conversation after the break, I think. I just had a quick, maybe silly question here. Um, Alan, why, why are the bottom of these violin plots flat? Is there a threshold or something that you're not, that it's not going below? Um, that, that's a good question. Um, they'll fall over if they have a pointy bottom. Let <laughs> me just be able to stand up on their own. It might, yeah, it might be because they're on the absolute scale. I'll have to think about that too. Yeah, but you need that base, like a base to hold it up. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's a good question. I think uh, I'm definitely due for a break right now. All right, so um, given where we're at with the agenda, is is 15 minutes sufficient, Alan, do you think? Or a yeah. bit longer to? No, I think 15 is fine. Okay, well, actually, we, maybe you can just round it up to um, 1,500 specific time here. Sounds good. Does that work for you, Pete? Is that all right? That, that's great. Okay. Well, okay, sounds good. Well, let's... Um, Take a minute now to uh, stretch your legs, get a drink of water, and we'll uh, meet back here in just over 15. All right, thank you.
blue again. Thanks for the break. I needed that. Uh, I've got everything figured out. <laughs> Perfect. Never doubted you. <laughs> I have an answer to Pete's question. That was a great question. All right. Well, I think we can uh, roll right into it. Okay. So let me answer two questions real quick. One is what is annual change? And it is exactly what I thought it was. It is the proportion that the TCY changed compared to last year. So the purport, um, so what I think of it as is it's exactly what you would want to see when you're thinking about a 15% threshold, for example, is in this plot here, a value of 0.5 means the, um, the TCY changed by 50% compared to last year, either up or down, since it's absolute value. Um, and so I could easily draw a line at about 15%, which would be about right there, um, across this whole plot, and it would give you an idea where you're above and below the, um, the sort of identified threshold that MSAT has been thinking about. So that's annual change. And then why, does they, why do they have flat bottoms um, on these? And I think there's two reasons. One is it's a violin plot. I've been trying out these violin plots. I'm not a huge fan of them, um, but I think it's an artifact of the way they sort of draw these plots. Um, and you can even see up here, there's this weird little bit that might just be like two dots up there. So these things are affected by um, outliers a lot. But the other reason and the main reason that they have flat bottoms is this is an average over a 10 year period. So for it to go down to zero, that would mean the TCY did not change for 10 years or a full 10 year period. Um, and so that's pretty much impossible in these simulations. Um, <clears throat> and that is why now averaging over that is always gonna be greater than that. Um, but why it's perfectly flat, I, I don't know. I think it's just there's um, some minimum change that's occurring in there and an artifact of how these violin plots are drawn. They're just sort of densities. Um, so hopefully that clears everything up, makes it as clear as the skies in Seattle on this smoky day. It's pretty bad down here. Um, and um, I don't know, should we entertain any more questions before moving on to a summary? Maybe uh, let's move to the summary slide. Uh, I, I don't doubt folks have been thinking about it over the break and may have some questions, but I think the summary slide might cut some of those off at the past, so to speak. Sounds good. Okay, so um, just an overall summary here, a few points that, that um, we found interesting. One is the biological sustainability is met, except for that four Bravo, which has never been met by any management procedure we've investigated. The biennial and trennial management procedures were closer to target, um, and that's the target spawning biomass, but still mostly above target. So I think they had like probabilities of 20, around 20%. Um, the TCY showed minor differences across all of these. Um, in terms of the um, option B for the empirical rule, but you'll note that options A and C actually did result in a, in a slight decline in the TCY. And it might, it might be useful to look on your own at the differences between short-term and long-term metrics on the TCY. Um, <clears throat> Increasing fishing intensity showed different results, especially with the triennial. So it's just a reminder that we can't, um, if we want to look at different fishing intensities, we'd actually want to look at that rather than assume there's patterns that would occur at those. Um, and then we found that the details and the variability is most important and understanding that variability is really helpful. <clears throat> so related to variability in the TCY, the median AV was similar for annual and biennial, but much reduced for triennial. We saw that for option B. When you look at the other empirical options like A and C, the um, AAB was reduced in those because it was holding that coast-wide TCY constant as opposed to option B, which was um, 
using the FIS index to update the coast by TC1. The triennial showed the lowest variability averaged over a 10 year period. Um, and there's more contrast seen in the annual change metric. Um, and uh, that's the contrast. What I'm talking about is looking at the annual change over different numbers of years. And you can see the more years, it was much more reduced with the multi-year um, management procedures. And that is because those multi-year is introducing some form of stability. Um, yeah, and yeah, and, and they they were they had a sequential reduction going from biennial to triennial, as you would expect. Um, and I just note at the bottom here that the um, the option C, where the coast YTC is why it held constant, but the distribution changes with this, um, showed similar results as a triennial uh, option B, but it did have a loss in yield. So that is something to be aware of. Options A and C did result in a loss in yield at the same SPR. So overall, and I think this first point is a really good point to, to keep in mind, and it's something that the SRB actually really came up with. I can't claim uh, claim this one, but using the FIS results in years without an assessment produced similar res similar results as an annual assessment. And so that is option B, where we use FIS to update the coast wide TCYN distribution, and it potentially had less variability in the TCY. So some really nice things about using the FIS in those off years or those off assessment years is that it's using all available, it's using not all, but some available observations and it responds annually to changes in the size and distribution of the stock. So I, I think that's a useful. And it would maintain area specific agreements if there are any area specific agreements. I don't wanna assume that there may be. And what I mean by that is if the commission were to come up with you know, a constant um, uh, or, or some percentage, some area would get a percentage of the um, coast wide TCY or something like that, or um, some, it wants to be based on the stock distribution, if that's part of the agreement, then this is, you would have to, you, you might want to maintain that every year. And this type of empirical approach would maintain those agreements. So something maybe considering. Um, we found in these results, if you look at the MSE Explorer, that the constant coast wide TCY in those off assessment years does result um, or may result in a loss in yield. Um, we could adjust the SBR to match that um, target of 36%, but that would likely show an additional loss in yield when moving to these multi year approaches, and that's that sort of effect of fishing intensity. Um, <clears throat> And there may be other ways to do these. These are just three options, A, B, and C, um, but there may be other ways to incorporate an empirical rule without using an assessment. And then finally, uh, net ec economic benefits are not known. And I simply refer back to uh, the Hutch, Hutch exact paper from 2019 on summer flounder, which did examine the net economic benefits for that species under multi-year assessments. That, that might be a useful one to refer to. I can provide that to any M7 members that wish to have it. <clears throat> so something important to consider um, that the commission has actually asked um, for, and they asked specifically to work with the SRB and others as necessary, is to identify potential costs and benefits of not conducting an annual stock assessment. Um, and this could include a prioritized list of work items that could be accomplished in its place. So we've been thinking about this a lot um, and we've been talking with the SRB about it and I apologize for the small text on this slide, but I wanted to get the two sort of responses from the SRB related to the cost and benefits. I won't read them out, um, but noting that the first one, the SRB just noted a number of areas where uh, research could be done um, in, in years where um, the assessment is not being done, or what might be um, where research might be directed if assessment's not done every year. And then finally, in that first request, is the quantifiable costs 
where these more direct costs of a multi-year assessment could be estimated with the MSE. Example, is there potentially a lower average uh, yield in longer assessment cycles? And then the second one from this most recent SRB is one um, that we found very interesting and is the reason that we, we put in the triennial and prioritized the triennial look at this, which I'm really glad that we did given the, the differences we've seen there, is the SRB actually requested that we examine a management procedure based on a three-year assessment cycle with um, the annual TCY changes proportional to the FIS index. And they gave four reasons why. One, this approach would be simple and more transparent than a model, um, which has not been yet developed, which is they're referring back to their other request of um, incorporating a simple model rather than a full assessment model. So they, they sort of felt, oh yeah, this is a great idea. Uh, there's a high benefit to cost ratio for multi-year TCYs that's looking at these results. Uh, it matches the current three-year full assessment cycle, and that's a good reminder that currently the assessment is on a three-year cycle where um, it has a full update, and then it has two years where they're just, or it has a full assessment, and then two years with just update assessments where um, it doesn't do a full examination of all the different aspects of the model and what can be changed. And, um, and then every third year, it's a full examination. again. And so just to clarify what we're talking about with a multi-year assessment is those updates aren't done for the assessment and the, that update isn't used to set the, uh, to provide advice for setting the TCY, but instead the FIS survey is used to write. And then finally, um, this approach has a lot of precedence in in other fisheries commissions, such as Southern Blue Pit Tuna. So um, some, some good comments from the SRB. Um, Boris, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, um, I think those were all benefits that were listed. If you were to list costs for not doing an annual assessment, what, what would be your top three bullet points? Or, or maybe oh, maybe you're getting to that. Thank you. In advance. No problem. Um, I segue into this, but those are the top three bullet points of costs. And really, as the SRB noted, the costs can be identified by the MSE. Um, the first one listed there in detail harvest advice not available every year. Um, that's not something that really came out of the MSE, but is, is a cost that was identified. It, be a simpler process in setting the TCY, a more transparent process and simply using the survey, but it wouldn't have all those, what do you have normally, Ian, 150 slides in your assessment presentation? Um, there'd be much fewer slides in Ian's presentation. But we did see that some of these um, management procedures uh, like A and option A and option C could potentially result in a loss in yield. Um, although B, using the FIS survey, which does track the assessment pretty well, it tracks along with the assessment pretty well, showed about a similar, um, uh, similar yield. Um, there is a, a higher chance of smaller stock size, um, but with an SPR of 40%, we'd still likely be above the target with any of these multi-year approaches. But what that does mean is if we were to tune the SPR specifically to um, match the target, that probably means in the multi-year assessment, we might have to back off on the fishing intensity a little bit to match the target. So we might fish at a 38% with an annual assessment and a 39 or 40% with a multi-year assessment. Um, so there we might have trade-offs in yield if we went down that route. Uh, so something to think about um, with, with that in, the, in our comments earlier about the target objective. Um, the benefits of the multi-year assessment, I won't go through, but we've identified a number of benefits from both the MSE analysis as well as other brainstorming sessions with ourselves and with the, the SRB. But there are a number of benefits, um, including um, some more focused assessment research as well as collaboration within the IPHC on the other types of research. Um, and then some of those that the uh, SRB stated in their statement as well. So 
Um, it, just a reminder, the commission did have the request to work with the SRB on identifying costs and benefits, but they also mentioned in that request and others as necessary. Um, so I think this is one place that the MSAB, if they do identify costs and benefits, you know, that might be a, a good item to highlight in the MSAB report. Alan, before you move on, I, I, my hand isn't residual. I actually have a follow-up question. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, the the last bullet point under cost, higher chance of smaller stock size, although still likely above the target. Um, if we're hovering close to B30, like, you know, even retrospectively, we've found that we might have dipped below it. If we're right there above the ramp, um, what, what are some of the risks being down that far? I mean, we, we wouldn't want to wake up on a third year and find out that we dip below and start taking aggressive action on on our fishing intensity or something like that. Can you speak to that just briefly? Yeah, th that's that's actually an interesting point for us. I hadn't really thought about that too much, but potentially if in that third year you had dipped below 30%, your control rule kicked in, and then you set a TCY at say uh, SPR 50%, that there is the potential that you wouldn't adjust that SPR until the next assessment. Um, you could have the benefit of backing off the fishing intensity results in an increase in the survey, thus you're increasing the survey, but you would not be um, calculating the stock status to then recalculate your control rule and readjust your fishing intensity. So in that sense, that, that, that's a good point, is there is a cost that if you are below you sort of remain at these reduced fishing intensities for uh, potentially you know, two or three years. And, and through the chair, if I might just so, uh, is the FISC going to track the assessment close enough? We probably don't need to worry about that too much, or or could could we have a, a surprise? And thanks, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, um, the FIS tracks the assessment as much, but as I mentioned, the, the FIS isn't going to tell us about relative spawning biomass. So what I'm doing right now is I'm looking at the probability that the relative spawning biomass is less than 30%. We know it's less than 20% in none of these simulations, and that's because of the control rule, um, because of that aggressive action. But even with um, fishing at a SPR of 43%, going below an, a relative spawning biomass of 30% is a is very small, it's less than 1% chance of going below um, 30%. So the control rules hardly kicked in. And even going up to a um, fishing intensity of 40%, the chance of going below 30% is only about two to 3%. Um, but it is interesting. It's about a 2% chance for annual and biennial, one to 2%. But then in the triennial, it's about a three and a half percent chance of going below thirty percent. So, you know, these fishing intensities, 40, 43, and forty-six, are pretty much uh, lower fishing intensities than um, what would be to achieve maximum sustainable yield, and they're lower. They're low enough fishing intensities that there's a small probability of even going below thirty percent and at enacting the control rule. Um, I'm looking in the long term on this. The short term will be different because as you notice, we are currently at a state where we're pretty close to 30%, 33. In the short term, the probability, and, and I don't really, you know, this isn't meant as a projection model, but those probabilities of going less than 30% are, are higher um, in the short term. <clears throat> so a, a very good point, Forrest. Um, and although in the long term, that would not be as likely to happen once we get to equilibrium, but um, it definitely could happen. And if that control rule is enacted in a triennial assessment, then the control, the relative spawning biomass wouldn't be updated. Um, in that case though, I wonder if, you know, there might be an emergency procedure put in that the assessment does occur on an annual basis to update the relative spawning biomass and make sure that we're not in any sort of critical zone. That, that could be actually something placed in the MP itself. I, I think that's a, a pretty likely outcome if such an MP were to be adopted, at least based on you know the, the 
the commission's history of how actively the fishery is managed. I see Chris's hand is up. Chris, did you have something to build on top of that or a new point? Uh, it was, it was, wasn't necessarily a new point, but builds on that. I think just in the discussion of um, the target reference point and, and what's on slide 39, that just reminded me to make sure that we, we have it in the meeting record to that we need to seek some direction on from the commission on sort of what their intent is for a target biomass for our, our objective, for the objective for the target biomass. In that, like I said earlier, to me, it seems like we're now treating it as a threshold and you know, my understanding or my interpretation of the language would be that it was a it was a target, and we should be trying to hit it, be above it or below it fifty percent of the time. So I just want to make sure we get that in the meeting record. Thank you. Uh, if, if I may comment really quickly on that, I looked through um, past MSAB reports last night to see if there was any insight from the MSAB or the commission. In my brief uh, investigation, I didn't. I I, I still found that it was. Um, Thing, uh, that, that it wasn't uh, defined very well. So I agree with you, Chris, is that that might be one thing that we continue to um, look at and define more clearly. Thanks for uh, looking into that as well, Alan. That's quick work. Uh, I see Tom and then uh, Dan has his hand up. I've got another point as well that I'll add. Yeah, uh, Alan, just as a curiosity, more of the business uh, concern, if you only had it every two or three years, how would they maintain the personnel and to be able to to ramp back up to do assessments if, when you lay off for two or three years? How, how would that work? That's a really good point, Tom. And I, I think the key here is that um, the quantitative sciences group that is responsible for the assessment would um, be, be allowed, be, be a able to focus themselves on other types of research, such as um, more focused assessment research. There's a number of things that the SRB has identified for um, the assessment that would be helpful to research on the assessment, as well as the, the space-time model for the FIS that would um, potentially be able to be done more quickly if an assessment wasn't done every year. Um, conducting an assessment takes up quite a bit of time of the year, and so we'd be able to focus uh, our attention on other aspects, other priority uh, research items. Um, and that might include a collaboration with the, the research branch here, the, the biological and ecosystem research branch as well, um, collaborating on various uh, research they're conducting. There's interest in things like uh, close kin marker capture, for example. There's interest, you know, we've been doing EMR studies. We've been uh, looking more into the genetics and, and being more involved in that might help bring the IPHC together as well. So I think uh, the SRB has identified a few of the items that are where we could spend our time in those non-assessment years. And so it wouldn't be that we would lose personnel. Um, but we would just be able to refocus the um, personnel onto priority topics um, that are identified by the commission. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, thanks. Um, just a couple of points. One, um, just to follow up on what Chris was saying, you know, I do think the B36 target and whether that should be a you know, hard 50% target or whether it should be more along the lines of something Anne-Marie was saying where it would be you know, a range around that 50% is our target, you know, anywhere between 40 and 60 is acceptable or perhaps 50 to 40 is acceptable is something we still should discuss. And I'm not sure if, you know, I'm glad Chris flagged it, but I couldn't tell whether he was communicating that we have decided it should be a hard 50 or whether um, it's still um, something we should determine in the future. And I think from my perspective, there are um, reasons not to have it as a hard 50 that I'd like to try and flesh out in the future. So put a pin in that one as a TBD and not a decided factor, I guess, um, from my perspective. Um, I do think it's important to somehow communicate this concept of that, you know, we found that a some sort of a constraint at the coastwide scale has had benefits in reducing variability, and we should, you know, should the commissioners decide to continue looking at um, 
multi-year assessments or size limits, we would recommend that they incorporate um, some type of a coast-wide constraint if people will go that far. And I think, you know, there are a couple that have been talked about, but mostly it's the idea that, you know, past work has really shown that these reduce variability without really reducing yield or the sustainability metrics, and they're just a, a good thing to have. We tried to tease out a bit about what's causing the coast-wide, you know, is it the calculation, is it the FISS or what? And I, without going down that rabbit hole, I think the constraint works across all of those possible causes. Um, so that would be like one of, one of the things that was caught up that I would highlight. Um, and my last thought is a question for Alan. If you could go back to that violin plot right before the break. And it's mostly trying to reconcile. So at one point, we, I thought I heard you say that there was no clear pattern going from an annual to a biannual to a triannual on variability. And then I thought I heard you say after the break that if you use absolute AC, you did see like a progression that uh, you know, one year is more variable, a two years more stable, and a three years more stable still. And so I was just wondering if you could follow up on that and help me understand the pattern. Yes. Thanks, Dan. A really good point. And um, when I was saying that there was that, not that pattern going from annual to biennial to the triennial, I was referring to in the medians. Um, and, and as you can see here, even these white dots, there slightly increases there, and then it potentially, I'm just guessing. I know it, I know it does that for the AAB over here. Um, and then and, and that is why I think it's useful to then look more closely at variability and the range of variability and what is really happening in here. And you can see that there's not this linear sort of pattern across them, but I think going from an annual to a biennial has some benefit, but moving to a triennial has um, much larger benefits in terms of um, reducing variability and the metrics that we have defined here. So sorry for that confusion. I, I do realize how that can be confusing, um, but it's, uh, it's complicated. I think that's the key outcome here is that it's not a simple look at a simple statistic and variability, but you have to think of it a little bit more holistically. Thanks. Thanks for that, uh, Dan. I had, oh, sorry, Chris, I see your hand too. I just have a couple of summary points I'd try to put on the table um, or observations from that uh, that review. So uh, quick response, Dan, to your comment about whether we talk more about the target reference point. I think I note the report already has a comment that we think we'd benefit from some clarity. I, given the time we have available, I, I'm, lesson to open up the conversation about whether we're treating it as this target, I think as, as Chris has described it, or some alternative, like Anne-Marie had said, um, you know, maybe if there was more time in the in the meeting tomorrow, we could start to broach the conversation. But I think for the time being, we've got a placeholder in the report to say we need some clarity on this and uh, um, and leave it at that. At least that's, that's my initial thought. Um, Alan, thinking of slide 52, uh, I was going to add another benefit, but it, I'm happy to see it was already covered by SRB. Um, but I think it bears repeating because I think it's been understated. A real benefit of a multi-year assessment is the improved transparency of um, annual harvest advice. At least in my experience uh, domestically in, in Canada, having a harvest advice each year that's just you know some proportion of the of the survey. Um, has been really beneficial to communicate with with folks. We don't get bogged down into modeling details with the analyst year after year, especially given how frequently the model can change. Um, so that's done a lot to instill trust in the process by having a really simple to understand procedure. Um, it also then means that, of course, it, you know, Ian or others would have time to go away and implement some of these more substantial changes in the in the assessment on the you know year three or whenever it happens. 
the question though I have is, uh, Ian, do you think that if that were to be adopted, if we were to have a, a you know a full assessment every three years, what would the magnitude of change be in the assessment? Like, are you are you trying to scrabble together pieces year after year, or could you would it be like a a really big overhaul in year three? And what would that mean for cash variab or harvest variability? Yeah, so a couple couple points to respond to that. The, the first one would be that we are effectively already on a three year assessment cycle. And so right now in the interim two years, I, we really try to limit major changes. I, I do run small changes to data sets or model structures through the SRB and we evaluate those and make sure they're not gonna be a, a huge difference. Uh, and if, if they're, not a, if they're not a major change, then we go ahead and implement those in the update years. But we've generally tried to hold major changes such as the introduction of the new um, sex ratio information for the commercial catch was paired with the 2019 stock assessment. And so I, honestly, I don't think that the magnitude of change would be appreciably different for the full stock assessment years. What we would, what would this would allow us to do would be to provide more supporting research. So my time would be spent you know, digging into smaller issues that we don't generally have time to deal with on the annual process. Um, I, I will, though, provide a caveat to that, which is that when major changes and, and questions and issues come up, they tend not to correspond to this cycle anyway. Um, if we were to, for example, to learn something very new and different about the stock or to get some big surprise in our data sets, we would find a way to accommodate that regardless of where we were in the assessment cycle, as I think most processes would. And so, and that's not the sort of thing that's well simulated because we don't really know when those unexpected things will pop up. And so I, I guess I would say that those things, when and if they come up in the future, will get dealt with regardless of what the, um, the management procedure or you know our, our intended approach would look like. That's uh, that's really helpful. Thanks. Actually, segues well into my my last point, which was and this is looking ahead a little bit. If this were a type of MP to be adopted, it would be really nice if there was some convergence of the research plan timeframes and the the assessment cycle. Not to say that they line up exactly, but you know maybe the research you know concludes the year before a major review of the stock assessment, and those results could be incorporated. That's all you know, longer term pieces, though. Thanks very much. Uh, I see Chris's hand and then uh, Forrest. Yeah, thanks, Adam. I was just going to make, uh, you sort of already made the point with respect to the target reference point. I don't think we should make any, be making any changes to it right now or to the metric. I think we need some clarity from co the commission because I think depending on what we get back from them, uh, it could be a, 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 we could be talking about a significant change or not much of a change at all. So I think we just need to hold until we get that clarity. Thanks. Go ahead, Forrest. I think Pete had something as well, maybe. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so just listening to Ian's last response, I'm just wondering, you know, we've supported the target, as the MSAV, we've supported a target of uh, fishing intensity of F43, which you can't track as well if you're not updating that annually. Um, does it take a full assessment um, to produce the, the adjustment there annually? Or, I mean, you say that you do lighter work for two years and then you have a full assessment every third year as it is so i'm just wondering what extra step it takes to to produce the updated spr yeah thanks for the question forrest in order to generate an estimate of the spr it takes a full assessment effectively when i when i say full versus update for the current schedule i mean really with regard to changes to the data sets and model but um, to do to, to estimate SPR, you have to conduct the assessment. There's really no way to, to generate a proxy for that in between. Thank you. Chris, did you have a follow-up on that or is that a new hand? Or either way, <laughs> okay. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll jump in then. I had one other point that I realized I forgot to circle back to, and that was Dan's uh, question to the group 
about whether or not there is a, how strongly do we note the uh, discussion about a coastwide constraint to improve MP performance? I think Dan had, had kind of tested the waters to see if there's an appetite for, for the MTAB to perhaps recommend that a constraint at the coastwide level uh, continue to be part of uh, a management procedure. I don't want to put words in your mouth, Dan. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I think you captured it well. I, I mean, our past work has suggested that it's a beneficial component of the management procedure, and um, and you know, here we even embarked on new work, which again shows the uh, variability to kind of be above you know tolerance levels without something like that. And so I wouldn't hurt to try and put it as a recommendation. So it actually goes into the top of our minutes and the commissioners can take note of it. Um, so that was my intent. So, so maybe we can, um, maybe two things. We can put that back to the group to see if there's any initial thoughts uh, from folks on that uh, now, or we could, um, Defer that piece to a. Well, I guess that conversation may be happening now. We, we do have a um, potential subsequent conversation about identifying any additional analyses that might be produced between now and the annual meeting. At least so we're aware of it. I don't know, Alan, if you've got some thoughts on the the utility of, um, you know, at least giving us a heads up on what sort of MPs are going to be evaluated between now and the annual meeting and where we ought to focus our attention? Sure, Adam. I think, um, so I've already included the selectivity uh, scenarios. Uh, we were thinking of potentially including the constraint in one of these. We just haven't gotten there yet, really had a lot of preparation to do for this meeting. Um, I think one of the priorities is to increase the number of simulations for these core or these, you know, these five MPs that were presented today. Um, just to see if, you know, these slight changes in medians um, are real or they're just a, a factor of the, the simulation process. Um, other than that, you know, I, I'm not sure. It just it sort of depends. The IM document is going to be due next week, so I'm not going to have much time to update the interim meeting document. And then after that, well, there's really only another two months at most before the AM documents due. Um, so there isn't a whole lot of time to add more simulations. But you know, it, it is something that has been on my radar to add a constraint just because that was of interest to the MSAB. It just wasn't the direction of the um, commission in the past. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll let me put you out of your misery. You're being so diplomatic to say that you are swamped. You don't have the ability to do much more right now. I, I think that's what you're trying to get to, right? Well, well I, I think though, note that the SRB convinced us to put in the triennial, yeah. um, but that was backed up by the commission as direction. Um, I don't Maybe. want to overwhelm the commission with other options as well. I've, I've learned that really focusing, they only have a small amount of time for many different topics at the annual meeting, keeping it very focused on the um, <clears throat> real results is useful. But if the yeah. CMSAB was to make that recommendation, um, that could be considered uh, between now and then, even if it's just for, um, yeah, you'd really want to do it for all the runs. So it might, yeah. it might just overwhelm the commission at this point. Yeah. And and as a as a co-chair, I can definitely vouch for the you know the challenges that are um, that that arise from having more MPs being added. Trying to communicate these results concisely is is a real challenge when there's uh, new additions. Maybe an alternative then, and I see Pete's coming, so he may come to to save save me. Is uh, as we put this within the um, uh, work plan discussion because I, I think our work plan is also. Uh, coming up soon as well, right? In terms of the contents of the work plan? Uh, for, for the MSE? Yeah, I think this work plan is expiring or is finished. We'll it's concluding, finished. yeah. yeah it's finished in, uh, at the annual meeting, basically. So um, it's time to, to redirect me again.
Uh, yes, my face is up there. I'll just kind of make a note real quick. I, I actually think that the results you have already kind of show what would happen if you were to put a constraint on it anyway. And they actually, I, I think they kind of help to elucidate the variability in, in these different uh, assessment frequencies. Uh, a note I wanted to make earlier, and it had to do with, uh, Adam, your question to Ian about, you know, what, what would happen to the assessment on, you know, every third year or whatever. And I, I guess the point is, is that um, when m major model changes are made, they don't necessarily serve to increase the variability of the assessment results. They actually can serve to dampen the variability in the assessment results. So I think that's something to kind of keep in mind that any any major changes to a model don't always translate to really big changes in the TCEY or any recommended management quantity. Um, so anyway, just wanted to make that note. Dan has a Go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe just talk about the uh, constraint one more, a little bit more. And the way I phrased it, I thought, was that our in our report to the commissioners, we would recommend that if they choose to pursue either the multi-year assessment or the size limit further, that they would then look at MPs that contain a constraint. I wasn't really intending it to be. I don't think we can task Alan ourselves directly, um, but I, you know, I. And thinking about what our re reports are supposed to do is we're supposed to look at the work Alan's done and report to the commissioners based on our insights and our understanding of this process. And to not include something like that in our report, I think would be an omission. But um, anyways, I want to just to clarify, I don't think I was trying to task Alan with something between now and then, although if we can get it done, great. But I do think we should communicate to the commissioners that if they want to continue investigating the utility of these or refining them, then that would be a high priority to include. I, yeah, and, and hopefully my my comment there of uh, the results weren't, wasn't misinterpreted in that sense. I, I think that makes uh, perfect sense, Dan, what you're suggesting is the mechanism is already there to have a 15% threshold. So it seems to make sense that whether there's an assessment run or not, and whether you're using the, the increase in the FIS or or a full assessment that that mechanism is still in place. So yeah, I, I agree with that recommendation. I have just one final slide um, in this presentation. Um, and it, uh, Chris, I, I don't mean to cut you off, um, but it, if we wanna just sort of uh, continue discussing, the final slide is just a really high overview but I think it's, uh, this discussion is really good for me. Let, let's wrap up that final slide then and we'll um, continue on the conversation afterwards. Yeah, so just some ideas for the recommendations. Um, noting this paper 09 uh, and, and recommending focusing the evaluation on option one decision-making variability, simulated estimation error, SPR 43%. Um, I, th I think that's important. There's a lot of different options here, and we have um, come to the conclusion that this is most similar to the um, status quo of what, what should be looked at in the M MPs, and it's just something that the MSAD may want to comment on. Um, related to um, what Dan was just mentioning and Adam is additional runs to assist with the evaluation of size limits and multi-year assessments. If there are additional runs that are actually critical for them to make a decision this year, um, you know, state that and we can do our best to try to accommodate that. But if there are things that the MSAP wants to um, recommend for future years, then I think that's very important as well. Um, I think it's important to note short-term and long-term effects from size limits um, because the commission has uh, uh, specified they wanted to look at uh, long-term effects of size limits. 
And then, um, again, I really appreciate the discussion on costs and benefits from implementing a multi-year assessment management procedure. That's something that the commission is really looking for um, and has been asking for, I think, for the past two annual meetings. So now's the time for the secretariat to deliver that. Any help from the MSAB would be much appreciated. I think that's everything. Thank you much. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Chris, did you uh, have a point you still wanted to raise? Well, I just want to make the point on the on the constraint. I don't know if I would say it's a priority. I'd say we just need to make sure that commissioners are aware that the uh, these model runs these these uh, runs did not include the coastwide constraint, and that if uh, they want to consider future. Uh, look at this more in the future. It, you know, they should be aware of that if they want to, you know, to decide whether they want it included or not. Um, because I think it's it's part of a larger the larger discussion we talked about. You know, the next work plan and what are the what are the um, I don't think we want to fill it up right now with with or say you know this should be done because I think there's going to be some direction from com commissioners on a bunch of things. So I don't think we want to fill up our work schedule. Um, because, you know, we talked about it, is this, we talked about, we're probably going to have to ta take a look at some of these objectives, you know, as, as we move forward with another work plan. And, you know, this is limiting annual changes in the coastwide TCEY is, is one of the current objectives. So um, I guess my point is, I think we just, I just want to make sure that commissioners are aware they're not included here. Because when I, I didn't twig to that when I looked through it, when I, when I looked through this and if Dan Hanna raised it, I wouldn't have caught it. Okay, so where to from here on that point? Um, actually, it, maybe I'll take a step back because uh, I have a question that might help inform next steps. Uh, Alan, in paper 09, there was a section which commented on additional results being anticipated for the uh, 99th annual meeting. Is, is that, can you confirm that's just con completing more simulations, more more runs for the existing uh, results that we've already seen. Maybe I think it was adding a bit more for option two decision variability, but it's not like new no novel MPs per se. No, um, that that was put in there because at the time the document was written 30 days ago, or 32 days ago, um, all of the runs were not complete at that point in time. I think there were some option two runs not complete and then found the error in the BA, for, for example. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that wasn't the end of it and people are keeping uh, tabs on the MSC Explorer for, for updates to that. Um, in terms of additional runs, I don't, I see us really just focusing on beefing up these core simulations to make sure that we have the best results possible to present to the commission on exactly what they asked us to do. Um, might start looking at a constraint, throw it in the MSE Explorer if it if it you know works out well and, and I can program it in easily. I, I think it should be easily programmed in because we did it before. Um, and but you know if there's something new, I'll add it to the Explorer. Whether or not I present it to the Commission, um, it's you know something I don't know. But we really want to just focus on what they what they've asked us the Secretariat to do. Make sure we have that. And make sure it's a really focused analysis that they have what they need to make a decision and doesn't get too overwhelmed. Yeah, I, I agree, Alan. I think that's very fair to um, make sure we're sticking as closely to the commissioner requests as uh, as we can. Maybe an alternative approach then to uh, make sure we don't lose some of the concerns that have been raised by folks like Dan. Um, and given that you know th this current work plan is wrapping up, is that we could, in the report, potentially note uh, future work. You know, um, f following the annual meeting, a new work plan ought to be developed. Potential contents of that work plan could be, um, you know, examining MPs with with constraints. I, th I think that the big question mark, actually, uh, looking ahead, is going to be if the commissioners are um, able to to reach an agreement on distribution. I'm assuming they're going to want to run that through through the simulations, and so there should definitely definitely be space on on uh, the MSE work plan to to handle that request. 
So what, what do folks think about that approach, that a uh, component of this report, a paragraph in this report could be uh, that we, we recommend a new work plan be developed and some potential items for that work plan are X, Y, and Z. I think if that's the only way we can include it, then we should probably go that way. But I mean, honestly, if we're just going to do what you know, if the commissioners have given the scope a task of work, and Alan analyzes it and then summarizes it on a slide, and that's all we report back is that we received that, and this is close to the commissioner's work, and there's no space for the MSAP to do exactly what Alan's third bullet says we should be doing. Um, then I, you know. I, um, sometimes I wonder about the purpose of this group, but um, anyways, if that's where it goes into the report, then that's where it should go. But I think, you know, we have learned the benefits of what the coastwide constraint does through several different exercises. And there's, um, and I think as MSAB members who have that insight, it's incumbent upon us to bring that to the commissioner's attention at some point in our report. Yeah, I, I think we're actually saying you know uh, pr pretty similar things, Dan. It's more just the timing of it that that I'm focused on. You know, we may be recommending additional runs, but it's for th that may assist with the evaluation of size limits and multi-year assessments, but it wouldn't necessarily be for the annual meeting. It would be for some you know subsequent uh, work plan of the MSC process. Because what I've also heard from Alan, you know, in spite of the, the third bullet there is, you know, th there's a, a real desire to focus on on this specific direction from the, the commissioners. Uh, Forrest? Yeah, thanks. I, I don't want Dan to feel like he's alone here. I, I, I felt like all the work we've done over the last, you know, how many meetings is, uh, it just seemed like there was consensus that um, smoothers and and constraints were, I mean, it almost felt like an accepted part of where we were headed. And now here we find ourselves up against a negotiation and, it, you know, and it's it's like future work. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It, it's just uh, almost like it's not a part of, of what, where we may be going. Uh, and, and without some type of comment in, in this MSAB report, I just, you know, it just seems like it, it's feeling like it's getting lost and it just seemed like it was such a strong uh, focus of what of prior work. So anyway. Okay, so no, that, that's, a, that's a fair point uh, for us. I'm glad you brought it up. Obviously more work to be done in terms of coming to agreement on this issue. Uh, I'll let Peggy go. I'd like to encourage others to speak up as well if you've got thoughts on how best to frame the um, uh, a, a comment in the report on additional runs. Then I'll try to bring us back to a to a, a summary point once more. Thanks, Adam. Um, I'm moving around here, so I'll keep my camera off. Uh, reduce seasickness. I, I agree with Forrest and Dan, um, and this is the reason why. I do think it's important. I think timing. I think you're absolutely right that the. The only variable here is timing. Everyone realizes how the importance of um, this change in not using um, having an AAV. So the reason I think we should put it in our report and put it in a really visible, um, make it for this annual meeting is because we came to this decision at this MSAB. And that gives it authenticity, that gives it um, context in what we've learned from Alan's simulations and the conversation of the, or the direction of the conversation that we had, all of these members. So I guess I'd really recommend that we put it front and center um, as something for them to consider for the next work plan. They can table it, they can certainly table it. Um, if they wanted to. And by that, I mean delay it for another time, intercessional session, perhaps. But I, I think we should tell them what we're thinking when we're thinking it. Okay, thanks, Peggy. So another uh, 
another vote for uh, making sure we're speaking clearly about the the need and perceived value of uh, looking at constraints within MPs. Uh, maybe just a question mark about uh, when that work would be done. Uh, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, I guess just on this, the constraint, not having the close way constraint, I, I thought my understanding of giving comments earlier that it wasn't included in these runs so that commissioners could see sort of the, the full effects of what happens if you remove size limits, what happens if you remove, or if you go to multi-year multi, multi -year stock assessments, just to try to, so they could really appreciate the full range of what's happening. There wasn't a constraint on it, but maybe I, maybe I misheard. Um, I, and also, I just I'm just also cognizant of the fact that Alan mentioned that you know they've got a, a, a rapidly approaching date to do some papers for the interim meeting, um, and uh, so I, I just want to make sure we're not uh, overloading things here. But I, I just thought there was the constraint was removed simply to so we could appreciate and the commissioners could appreciate the, the full range of of what the implications could be. Thanks, Chris. I hmm, I can't recall for that last point off the top of my my head. I mean, it, it seems reasonable, but I need to go back through uh, through the direction from I think it was the intersessional session on that. But I don't know, uh, Alan. Do you have any recollection of that guidance? I, I was just thinking the exact same thing as as you, Adam. And I was going to see if I could quickly find it, but I'm not. I don't recall. Exactly when I feel like that decision was mentioned, but I don't recall exactly when. Well, just so we know, like Alan, and maybe I'm wrong, but I kind of thought I heard you mention something like that earlier in this meeting here. But uh, I, I could be wrong. I don't want to be putting words in people's mouths. But that's where kind of I I got it from. But e either way, I mean, I don't want to I don't want to prolong this discussion. Yeah, I think if that is, and I remember someone talking about it too. I think that's rational to think that um, this does do that for them. We can let them know that that is exactly what this does for them. Um, and as Dave, uh, sorry, Dan has said, if they would like to see it with the constraint added, it would require additional runs. You know, one thing I learned recently in presenting to the commission at our work meeting was I, I was pretty excited about all these scientific findings we were getting from the MSC results. Um, and I presented all these things about estimation error, no estimation error. And the commission actually asked me, so why are you presenting this to us? And I realized because this is something I'm interested in. And it really refocused me on what the commission has asked for. And that's why we're. Um, really focused on the small set, realizing I may have an hour, hour and a half to talk to the commission about these results. We really want to do keep it focused without, um, and make sure we meet their request. Um, and, um, but, but I think it's a good note to make sure that, um, that these, you know, sorts of things that the MSAP has investigated in the past, has recommended on, has found to be useful are not lost in this process. Um, so I think it deserves to be in the report for sure. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll put it out there again, but ask for some help for folks to to reframe it to meet our collective interests, which is, you know, we may, uh, uh, we have noted the results on multi-year assessments and size limits. From the analysis we've conducted through this meeting, um, we, how do we say this? We uh, believe there is a benefit of uh, examining the consequences of a coastwide constraint to better achieve some objectives around catch variability. And that um, formal simulations to evaluate that be done at a, at a future date. 
when we get into report writing, Adam, maybe recalling um, what the MSAP said about constraints and other smoothers in the past. I'll, I'll look that up and see if there's any good language um, that might be good to recall, and then we and then can go right into recommending um, yeah, those sorts of things in the future. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a good suggestion. But uh, so again, I think the, the question to the, the group is: I, I want to make sure. We are capturing the points that we've heard from folks like Dan and Peggy and Forrest about, yes, we should be clear in terms of recommending uh, next steps, um, but also be clear about the points you've heard from yourself, Alan, and Chris about making sure we're really sticking to what the commissioners have, have asked for and not uh, not risk overcomplicating uh, the, the, you know, the results we've already produced. So as I described it a minute ago, are folks comfortable with that approach? that we identify, we, we make a recommendation about some, some future evaluation, but note that they're, you know, they're, they're likely to be delivered, you know, after the annual meeting or very close to it. Sure, so as I understand, Adam, this would be a recommendation. So it would be in the top of our minutes and not just simply a note buried inside the minutes. Is that correct? That's what I'm suggesting is that we do recommend it as a, you know, a future run, but the, the timing of when that occurs is the, is the question mark. I think it's unlikely that this recommendation would be acted on before the annual meeting. Yeah, that's fine. That's it. fine. I think that's a, I mean, it addresses my desire to have this kind of the top of the minute as a recommendation so it gets carried forward um, <clears throat> in subsequent papers. and. My you know, initial comment was, should the commissioners decide to proceed with these, additional runs on containing a constraint will be informative. I mean, I think that's the message we're trying to say. So I like Alan's suggestion to we, we can you know, incorporate a recalling that we've had, that the, what the benefits are of constraints from past MSE reports, and then a recommendation about future runs containing a constraint and just be silent on the timing of them, I think it's fine. Okay, thanks for that feedback, Dan. Yeah, I, I'm trying to multitask here. I should know better. I I can't see anything in special session 11, which references the the uh, the work plan from our document 03 that talks about constraints being r removed. So I just I feel like there's something I do need to go away tonight and figure out how we <laughs> recall how we got to where we're at in terms of uh, constraints being a, a core component of the MP. I think that's the other piece to, to recall in the report. It's just how we've got to where we're at. Uh, are you talking how we got to these MPs without constraints? Correct. Yeah. Could, um, so, yeah, okay. We can um, figure that out during the report writing. Okay, uh, any, or last call for thoughts on, on that item, that specific comment or dis uh, that specific discussion of um, constraints. Let folks mull it over for a minute and then try to do a quick recap of this afternoon's discussion, noting that uh, we're looking to break by, uh, within the next half an hour to get into report writing. I don't think, Alan, there's anything else to, present in this deck, correct? No, that's actually the final presentation. So um, I'm finished with presentations. I'm happy to discuss concepts, to look at the Explorer, to uh, look at various trade-offs that people wish. Um, and um, I think we have some free time now and tomorrow morning just to finish up any final thoughts and um, investigations. Um, and then finish up the report tomorrow. So I'm really happy with how this meeting's going. Terrific, okay. Um, okay, so I haven't seen any hands come up in terms of uh, comments on that recommendation for uh, constraints. Maybe what I'd suggest then is going through a, a quick summary from this afternoon. Uh, for myself in particular, I, th I think slide 52 was quite helpful in terms of the level of detail for 
what we've learned from multi-year assessments. Um, I do think it would be helpful to, in the report, also note some of the SRB's recommendations, given that this has been one of the, SRB's recommendations has been one of the big drivers for, for this um, examination. Um, in the, in addition to this summary slide for multi-year assessments, um, we had some conversation still on target reference points, uh, but I think we've addressed that item in a previous section of the report. The, the outstanding question for me on multi-year assessments is the, uh, the net economic benefits piece not being known. It seems like a bit of a, uh, just kind of a, a a bullet without a bullet without a home it seems like a strange piece to insert so i don't know if there's additional details like maybe we could expand the cost benefit uh, slides um and replace those with the the net economic benefits not known uh, otherwise i think we need to uh add a bit more detail about what we actually mean uh that's the first piece uh, second piece is most of the conversation around multi-year assessments was focused on variability. I think it's going to be a challenge to, to communicate this clearly in the report. And so if folks don't have other summary items that they want to raise now, maybe we could even pull up the Explorer and kind of have a, an open session for folks to say, like, how do you interpret this? Or have you found a performance metric that's particularly useful in understanding variability or the consequence of... Uh, these different multi-year MPs. So two points with that. Uh, one, is there any uh, really salient summary points from the multi-year assessment results that you want to flag from this afternoon? And two, what do folks feel about uh, about going through the Explorer? Like, uh, have you learned something over lunch that you really want to share with the group? Or would you... Have you been lost in the Explorer and would like us to, to walk through it again? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. I was trying to be polite and wait, you know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I have been playing with the Explorer, and one there's uh, two aspects that I found interesting. Um, one in general is if you look at what the average median TCEY is over the long term, it's up in the 70 million pound range, which is a, a lot um, more than I recall the other, our previous operating model was more in the low 50s, I think. And I was just curious um, why the, the large increase um, and what that kind of means for some of our objectives, like some of the objectives was, you know, probability of the TCY being above 50 some million pounds. And we kind of given up on that as like, that's only going to occur during the rare intersection of large size of age and large recruitment. But if the, uh, the median TCY is over 70 million, then that puts a different light on what um, long-term yield from the stock is. So just kind of curious as to how your thinking is on what the long-term yield is. Yes, thanks, Dan. Um, excellent point. I had the um, exact same thought when I first started looking at these results, and we talked about it um, a lot in here and talked about it with the SRB as well. Um, the, the one thing to note is that we have uh, in previous um, the previous OM we had a single model. In this one, we have four different models, and all four of those different models. Are really sort of different long-term results, you might say, where they have, a, they have a wider range of uncertainty. That structural uncertainty is certainly, I think, a big effect on this. Given that, these new OMs, I think, is a better characterization of that long-term uncertainty. And that is what is raising that um, TCY to those 70 million pound levels. That being said, the um, uh, Ian pointed out to me the average uh, yield from the stock over the last three years is what about 60 million pounds? Yeah, 65 million pounds. And 
you know, that's one thing I, I like to look at is what has been yield over a long period of time from a, from a fishery. And um, that's often a good indicator of long-term yield. So I think these results are similar to that aspect. And then finally, one of the reasons I want to add these extra simulations is as I, I've done a few, I, I, done a, I did another hundred or two simulations and then we wanted to look at what is, how well are we characterizing the median given all of this uncertainty? And, and as you know, in the TCY especially, it's a wide range going from 20 million pounds to 150 million pounds, depending on the simulation. With that amount of variability, you need a lot of samples basically to get a good um, picture of a median or a mean. Um, and what we found is that 500 is still not a great number of samples to characterize uh, accurate median. Uh, as I mentioned, it's good to rank the management procedures, but if you wanna say 72 million pounds is the long-term yield from this stock, I think we need to increase the number of simulations. And that's one reason we want to. Initial looks at this is the, the next 200 simulations from 500 to 700 actually show a reduced um, long-term TCY, about 65 million pounds. And I think that's gonna bring down the median a little bit. So maybe this first set of 500 has some high simulations just by chance in it that we need a larger sample size to bring this down. And so we'll see what happens with the thousand. It's still gonna be up above 65 million pounds in the long term, I imagine. But, and, and that's really a result of the improved operating model better characterization of migration and these other parameters um, and uh, just improve uh, overall, I think, a better picture of this. Um, and remember, this is in its sort of, you know, its beginning stages of developing these operating models. And that's where we might expect most of the change to occur as we learn what to put into these operating models. But I think we're becoming, we're, we're at a much more stable state I think this operating model is one that we will continue to use in the future um, uh, more, more often rather than tinkering with it as I have done this, I guess, a year ago. Okay. Thanks for that explanation. That's good. It's encouraging to get out of the 40 million pound pothole. So that's all the good news. <laughs> yeah, I like to fix potholes whenever I can. <clears throat> I guess the other thing I looked at, you have some performance metrics that look at the probability of AAV at 15, 20, and 25 percent, and those looked interesting when I looked at them as a way to drill in a little bit more between um, the annual, the biannual, and the uh, triannual. So, yeah, that, that's a good point, Dan. I think we, um, he, he might have been one who recommended putting those in um, many MSABs ago. Um, uh, wasn't that smart? <laughs> yeah, but uh, I know it was looking at different levels to get uh, characterization, a better characterization of the range of AAVs. Um, and I think that's another way to look at those violin plots that I had produced um, and understanding that range of the AAVs. Yeah, what's striking is the probability of it being over 25% is roughly 10% for the annual goes up to 21% for the biannual and then back down to 10% for the triannual. So it's- That is interesting. Yeah, thanks. A challenge with having these meetings remotely is it's difficult, much more difficult to call out folks from around the room to uh, offer some thoughts, particularly folks we haven't heard from. So say it at least here, we've got a, a quick heads up that really like to hear from folks who maybe haven't spoken through the meeting. While you uh, decide if you've got a question you want to bring, I'll, I'll raise another point too, which is, uh, Alan, I've, I've really enjoyed playing with the Explorer. It's nice to feel a little more familiar with it uh, rather than overwhelmed in the first couple of uh, the meetings years ago. Um, have you have you looked at some of the results to try, try to break things, like a really extreme SPR or uh, a size limit to, to 
produce some contrast in potential MPs. I understand not having them in the results now because they just <laughs> cause confusion. Um, but I have in past I found it really helpful just to to see an MP that really produces some strong contrast because right now it can be challenging to differentiate between the MPs when performance is is pretty similar across the range. Yeah, I agree, Adam. Unfortunately, I just had such a huge set of this is what I call core MPs to, to simulate. Um, and each one of these takes three days to do 500 simulations. Um, so it was, it was a bit of a, a challenging task to get this set done with, you know, looking at no estimation error. I like to start with that. Just it helps me make sure things are working correctly. But I've been thinking along the same lines. I would like to expand out on fishing intensity and really ramp up fishing intensity. Another thing that we haven't done in a while that I want to look at is the control rule. Again, I, this control rule has is so much effect on keeping it above 20%. You know, I just want to take away the control rule and break it. And, you know, see what does it need to, to bring this stock and not meet that biological sustainability goal. Um, that's the fun of doing simulations. We can make that stuff happen in the non-real world. <laughs> yes, yes you, you have read my mind. That is it, adjusting the harvest control rule, the shape of the rule, thinking of different lower stock reference points or upper stock reference points is where I think there's a lot of value. We're not there yet. You've got more than enough on your plate. But uh, from a simulation perspective, I think that would be really interesting. And so, so maybe building on that, uh, thinking of future work plan pieces, um, what, what, uh, like, but what else is, do you need, or, or how else can the MSAB be, uh, be supportive to advance the work to the next stage? Like, is this a matter of computational power? Is it more clear direction on MPs to explore or refining objectives? Like, wh where, where do you feel like we could, we could better support you? I think, you know, I, I think the MSAB is doing a great job, and the items that are coming in this report, I think, are, are very useful um, to help guide the commission on where to where what the M MSC is showing now and where it could go in the future. But um, I, I guess you know some things that, that that I think are useful is just recognizing that this is a tool that that the IPHC now has that can be used to answer questions. Um, just recognizing that and the work that has been done, um, I think is the first, you know, real step in promoting this tool so that it can be used to evaluate questions in the future. Uh, a second one is to recognize what has been accomplished. I, I don't know how the MSAP might do that, but that's something I'm thinking of. Like, we've accomplished so much, even before the time that I was here, that I think that needs to be recognized, the improvements we've made and the, the management procedure, the harvest policy that we have put together to date. It's a huge success that we now have this reference 43%. Sure, we might adjust some objectives and change that in the future, but that has been something that has been in place and the commission has been following. I think that's a huge success to, um, to remember. And so thinking of those sorts of things what are other other aspects of a harvest policy that should be implemented? What are other things that the MSC has done and accomplished that, that should be um, really considered by the, the commission to make a decision and so that the commission can have clear guided decisions that use the MSC and we really see the benefit of the MSC. I know all that's a little bit vague, um, but I, I think that is something that is missing, is just the, the usefulness of this MSE and where we have benefited and where we can benefit in the future is something that I think would be useful to come out of this. Hmm. Thanks, Alan. Those are some interesting reflections. Um, OK, so ho hopefully that's given, uh, given folks some time to uh, to see if they've got other questions outstanding from the Explorer. But barring that, maybe we roll into uh, into the report writing session then, 
or sorry, Alan, is there anything else or be anything else to, to flag for for this part of the discussion? I, um, not that I know of uh, related to multi-year assessments or size limits. I, I just really appreciate the discussions we've had. I, I um, am always amazed at how well the MSAT can pick up on some of the nuances of these results and the, the challenges in interpreting these results and provide um, insight that I didn't see in, in the results as well. So I, I really appreciate that. And that's one of the reasons I, I like having these meetings. Um, but I think that's, that's it for me. And we're here to answer questions, go over anything else. Um, if there's something else that you want presented, um, let us know. That. I'll maybe offer one last point then in terms of result interpretation. While I feel like uh, we've been uh, pretty pretty effective, pretty successful in having uh, these subsidiary bodies uh, meeting remotely over the past couple of years, <laughs> it is when we're going through uh, when we're going through these these results, the Explore in particular, where I really feel like there's value in having the MSAB meet together in person. Um, so I, I, I do hope that we're able to do that again soon, to, to go through the Explore, to, to, you know, to look over somebody's shoulder on their laptop at a lunch break and go through those results. I just find it, it's, it's uh, it, much more effective that way. So hopefully we can see everybody in person again soon. If, uh, if not, the uh, next MSAB meeting, maybe at the annual meeting, we could talk about some of these results. Yeah, I, I agree, Adam, and I think that's part of the reason the, the commission is um, looking at the cost of the MSAB and trying to figure out a way to have these meetings in person, given the, the budgetary constraints. Yeah, totally understandable. Um, okay, so let's um, let's wrap this up here and and move into the report writing then. Uh, Alan or other if I may interject uh, before the group leaves today and we get into report writing maybe we can just have a, a reflection on how tomorrow may go if what we might want to do in the morning if anybody has any specifics they want to do or if um, yeah. uh, just uh, reviewing the report and then um, having the secretariat uh, just clean it up and then go for an adoption after that so I think, yeah, great, uh, great flag. Um, for tomorrow, report uh, writing and adoption will take up the majority of the time, but we do also need to have a conversation still on the proposed rules of procedure edits as we had put that aside yesterday to give folks some time to digest those changes. Um, initially, we'd said we, we need about half an hour, but if we've gone through this quickly enough, we, we may have a bit more time if, if needed, depending on how this afternoon's report writing goes. Um, and I'm just going through my notes because I felt like there was a second item we needed to cover tomorrow, but I, I don't see it here. While I'm scrounging around for that, uh, Pete, was there anything else uh, or from others in the room that we, uh, we wanted to flag for tomorrow's agenda? Uh, no, not that I can think of, just the tours and those rules, that was that. Okay, and anybody else? Oh, this might go down in the record books as the uh, quickest MSAP meeting then. I don't, I can't seem to find it. So I may come back to my memory tonight through the report writing or uh, or afterwards, but I think that that may be it. Is tomorrow we'll start off with a um, uh, review of the terms of reference rules procedure. See if there's any additional comments there, and then we can combine the overall report adoption with a review of today's uh, today's part of the report. Um, I, I don't know exactly how long that how long that would take. Say maybe uh, uh, an hour for report writing. I've just made that number up. We would take a pause, allow the secretary to go away and uh, do the, the typical cleanup, you know, make sure we've used the right verbs, et cetera, and then come back for adoption. At least that's what I propose. Does that 
Does that seem reasonable, Alan? Does that, that make sense, Pete? Does to me. Same. Cool. Okay, great. Uh, in terms of actual logistics, everything else is the same in terms of starting tomorrow at nine and um, nothing, nothing particular there. I'm not gonna say we get out early yet because I don't wanna jinx us, but <laughs> things are looking in good shape. Okay, uh, well then how about we go into report writing, for maybe everybody five minutes or 10 minutes to stretch their legs, get a drink of water. Those that are able to stick around for report writing would be uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, those that have commitments into this afternoon, um, well, excuse you and uh, and talk to you uh, tomorrow, October twentieth. Thank you. Is Alan, is five minutes okay for uh, sixteen thirty? Um, or do you need more? That, that should be okay, it, it, unless other people want a little bit longer. I don't know. Um, Fine. I have the report ready to go. So, yeah, let's say uh, four thirty our time. Okay, sounds good. If, if folks take a little bit longer, no problem. I'm sure they can get caught up. Okay, we'll talk to you in a minute. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. If I don't talk to you soon, have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>